Let me promote Lillian. Shayla, I just want to confirm that you can hear me okay because I switched audio. Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Lillian, I just promoted you to panelist. Um, okay. Thank you, Akavia. You. Thank you. Okay, great, great. And your video works? Yes. Uh, let me see. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. You look okay. great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Marcella, you look great too. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Lillian. Good morning, Marcella.
And you're unmuted. Who's this person? I don't see. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Vincent C. Gray, Board 7 <clears throat> Council Member <clears throat> and Chairperson of the uh, Committee on Health. And I hereby. Uh, are you, hold on one second. So, are you ready to start? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Let me hit record. All right. Go right ahead, sir. Okay, good morning. I'm Vincent C. Gray, uh, Ward 7 Council Member and uh, Chairperson of the Committee uh, on Health. And uh, I hereby call to order uh, uh, this, this uh, hearing uh, with the uh, United Medical Center, uh, the Office, the office of uh, Deputy Mayor uh, for uh, Today is um, Monday, uh, March 28th, and the time is now uh, just about, uh, let's see, just about uh, 11, about 10, uh, 11 uh, a.m. Um, the um, The committee uh, is holding uh, this uh, hearing, uh, this vir virtual hearing, uh, to uh, because of COVID uh, uh, and the pandemic that we have all experienced uh, repeatedly uh, now for going on uh, two years. And I appreciate everybody's indulgence and engagement uh, with us uh, during this process. Um, Joining us uh, will be a number of council members who will probably have questions as we go through, and uh, we may be joined by others uh, as we go through this process. Um, there will be a number of public witnesses uh, that will have uh, up to three minutes uh, to provide uh, testimony, uh, and uh, we'll have five minutes uh, to make an opening statement. The council members will. Five minutes to make an opening statement, uh, and we will have uh, one uh, three-minute uh, set of rounds. Uh, so, um, that being said, uh, let me move, move on uh, with this uh, process, and. Uh, If anybody has questions that they uh, want to uh, ask uh, or issues they want to raise, uh, please send a, a message uh, or the questions uh, to my uh, staff. Uh, that will be uh, uh, Michelle Loggins uh, is our deputy uh, director. Uh, or Caitlin Casey, who is uh, current uh, with our office, and uh, one of them will um, receive your questions and your issues and work with you to try to uh, get them uh, to the next uh, stage. Um, as I've said uh, before, this year's uh, budget, uh, the budget itself has many positive uh, elements uh, in it, uh, especially uh, the, the continued uh, capital work that we're doing on the uh, new hospital. And wow, isn't that an exciting uh, experience that we're having uh, to be able to move from 
having a hospital that was barely functional uh, with the uh, United Medical Center to a brand new hospital that will take a little over two years. Uh, we know that will take it will take that amount of time uh, to get it done, but we will get it done. And this will be something that we can all be essentially uh, proud of uh, for the work that we've been able to do to create a new healthcare system on the east end uh, of the District of Columbia. This is unlike uh, any situation that we've ever had uh, in the District of Columbia. And I, for one, am I so proud of uh, what we've been able to do and will continue to be able to do. Uh, there'll be urgent care centers that are being created uh, as well, along with the new hospital and uh, additional healthcare systems uh, that will be created for people uh, to be able to use and experience in ways that they have not uh, been able to experience um, heretofore. So I hope everybody is uh, I hope everybody is excited about that and. Um, we will uh, we'll look forward to that. We, the opening of that, what a, what is a great day that will be. We've had the groundbreaking, of course, and uh, we had the mayor and others uh, who were there uh, for the groundbreaking. And what a great day that was, and what a great day it will be when we actually open uh, the new um, hospital and the opportunities that it will create for people uh, in ways that have not existed uh, heretofore. Uh, in the uh, District of uh, Columbia. Um, we, have a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a number of public witnesses uh, that are with us uh, today, and uh, we'll start uh, with them. Uh, Walla, are you here with us? I am here. Okay. And uh, Liberta Lenoir? Uh, is she here with us today? Okay, good. Well, yes, I'm here. Okay, well, we'll look forward to uh, both of you testifying, and uh, we'll start uh, with you all. Um, okay, as, as, as other council members join us, uh, we will ask them for what is an opening statement that they may wish to make. Uh, we'll see what happens, but anyway, we'll go ahead with our public witnesses at this stage. Walla, go right ahead. Thank you, Councilman Gray. Thank you for having us today. Um, my testimony will be short. I really do want you to hear from our um, representative and our uh, labor leader, um, Roberta Lenoir. But I'm, uh, you know, with the DC Nurses Association, a full service professional organization, labor union solely dedicated to representing healthcare professionals in the District of Columbia. We represent over 150 registered nurses at United Medical Center. I am here because we are a bit frustrated. I did, you know, hear in your opening statement, um, 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 Councilman Gray, that um, the excitement for the new hospital. But until that hospital is open, we do have a existing hospital that still needs the support that um, it's really not receiving right now. Uh, my specific um, frustration has been human resources. Um, we actually, as you know, you are recently uh, approved a new contract. Um, but since this, since that contract has gone into effect, there has been lack of support um, in um, in actually adhering to the contract. Uh, the HR department um, com is completely gutted. We have a leader that's been talking to us, um, but they say that everything that they put forth, the top leadership um, is not moving forward. So we have grievances, we have settlements, we have all types of issues that are just pending. Right now, an example of this is that we have a, a, a nurse that was we settled a case on in October of last year. To date, this nurse still has not received their money um, for the settlement. Um, I have sent emails. We have reached back out, even threatened to go back to arbitration. We've been told that everything will be approved. We even received an email from the general counsel two weeks ago that the person will be paid that Friday and they never got paid. I emailed the general counsel, never heard back. Um, and I just got a call from HR this morning saying that they will probably pay her this Friday, last Friday. I mean, it's just a different story every week. Um, there are 
uh, we have bonuses that were supposed to give them to the nurses. Still, we have gotten no word. We have our, even our arbitrations are held up because we're waiting for more information from HR. It is a whole um, getting things from them. And this is unfair to the nurses who are working hard every day to make sure that the hospital is still running. It doesn't make sense that nurses still have to wait for even raises that the um, con that um, your HR have actually said they would not implement until after they balance the budget, which is contrary to the contractual language, as we've argued here before. So again, we're asking that this hospital um, nurses still deserve treat um, better treatment at this hospital, even if the hospitals were wind, winding down. It's not closed, um, and there are still staff there taking care of patients and shouldn't be ignored for a hospital that still has it hasn't even opened its doors. So we ask that you all please, please meet with the leadership and ask them to really take our contract seriously. We shouldn't have to have pending arbitrations all, um, you know, throughout the year simply because they failed to do their job. Thank you. Thank you, Walla. We appreciate your testimony as always. Uh, you, we worked closely with you, uh, and the questions that you raised, uh, we'll raise them with Ms. Um, Jacobs. Um, who is, uh, you know, in her capacity with the chief financial officer uh, is uh, involved with the uh, hospital as well and has been working with us. So um, I will ask her to, to the questions you raise, I will ask her um, to, to be able to respond uh, to those questions and uh, we'll try to get the uh, answers as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, Walla. Uh, Ms. Lemoy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead with your testimony. Hello, uh, Congressman, I mean, Councilman Vincent uh, Gray. Thank you for having me. As you know, my name is Roberta F. Lemoy, and I'm an emergency room nurse at United Medical Center in Southeast Washington. I am a president of the District of Columbia Nurses Association Unit. I have been a nurse at UMC for over 30 years. I have been committed to providing quality care to the residents who live in Ward 7 and 8. I represent over 150 nurses at UMC. I have given testimony many times to the council over the years, employing this body to recognize the needs of UMC. There are conditions present now which prevent us from fully performing our professional responsibilities and assuring the best possible outcomes of the care of our patients. It is difficult for us at UMC to believe that the black lives of residents in wards seven and eight really matter. I have testified to every known deficiency and lack creating an impossible environment to practice safely. Yet the entire body leaves to chance the slow moving disaster. This slow moving disaster nurse practice is in jeopardy every single day you put your license on the line. Uh, the conditions of work are so harsh now that nurses, uh, nurses now believing the only, the city will never respect this hospital for the services it provides are now leaving in large numbers. Human resources has one person working in the entire department. This means that our contract is constantly being disregarded. Negotiated raises and differentials are not being instituted. The nursing staff is weary. They have worked in this desperate condition without respect or recognition for far too long. The control board instituted by the council cares more about meeting financial goals than providing compassionate care and assuring a safe working environment. They had um, told you all that they were not balancing the budget on the backs of the employees, which in fact, this is what is occurring. The new hospital system will be ready in 2024, along with the urgent treatment centers. However, you have patients that are in need now. We still call this hospital their, who still call this hospital their medical home. This should be a humane transition. We should be working together to transition to a new hospital system. Let the legal records show that UMC control board is operating this hospital that is detrimental to patients and nurses alike, as well as other healthcare professionals. The following persistent conditions exist. Lack of adequate supplies to provide ongoing, ongoing safe care. This are, these are system variances, including computers to bedside blood pressure monitors to oxygen uh, monitoring systems. 
inability to promote a healing environment and provide compassionate care, the foundation of nursing practice. High rate of agency nurses who lack experience and familiarity with needs of the population. Some units up to 80% of the staff is agency. Agency nurses are often paid up to $100 an hour, whereas we are still fighting just to get our, bare, our basic raises. Lack of adequate nursing administration support to promote safe, efficient, and compassionate care. Refusal by administration to follow negotiated contract language costing the city excessive money and unfair labor practices. In conclusion, the nurses at UMC have been abandoned time and time again. The question becomes, what are your ex expectations of us currently? It is evident that we don't merit total and complete consideration in your limited accommodations of the needs of this population. The nurses and other staff at UMC deserve more. We have weathered multiple disasters and somehow kept this place afloat. We ask that the council provide appropriate oversight and institute measures to, to improve the conditions of work and practices to assure respect of our contractual agreements. Respectfully submitted, Roberta F. Lenoir, president of, U of DCNA UMC. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your testimony and your continuing testimony, uh, Roberta, on behalf of the uh, nurses, especially um, at uh, United uh, Medical Center. Um, we are we, we're working hard to, uh, to try to be able to make sure that the hospital is functional and operational uh, in the ways that it should be. And uh, we will try to continue to be as uh, responsive and uh, as we can be uh, until the new hospital opens. Uh, I do want to say that we're excited, as, I, as you probably heard in my opening statement, we're excited about the fact that we are going to have a new hospital. And uh, we hope that uh, you and your colleagues are excited as well about the fact that we are moving uh, towards um, a new hospital. This will be this will be a first uh, for um, the uh, health care services being provided on the east end of the city. And um, we hope that you, you guys will work with us uh, in the course of us being able to have the, the most effective system that we can have um, with the uh, additional services that will be provided um, with the urgent care services, with the the new healthcare system uh, that's being created uh, on the east end of the city. So, again, we will continue to work with you all as effectively as we possibly can, and um, we hope that you all will do the same thing as you have done uh, in the past. Uh, so, um, we will ask uh, Ms. Mamari uh, some of the questions, uh, as well as Ms. Jacobs, along with some of the questions that you raised, uh, Ms. Lenoir. And you, uh, Walla, in your uh, testimony. So um, we will hear from we will hear from them shortly. Okay. I think we're going to move now to the executive uh, witnesses. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, are you with us today? I am. Uh, can you hear me, Chairman Gray? I can. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Ms. Mamari and uh, you uh, to testify. So, uh, are you there? Uh, you, you there, of course. So, um, we'll hear from we'll hear from uh, Ms. Mamari and then uh, you, Ms. Jacobs. Uh, is that the order you want to go in? Actually, I'll go first if you don't mind, Chairman Gray. No, and then go right, ahead. go right ahead, Ms. Jacobs. Good morning, Chairman Gray and members of the Committee on Health. I'm Angel Jacobs, Chair of the Fiscal Management Board for the Not-for-Profit Hospital Corporation, more commonly known as United Medical Center, or UMC. I'm pleased to appear before you today with Interim CEO Marcella Mumari and Chief Financial Officer Lillian Chikuma to discuss UMC's fiscal year 2023 budget. The fiscal year 2023 budget supports the hospital in fulfilling its mission of providing quality medical care to our residents while acting as responsible stewards of our revenues and resources. When I appeared before you during the performance oversight hearing, 
I described some of the challenges that UMC has faced during fiscal year 2022, including inadequate staffing in the emergency department and a high rate of ambulance diversion. Since that time, improvements have been reported in both staffing and patient activity, and ambulance diversions are now at zero. The hospital's operator continues to implement the savings initiatives outlined in the operational and wind down plan. And as a result, we expect to end fiscal year 2022 with a balanced budget, despite a recent reduction in our disproportionate share or dish payment. The successful completion of the savings initiatives this fiscal year should also help to stabilize the hospital in fiscal year 2023 and allow us to end the budgetary year in balance with the proposed $15 million operating subsidy. I thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I will now turn to interim CEO Marcella Mamari, who will provide testimony on the fiscal year 2023 budget, after which we would be happy to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Thank you, Chair Jacobs. Um, good afternoon. Good, actually, still morning. So, good morning, Chairman Gray and members of the Are committee. Mamari. Are you there, Ms. Mamari? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. Uh, okay. Sorry. Hopefully, you need you me to speak up. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully, you can address some of the questions that were raised by Ms. Lenoir and by uh, Ms. Bouguet, uh yes. also that she both of them raised in their testimony. I'll go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Gray and members of the Committee on Health. Um, my name is Marcella Mamari, and I have the privilege of serving as the interim CEO of the not for profit hospital corporation, also known as United Medical Center. I am joined today um, by both the chair of our fiscal management board, Chair Jacobs, and our CFO, Lillian Chikuma. Before I begin, I'd like to thank you, Chairman Gray, for your continued support of the hospital with our ongoing financial challenges. I also want to thank Council and the Fiscal Management Board that helped us meet the obligations that were front and center for the hospital during the COVID pandemic. With the support of the Fiscal Management Board, we have initiated several financial improvement efforts focused on reducing hospital expenses and creating operational efficiencies. These activities have a built-in accountability structure that provides transparency and sustainability at all levels of leadership down to the hospital employees. This structure allows us to continuously look for operational efficiencies and additional savings while creating greater transparency through monitoring initiatives. One specific activity that I would like to mention here, Mr. Chairman, involves our focused efforts to finally complete negotiations with the hospital's three collective bargaining units. All three contracts were ratified these contracts assisted with vacancies and difficult to fill positions and are instrumental for our expense reduction. All other contract labor continues to be reviewed with a focus on utilize, utilization in proportion to volumes, as well as utilization only when necessary. At this time, there are no reductions in services included in this budget. The fiscal year 23 budget we are submitting is conservative and accounts for the potential impact of the opening of Ward 7 and 8 urgent care centers, sustaining little to no PG diversion, the reduction in dish allocation, and the $15 million in district subsidy. Operating expenses reflect our market competitive CBA rates and incorporate agency staffing usage as necessary. Other general areas of focus for cost reduction and operational efficiency improvements include reviewing contracts for alignment with the lower volumes we continue to experience and also leveraging our group purchasing organization for increased savings. We also remain committed to providing opportunities to local and small businesses in the community and have recently onboarded a number of them as service providers to UMC. On the capital side, we are using our available resources to make targeted investments to our infrastructure to ensure that we continue to meet regulatory requirements and mitigate any high cost emergency repairs. As these and other activities are developed and implemented under the guidance provided by the board, we look forward to keeping you and the Committee on Health 
fully informed. In closing, we are aware of the many challenges we will continue to face, and we are prepared to operate the hospital within our reforecasted budget for fiscal year 22, reflecting 15 million in district subsidy and changes in DISH. We understand that we are accountable to the mayor, council, board, hospital employees, and patients, and we will make the decision necessary to ensure fiscal responsibility. Doing so is the only option for UMC as we continue the privilege of providing safe, high quality patient care to the community we serve. This concludes my testimony and I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mamari. We appreciate the work that you're doing and uh, the uh, efforts that you're making to make sure that our, our hospital continues to operate as effectively as it possibly can uh, until the new hospital opens uh, in 2024. Um, we are excited about opening a new hospital. Uh, this will be a, um, a major accomplishment uh, for, for the people uh, of Ward 7 and Ward 8 uh, in the District of Columbia. So thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, also, you heard the testimony from uh, Walla and also from Ms. Lenoir. Uh, can you speak to those issues? Uh, especially around nurses not having getting, having gotten paid uh, for what they are due uh, as a part of the contractual relationship with them? Sure. So uh, first, let me say that it's unfortunate to hear it at this hearing, um, some of their concerns, because we've been working really closely um, with our um, HR department and finance department to um, reconcile some of these items. Um, but I, I would like to also um, address some of the other comments made, if that's okay, and then I'll I'll ask um, Lillian to also assist with answering that question specifically. Now we we heard we heard we of course heard the comments in, in the testimony yes. and those issues that are out, that are outstanding. Um, I would yes. appreciate if you can add, address them uh, as effectively as you can at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, so as part of our new, as I mentioned in my testimony, we do have, we have ratified a new CBA, which includes um, increase of rates for the specialty nurses, which are very competitive in this market. And um, to that end, we have been able to recruit new nurses um, to sub to, so that we don't have as much agency supplemental staff um, in our units. So that has helped quite a bit. Um, we have also um, instituted, um, she mentioned a bonus, that is a retention bonus. Instead, we are providing for our CBA, our bonus, uh, which is a shift bonus to nurses. And that has worked out pretty well in trying to um, recruit some of the um, extra shifts that are needed with our existing staff as opposed to agency staff. So that has worked out very well for us. Um, our Excuse goal me, is- Mari. Uh, are the nurses yes. are aware of the bonus that you have talked about and those yes. bonuses have been provided? They have to not given to us the bonus. The bonus has not been provided to us. I'm sorry. Some oh, of yeah, I not, think we're speaking of the testimony of, is uh, not accurate at all. Uh, so, so, so let me, yeah. Masala. We have, we have three people talking at the same time, so please uh, slow down. Ms. Sure. Jacob. So if I may, um, may um, speak real quick. So. When I mentioned the bonus, there is a difference. So there was a, a retention bonus that was presented to the union uh, right before the holidays to yeah. address some of the concerns we had in filling those positions. That is still the with the union. The, 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 the Christmas holidays or what? What are you talking exactly, about? Exactly, exactly. So that, that's, a, that's a high to hard, hard to fill mm -hmm. slot sometimes. Um, that's not the bonus that I'm speaking of. What I'm speaking of, of uh, is a bonus that's within our CBA that talks about um, picking up extra shifts and we have been providing those those bonuses and that has worked very well for us and that will continue to be the case. Um, and so when we have areas that in different units, for example, EDICU, when we need to fill some of those um, gaps, we are asking our, our nurses, not agency nurses, to fill those and they are getting a shift bonus for those. And that has been the case uh, since our um, since December with our new nursing leadership. Have time frames been provided to the nurses 
um, about when they would get the uh, the compensation that's been uh, promised them uh, through United Medical Center. So, Lennon, do you want to help answer that question? Sure, certainly. Yes, you. yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Councilmember Gray. Always a pleasure to see you. And of course, you take on me with that new hospital. So, we don't want to be bogged down with the old one. We we're all looking forward. I understand. I understand. <laughs> as much as I'm going to be out of a job, I'm looking forward to for that hospital coming alive. So, but anyhow, uh, going back to this conversation of uh, the union contracts, which uh, was a big uh, uh, accomplishment for the hospital uh, to get the most competitive uh, uh, CBA with the nurses, and not just the nurses, we have all our union uh, negotiations went very well. We have everything that is in the CBA is an obligation. It's not a negotiation anymore. The day the contract got signed, it became uh, uh, a ratified contract and everything is being implemented according to the contract. Now, the, there's a bonus plan, a retention bonus plan that was proposed by nursing leadership. There are negotiations going on. They, they could decide to pull away from it if they don't come to an agreement. That has not been agreed upon, so it's not considered a bonus for the nurses until it is ratified, it's certified financially, and it, it, it's part of what has been signed. So that's not a part of what we owe. Everything that we're supposed to do according to the CBA is on target, is on plan. And as the CFO, Chairman Gray, I want to say that nursing uh, uh, labor cost. Nobody has compromised with it. Whether it's overtime, whether it's regular pay, whether it's agency, it's all made available for nursing. The nurse- Where is the 2022 raise? Where is the 22 raise? Wait, 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 wait. Mr. To... Chair, Mr. Wait, Chairman, wait, wait, wait. is this a debate with when public witnesses? I think, <laughs> I think it would be helpful if CFO Chikuma got to answer the question. Go ahead, Elliot. Thank you. So, the as you may know, our hospital is obligated to honor, like I said before, our CBAs, and we are honoring every CBA. Now, there are new initiatives they want to make to see that maybe they could have retention for, uh, uh, for their nurses because there is a tendency issue with a lot of the nurses and they're working on a bonus plan, a separate bonus plan that is not included in the existing uh, CBA. So that's not a conversation until, as you know, our process, until a negotiation is finished, financial ratification happened and certifications and it comes to council for approval and goes to the board, there is nothing we owe, but everything that is owed according to the CBA, I will go back as the CFO to look to see if there are anything in the contract that we are missing or hasn't been implemented. As Ms. Marmari alluded earlier, that is surprising to be hearing them here. I haven't had one meeting with Walla or the group to hear anything that hasn't been paid. So I will go back and we'll get back to you. For me, I will go to your charge. You, earlier you said that you will charge uh, uh, Chair Jacobs to go look into it. I will look into it as a CFO to see anything that is in the ratified contract of the CBA that is not implemented. And it's my responsibility that we will implement everything. We will work with HR. We will work with anybody necessary to make sure everything that is in the contract is ratified. Now, going back to the nursing Lily, challenges. Lily, let me make, sure, make, sure, make sure I'm clear. There are issues that are have continued in negotiation and negotiation process that have not been approved. Is that what you're saying? And there are some issues. There are some initiatives that they put in table. Tell, tell, tell me, tell me where the with whom the approval is still pending. Okay. It's not approval pending. It's add one thing. If I could just add one thing, Lillian, before you go on, uh, Chairman Gray, I just want to make sure that we're making a clarification. So there are requirements that are in the collective bargaining agreement that was that the council passed and that was ratified. Those are yeah. those are being implemented. Outside of that process, 
management put forward a proposal about wanting to give a greater level of incentives to nurses to not call out. That is what is being in, in negotiation with nurses right now, but that's outside of the, the collective bargaining agreement. There has not been an agreement reached about those particular incentives. There's still a conversation that's ongoing. But I, as, as you asked, and as a CFO Chikuma just said, we commit to you that we will go back and look at all of the issues that Ms. Legay and Ms. Lenoir raised, particularly as it relates to things that they believe that are not moving forward as they should in terms of settlements and arbitrations. Um, and we will make sure that we get appropriate answers and that the appropriate parties address whatever those outstanding issues are. Absolutely. When, yes, when, and, and if I may, if I may finalize with this, uh, Child Gray, thank you, Director Jacobs. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Ms. Jacobs. When can uh, when can they expect answers to the issues that continue to be outstanding at this point? Uh, when when will that answer come forward to them? So I will after we conclude, I will follow up with uh, the senior management of the hospital. I want to get make sure I understand fully what. The outstanding issues are, like, as I said, Ms. Bleday mentioned several things. She mentioned settlements, she mentioned some arbitrations, and then she also um, raised issues around um, bonuses. I want to make sure that we're clear on which bonuses she's speaking of. Are these things in the contract that's already been approved, or are these things that are still being decided? Um, and then we will uh, follow up with her. Hopefully, we'll be able to get gather that information and follow up with her this week about the status of these things. Okay, and would you would you get back to the committee um, within a week uh, about the status of these issues? Because otherwise, they'll just continue on and on and on. And we, and, 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 as, and as we move to a wind down experience um, with the uh, with the hospital, we want it to be as smooth as we possibly can, uh, yes. and that would include being able to make sure these outstanding issues have been clarified. And that they have been settled uh, as effectively as they possibly can. So, uh, can we expect we we would expect to get you would get back to us within a week about yes. what the status is of these issues? Absolutely, sir. Okay, and then I will be able to share that uh, also, and you you can as well, of course, with uh, with uh, Walla and uh, Ms. Lenoir, uh, who represent so many of the nurses uh, at the United Medical Center. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we'll expect to get, get something from you in a week, okay? Or less. Yes. Sure. All right. Councilmember Gray, I want to make this final comment that the fiscal management board has been nothing but a blessing to the organization. Their focus is nothing but patient care. And nursing uh, costs, labor costs, is priority for me as a CFO. The, the CEO and the entire organization can attest to that. They have full productivity. And when we say full productivity, we give them ability to have overtime call, over, overtime resources, have agency resources, resources if they need it. And there's nobody in the way of any regular hiring. Every cost, our target is for them to go hire everybody that is out there. Uh, that need to come to UMC so that we could continue to do the work we are called to do. There, if there's no mission, there will not be a hospital. So nobody, no control board, no fiscal management board is contrary to the mission that we have at hand, which is our patient care, very good patient care services. And we are not compromising that. And there is no budget restriction to what they need to run the census that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going on record on that as the CFO of the hospital. Okay, well, we appreciate that, Billy, and thank you very much. Uh, you heard the commitment that's been made uh, to give answers uh, to um, uh, to Walla and to uh, Ms. Lenoir about the uh, issues that they raised uh, today, and that we, we they will get answers from us within a week. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Mamari, is there anything else you want to add to um, the comments that have been made, the questions that have been raised uh, by folks here at the hearing today? 
No, no, Councilman um, Ray, I think they both spoke well about that and I am also fully committed to providing that response. Thank you. Okay. And, and I know you're involved with the, you know, we, we, we have a commitment to make in terms of the subsidy. Uh, yes, for, for UMC is the subsidy. Are we are we going to be able to live within that subsidy commitment that's been made, uh, which was a substantial commitment, and uh, we want to live up to that as well. So, are we effectively following that at this point? We are, and our fiscal year uh, twenty three budget reflects that fifteen million dollars subsidy, um, and so so the answer is yes. Okay, Ms. Jacobs, uh, I was at, I'll ask you the same question, uh, given your responsibility for the hospital uh, at this stage and that is are we are we within the, con the con constraints uh, of our uh, subsidy uh, for the hospital 15 million dollars and uh, are we going to be able to effectively meet those constraints uh, from your perspective at this stage Thank you for the question, Chairman. Yes, given all that we know today, yes, we believe that we will be able to manage the hospital within the uh, within the operating subsidy of $15 million. So there, there won't be any additional requests from the council uh, by the executive uh, for uh, in, in increasing the subsidy that uh, is available to uh, the operators at this point? That's not my expectation, sir. At this okay. point. All right. Well, when we have our next hearing, we'll <laughs> we'll hope that all these issues have been clarified. Uh, whenever we have the next hearing, and there'll be more uh, before the new hospital opens. But I want to be in a position where we can say to folks, uh, the issues that the issues that you've raised have been clarified. Uh, they've been satisfied, and we want to be able to do that as effectively as we possibly can, Ms. Jacobs. Okay. Absolutely. You have my word on that, sir. Okay, and thank you also. Thank you for your testimony and thank you, Lillian, for yours and um, and Ms. Mamari, thank you, thank you for your uh, testimony. And of course, if there are other if there are other questions, there are questions from other people uh, about the operation of the hospital uh, at this stage. We want to hear from them and try to get you answers as quickly as we possibly uh, can. Uh, we know there have been issues been raised about compensation of nurses uh, at this point. Uh, we hope that those issues being addressed, as Ms. Jacob said, they would be uh, within the next week, and we'll get those answers uh, to those who are continuing to raise uh, questions. So we appreciate it very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care of yourself. All right. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, we're going to move to uh, the Department of Health Care Finance, and we have a number of public witnesses who are uh, wish asked, asked, who've asked to testify uh, at that component of our hearing today. So um, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, and we'll turn to them now. Okay. Hi, good morning. Am, am I? Just was just one second. Okay. My first witness is Caroline Kenny. Are you there, Caroline? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, these will be witnesses for the uh, Department of Healthcare Finance, and we'll look forward to your testimony. And um, go right ahead, Caroline. Did I pronounce you your so name correctly? Yes, sir, you did. Yep. Um, and thank you so much, Councilmember Gray and other members of the Committee on Health for this opportunity to testify uh, at, at today's hearing. My name is Caroline Kenny, and I am the Managing Director of Public Private Ventures for Urban Atlantic. Uh, we're a local firm that develops and invests in commercial real estate projects that serve as catalysts for vibrant, inclusive neighborhood development. 
Since 1998, we have developed about 10,000 residential units with a real focus on affordable and mixed income housing, including housing for seniors. And that's really why I'm here today. Um, today, I'm speaking as a representative of our Abrams Hall Assisted Living Project. This is an affordable seniors assisted living community that we are about to open within the parks at Walter Reed. As many of you know, the parks is one of the district's largest new master plan communities, 3.1 million square foot mixed use, mixed income, public private partnership with the district at the historic Walter Reed campus in Ward 4. Overlooking our great lawn right in the middle of the site, we have a building called Abrams Hall that today provides housing for 77 low income veterans and 80 low income seniors. This summer, Urban Atlantic and our partners Housing Up and Trident Development Company will open the northern portion of the building. So the final piece, Abrams Hall Assisted Living, providing both housing and assisted living services for 54 low income seniors. The project is financed by DHCD and DCHA, and we're working closely with multiple district agencies, including those that I just mentioned, as well as DHS and DAPL, to connect seniors experiencing homelessness to this new community. Leveraging the district's innovative EPD waiver program and working closely with DOH and DHCF, Abrams Hall Assisted Living will serve seniors who could not otherwise afford to live in an assisted living facility and who historically were likely to be housed in nursing homes or hospitals. I'm here today to voice support for maintaining the increase in the EPD reimbursement rate that was passed in March 2020 as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. While we know that the intention of the increase was to cover a temporary spike in costs, now in year three of the pandemic, these cost impacts are anticipated to endure beyond the public health emergency, increasing our budget anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Three concrete examples are labor costs, personal protective equipment, and insurance costs. All of these have increased at about 20 percent, again, resulting in an overall budget increase somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent range. And, and Based on this, we would strongly recommend that this committee keep the enhanced rates in place. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kenny. We're, Ms. Kenny, I appreciate uh, you being so succinct uh, in your testimony. We're, we're very appreciative of that. Uh, you were right on the time. On time uh, with I was your, watching uh, the clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate it very much, okay? Thank you. Thank you for considering it. Welcome. Um, Mary Proctor with us. Turn turn your mic on. Okay, I think I'm, I think it's on now. It's on, um, it's on now. Yep. And uh, you, you you've been a trooper. You've been with us uh, for a long time, and we appreciate your continuing work and your testimony, Mary. So thank you for being here with us today. Yeah, it makes me feel right at home to be here. <laughs> so, um, here's my testimony. Um, good morning, Chairman Gray and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Mary Proctor and I'm a co-leader of the Capitol Hill Village Advocacy Team. In the interest of time, I will skip some of the passages in my written testimony. In the next panel, you will hear from four impressive witnesses from the Long-Term Care Coalition Subcommittee on the Direct Care Workforce Shortage. There are over 50 members of this coalition subcommittee, including three from the Capitol Hill Village. I'm here to tell you how disappointed we are that the mayor's budget has failed to use abundant federal grants and ample DC revenues to fix the problem of ominous shortages of direct health care workers. These workers are critical to good functioning of the entire health system. We are concerned that Medicaid reimbursements that dominate the wage range for home health aides are so low that the whole job category has a reputation for poor pay. We are most disappointed that the work of the coalition to put the pieces together for a robust apprenticeship program in DC is not viable with direct care wages as low as they now are. Healthcare organizations, including affordable assisted living, we heard, just heard from, 
and adult day centers are eager to participate in an apprenticeship program with increasing skills and responsibility along with increasing wages. There is one hitch. Many sources of funding, of training funding, will not consider funding a program to train workers that are not earning at at least 120% of minimum wage. Right now, the living wage that is supposed to be paid in Medicaid reimbursements to direct care workers is exactly the same as the minimum, the living wage is exactly the same as the minimum wage. Witnesses in panel four will tell you that 10 years ago, the living wage was significantly higher than the minimum wage. The ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act funding from the federal government gives the DC government ample funding to raise the wages for direct care workers. Witnesses in panel four will talk about the details to make this a lasting improvement beyond fiscal years 2023 and 24. Unfortunately, in the mayor's budget, ARPA money is being used to grant signing and retention bonuses to quote, solve the direct care workforce shortage. Witnesses later in this hearing will testify from their own experience that bonuses don't work to attract more work workers. This is wasted money that does not get at the real cause of the difficulty in hiring direct care workers. The pay is too low for a difficult job with expenses for certification, significant responsibility and significant risk of injury. There are workforce shortages in other states, but health and budget officials in these states are thinking ahead and using opera funds to raise wages to a level that will attract and retain workers. You will hear about these states from SEIU's Claudia Blog on panel four. Our ask, designate the funding in ARPA to increase direct care worker pay by using the funds now allocated for bonuses. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Of course, thank you very much, Mary. We appreciate all the work that you've done uh, over time and uh, we've, we've, we've been honored to be able to work with you uh, to uh, achieve, the, uh, achieve the advancements that we have achieved. So we'll continue to work with you as effectively as we possibly can, okay? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Mary. Um, Tamara, are you with us? Uh, you're muted, so check check and see if you're. you're Am muted. I muted? Yes, you are now. You you are unmuted, so. I'm muted. Right Good morning. <laughs> right <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Gray and members of the Committee on Health. I'm Tamara Smith, CEO of the DC Primary Care Association. Uh, we um, build healthier communities by some supporting community health centers, transforming healthcare delivery, uh, and advancing racial and um, uh, health equity. Um, uh, our health centers serve one in four district residents, um, and uh, we partner with many uh, community based organizations, providers, and district agencies. As health centers continue to deal uh, with, um, I will also thank you for the opportunity to present testimony this morning regarding the fiscal year 23 budget for Department of Healthcare Finance. As healthcare centers uh, continue to deal with the COVID pandemic um, and associated crises and staffing shortages, the role the HCAF plays in stabilizing the district's healthcare system is essential. DCPCA appreciates the partnership to establish the fee-for-service PMPM rate methodology that continues to provide support for FQHCs. As the end to the PHE, PHE nears, we want to ensure that DHCF budget will adequately cover FQHCs new normal costs. Those include significantly higher staffing technology um, and infection control expenses. We also share concern about access to care for Medicaid beneficiaries and the need to increase the rates of immunization and access to primary care to pre-pandemic levels. Staffing challenges that you've had heard about and will continue to hear about across all levels of the system contribute to these issues. We support um, the work uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, in innovative solutions to addressing these healthcare workforce crises, as well as increased payments for all direct support workers, behavioral health providers, and various types of healthcare providers. We commit to working in collaboration with cross-sector partners to address these workforce challenges. 
We also thank the mayor and the deputy mayor uh, and yourself for funding the transition to 12 month recertification for the Alliance program. We have long sought to achieve this parity for Alliance beneficiaries. As the recertification process begins, we really look forward to partnering with DHCF to ensure that district residents maintain insurance coverage as the continuous coverage protections under the PHE sunset. With the new MCO contract set to begin October 22nd, we urge the path of most stability, minimizing changes not specifically requested by enrollees. We urge adequate time to facilitate MCO contracting, credentialing, and payment systems setup. We also applaud DHCF's commitment to improving maternal health outcomes in the district by funding postpartum coverage for a full 12 months, resourcing non-emergency transportation for Alliance beneficiaries and including needed doula services as a Medicaid benefit. We also welcome the um, DHC's, uh, DHCF's investment in the business transformation healthcare providers must achieve to participate and thrive in value-based contracting. DCPCA and our health centers will be reliable partners in this work. We congratulate you and the administration for the groundbreaking investment in the Cedar Hill Regional Medical Center, GW Health. We will present recommendations to DHCF and GW for the service integration and health center partnerships that we believe will promote health and well being for residents east of the river. In closing, we applaud the mayor's efforts to end chronic homelessness and invest in housing affordability. We know stable housing greatly impacts health status. This is one of the most comprehensive and far reaching DHCF budgets and we applaud Deputy Mayor Turnage and his staff for their vision and leadership. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present testimony and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Tamara. We appreciate the work that you do uh, also and we've been delighted to be able to uh, work with uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage and the mayor uh, to be able to address the alliance uh, issues as well. I feel like we've been talking about this for a long time. Long time. <laughs> a long, and, and thank you for your advocacy also. Uh, Absolutely. The, the, your organization has been um, effective partners uh, with us in being able to get to a solution uh, on this. So I am so happy. I know others are uh, so happy that we are at the point where we have found a solution uh, to be able to make sure that people have the resources available to them to move forward with their services. So absolutely, thank you, thank you for your leadership too. Absolutely, thank you, Tim. We appreciate it. Take care. Okay. All right. Uh, is Louisa Burstenberg Beckham yes. with us? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Furstenberg Beckman, yeah, close enough. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, go right ahead with your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Council Member Gray and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Louisa Furstenberg Beckman, and I'm the Produce Prescription Program Manager at DC Greens, a food justice and health equity nonprofit. We've partnered with DC Healthcare Finance to implement the Produce Prescription Program for people in the district. Through DC Green's produce prescription, patients experiencing diet-related chronic illnesses are able to shop for produce, using their prescriptions to receive $80 per month. DHCF has encouraged continued innovation on this program by investing in food as medicine as an intervention and recognizing its potential to embed nutritious food access into the healthcare system. By supporting a food as medicine intervention like produce prescriptions, it puts money in the pockets of patients to buy the fruits and vegetables they both want and need to support improved health outcomes. It's also a long-term investment in pushing towards sustainable solutions that support community health. As a member of the Fair Food for All DC Coalition, we know that food insecurity is solvable. We've worked with DC Council, the executive branch, and agency partners to develop food security solutions that are now national models. Our city's persistently high rates of food insecurity are unacceptable. In the past two years, the number of DC residents relying on SNAP benefits has increased by 49%. We at DC Greens are thrilled to have full funding from DHCF to continue to implement our intervention in the coming year. However, there are gaps in funding for our Fair Food for All DC Coalition members, totaling over $1.7 million. While a large portion of the funding does come from DC Health, we must acknowledge these shortfalls for our partner organizations. We cannot afford to underfund the district's highly effective, efficient, and community-driven food access programs. 
While the budget largely seeks to return to 2019's investment in food access, the needs in our community will not revert to pre-pandemic levels without more decisive investment in action. With your support, our integrated data-driven health food access solutions will contribute to more just recovery and work to address the unacceptable health disparities. Together, we must ensure these proven local programs have the resources they need to respond to unprecedented demand, rising food costs, and continue to achieve and advance health equity in the district. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. That was uh, quite succinct. We appreciate the, the, the uh, rapid manner in which you delivered your testimony. So thank you very much. And by the way, I have been a uh, been a supporter, uh, proponent of DC Greens for a very long time, and so I'm glad to see that you are there. And I guess you're replacing the previous director uh, at this point. Uh, she's she's moved on to other things. Is that right? Yes, that's uh, correct. So anyway, thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for the work that DC Greens uh, does. Uh, which thank we know. you. And and it's been a good collaborative effort with DC Greens and other organizations um, who depend depend so much upon these uh, services as well. So thank you very much, and please let your colleagues know that we appreciate their work and their support uh, to being able to get these things done. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate your support as well, Chairman. You're welcome. Okay, thank you so much again for your testimony today. All right. Um, I'm going to move now to our next panel, uh, panel four. Uh, Claudia Schlossberg. Claudia, are you here? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. You actually uh, skipped one witness, Tamara Smith. Okay, we, no, we had Tamara already. That's right. Yeah, I'm being reminded that maybe I skipped Tamara, but Tamara knows good and well that I didn't skip her. So, oh, my no apologies, sir. Wrong witness. My apologies. No, no problem. No problem, uh, uh, Malcolm. So anyway, we're on panel panel four now. Uh, Claudia, are you here? Let's try further. I am here. Can you hear me? You are here, Claudia. I am Claudia here. Schlossberg. Okay, Claudia, you're up. Okay. Um, you okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Gray. It's great to see you. As you know, um, I'm the chairperson of the uh, subcommittee on workforce development for the Long Term Care Coalition. As you well know, long term care providers across the spectrum of both institutional and home and community based service providers face a crisis due to the shortage of direct care professionals to meet current needs and that need is growing. In late summer at your request DHCF convened a work group of provider representatives of which I participated to develop proposals to address this crisis. At that uh, outset of those meetings we acknowledged and agreed that the workforce shortage affected all sectors and all direct support professionals including certified nursing assistants. We also agreed that proposed solutions had to promote parity across all provider types to avoid creating imbalances that could favor one sector while exacerbating workforce shortages in another. As a coalition, we have advocated that the district use the substantial uh, federal ARPA funds, $88 million, uh, to fund a meaningful increase in the wages of all direct care professionals to $22 an hour. This is necessary to rectify historic discrimination and underpayment of these essential workers and to establish a foundation for the implementation of effective workforce development strategies. Unfortunately, the mayor's budget for the Department of Healthcare Finance falls short of the mark. First, contrary to the shared goals we agreed to last summer, the proposed wage increase does not apply to everyone, to all direct care professionals, rather certified nurse assistants CNAs are excluded from the definition of direct care professionals and are ineligible for the proposed wage increase even when they work in home and community based settings that for example CNAs do work in assisted living they work in adult day health and they work in people's private homes um, by excluding CNAs this is creating the very imbalance that we warned could make workforce shortages worse if certain factors sectors were favored over others Second, the proposed wage increase is simply too little and too late. Um, the proposal to increase wages to 117.6 uh, on average of the minimum wage uh, means that uh, in, in FY25, 
will means that entry level workers will still uh, be paid a wage that is significantly less than the wages paid to Amazon workers, bank tellers, and even dog walkers. Finally, I want to echo the um, the testimony made by Carolyn Kennedy regarding the rollback of enhanced provider payment rates. Uh, these rates were put in place during the pandemic. According to Deputy Mayor Turnage, the budget assumes a return to the normal pre-pandemic rate structure. Unfortunately for providers, there is no return to a pre-pandemic normal. Providers have experienced significant increases in costs. Inflation alone was four point, uh, I'm sorry, seven point nine percent last year. What this means, beginning October one, for example, assisted living providers, uh, uh, including Livingston Place um, in Ward in Ward eight, will have to absorb a rate reduction of fifteen percent. These rate reductions will put additional financial pressure on providers who are still are today struggling to meet their costs based on rates paid today. The mayor's budget makes significant capital investments in infrastructure and amenities for district residents. As a district resident, I appreciate that, including recreational facilities and a luxury dog park. However, we believe these investments reflect misplaced priorities, and we urge the council to redirect funding to ensure that all direct care professionals, including certified nursing assistants, receive the increased wages, a meaningful increase, that providers are paid their costs, and that the care needs of seniors and people with disabilities can be met. Thank you. Thank you, who are you? We appreciate it. Um, let me make sure, <clears throat> have, have your requests and those of your colleagues, have they been included in your testimony so we can understand what it is you're asking uh, the council to do at this point? Um, I did submit a uh, lengthier written testimony, and I will go back to make sure that those requests are clear. And if not, I will supplement those uh, that written testimony. Okay, we appreciate it, Claudia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think nice. Ian, are you here? It is. Okay. I'm here. You're up, Ian. Okay, thanks. Good morning, Chairman Grant. My name is Ian Perigo, and I serve as the Exec Director of the DC Coalition of Disability Service Providers. There is no general way to say this. The district's human service system is underwater. Overtime is crippling the industry. Average vacancies exceed 20% in the IDD world, with some providers reporting 38% in DSP vacancies. And a life raft that's going to be thrown in FY25 is not going to save them. Later today, you'll hear government witnesses state that the mayor's budget includes an allocation of $11.5 million from ARPA funds for FY23, distributed in the first quarter of FY23, which will be then infused into the industry. And that money is supposed to be used by service providers to calculate what can be paid in hourly wages for the remainder of the fiscal year. However, that same ARPA money does not include any allocation for the industry's hyperbolic overtime costs. And these monies will, on average, amount to about a 6% wage increase above the 1610 per hour living wage that will be in effect at the beginning of the fiscal year. That yields an average DSP wage of about $17 an hour. Mr. Chairman, that is a mighty long way from the roughly $19 an hour that the law would require and has required since 2020. It has been three years. Providers cannot fill their skyrocketing vacancy uh, gap with the 1780 per hour that are being allocated as a result of the enhanced rates from the PHE. One of our very large provider members is currently paying access of $18 an hour to recruit new untrained DSPs. And not only is it not working, it's causing the longer tenured DSPs and supervisors to resign because of the inequity in their wages. This is really the death spiral for this entire industry. As we learned in the Evans case, the systematic inatten inattention to an entire industry, when the warning lights are flashing, and countless persons within the advocacy community have publicly voiced the brave concerns about service sustainability will result in future litigation if the administration does not address this crisis with proper funding. How is a reduction to the average hourly rate of $17 an hour in January 23 going to solve this crisis? The PHE is going to end. And by DHCF's own budget submission, the funding rate for the DSP wages will revert back to the living wage of 16.10 per hour on October 1st, 22. How is the limited amount of funding going to change the, tra the trajectory of the work exodus and provide a fair shot for not only the low income, historically marginalized, largely immigrant DC resident workforce, but also our elderly vulnerable citizens who require highly skilled, trained and present workforce? When the human service, when will the human service 
uh, industry be a priority for the administration, like the dog parts that Claudia mentioned. This workforce has already waited three years. It is unconscionable to think that they will wait another three years just to get to the pre-COVID funding that they needed, the 117.6 of the living wage that they needed three years ago. We need action from the mayor to raise the district's funding of wages for these workers to $22 or more, not in FY25, but in this budget cycle. And if the mayor, and if not the mayor, quite frankly, we need the DC council to recognize the need to address this crisis and allocate the resources necessary to stabilize these industries and or redirect the existing budget preferences toward funding of these workers. On behalf of the DC Coalition of Disability Service Providers, I thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, thank you for your work also, your, your advocacy uh, on behalf of those that you uh, represent. Um, have the request that you are seeking, have you included that in your testimony? Oh, yes. Okay. And they I, are, they're, they're, there's comparative bases. Uh, there is. We, you, absolutely. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chairman. This, it's been a continuing dialogue really for the entire year. Um, and quite frankly, we're surprised that this was the outcome. Okay. What were you, what were you expecting? We were thinking that we were going to be funded at least, at least, even though we, we really could use $22 an hour. Um, certainly that's what the market would dictate based on some studies. We were thinking that at least in FY23 at the beginning of it, we would be at the 117.6 of the living wage. That that would be that was our threshold expectation. Okay, and that and that's in your testimony. It surely is. Okay, uh, we'll we'll look forward to reading that, of course, and uh, we'll do the best we can. I. Okay, thank you. I know you will. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, Is Claudia Baylog with us? I am. I am. Can you hear me? Claudia, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let me just, Chairman Gray, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Claudia Baylog. For the record, I'm the lead researcher with 1199 SEIU. Here representing thousands of healthcare workers in hospitals, clinics, and skilled nursing facilities in the district. I'm here on behalf of all healthcare workers who are struggling to survive on poverty wages. Our members couldn't attend this hearing today. Uh, quite honestly, the facilities they're working in are severely short staffed. So I hope to provide a voice for their concerns. We represent members in nursing homes who moonlight as home health aides to make ends meet. We know they make the decision to work across multiple care settings because their wages are too low. And that's why we're so disappointed in the failure of this budget to address the issue of CNA wages in settings such as Medicaid provider nursing homes. You know, we were happy to see an acknowledgement that lip service to the fact that there is a problem and an attempt to solve it. But frankly, $11.5 million won't won't address it. We see the budget raises wages slowly over the next three years. These points have already been made and it, it doesn't reflect the immediacy of the crisis. 117.6% of the living wage by fiscal year 2025 won't even be a living wage in the District of Columbia. In 2019, the National Low Income Housing Coalition reported that the district had the fourth highest housing wage in the country. That means the fair market rent for a two bedroom apartment at that time was $16.65 a month, translating to a housing wage of $32 an hour. With the extraordinarily high cost of living here, we don't think it's helpful to compare the district's reimbursement for providers and their wages with surrounding jurisdictions like Maryland. The fact is district residents can't afford to do this work and live in the district. We're also disappointed that there isn't any enforcement mechanism to ensure that workers are paid a new wage. We always agree with Department of Healthcare Finance that any plans should be underpinned with cost reports and industry accountability. But struggling individual direct service workers are owed a form of structural accountability when it comes to their paychecks. Now, the jobs themselves are changing and wages should reflect that. If our members were here today, they would tell you about the changes in their day-to-day -day work. 
They're caring for more residents on ventilators or with trachs or who need wound care, or who reside in memory units. They're assisting residents with complex medical needs who, be, who need to be lifted and toileted and bathed and cared for. And the higher demands of their jobs, which are resulting in increasing numbers of workplace injuries, have to be reflected in their pay. I'm going to close by uh, highlighting states that are in my written testimony, like New Jersey and Michigan, that are going to use their ARPA dollars and their revenue combined to address workforce shortages in both nursing homes and home care across the long-term care spectrum. Tennessee was an example I love to talk about because it shows multi-agency collaboration to fund both workforce development and wage increases. They're creating career ladders and we should emulate that. Finally, I will remind everyone that these are workers who are overwhelmingly women of color and immigrants. This budget simply doesn't create a sustainable healthcare workforce for the district, and it doesn't honor the skills and the physical and emotional tolls of this work for the folks who are toiling at this right now. So I thank you for my time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Claudia. We appreciate your testimony and the work uh, of you and your colleagues. Uh, and um, and all and all of these points that you've made are included in your testimony. Is that right? Correct. Okay, good. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right. Um, Right. Let's see. Judith Levy, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Go right ahead with your testimony. Thank okay. You. Good morning, uh, committee chair Gray and other mem committee members. My name is Judith Levy, coordinator of the DC Coalition on Long-Term Care. I will summarize my testimony as you already heard from other panel members regarding the issues we are concerned about. Uh, for at least the last five years, we have focused on workforce issues. Our concern is that direct care workers, the backbone of our system are ignored. It appears now that the passage of living wage leg legislation was not the answer to recruitment and retention of direct care workers. A major factor of this crisis is the district's provider funding structure, which, which uses the DC living wage rate to fund wages for direct care workers. Unlike private sectors where wage rates are, can rise with the marketplace, wages for direct care workers are largely driven by Medicaid reimbursement rates because Medicaid is the largest payer for long-term care services and supports. With wage rates or at or close to the district minimum wage, current wages are leaving their jobs for higher pay and less demanding work. And this has been uh, talked about in the previous testimony. Commendably, commendably, DHCF has recognized that its payment rates to providers for wages are no longer adequate or competitive, and that they must be raised equitably across all providers. DHCF has listened to our concern, has engaged in constructive uh, uh, dialogue on solutions. However, we are concerned that DHCF is not able to reach the wage funding rates necessary to meet this new highly competitive market. The mayor proposed budget does not actually address the problem. We recognize that DHCF, DHCF is proposing a rate study to establish rate methodologies that will support home health agencies to focus on improving beneficiaries uh, experience of care and appropriate service to obtain better outcomes for an individual 
implementation of the, but the implementation of this results will not be until FY24. I'm going to summarize every, uh, my uh, statement. So I am in within my three minutes. The final analysis is as follows. The proposed provider reimbursement applies only to home care based services participating in the district Medicaid program, not including assisted living or skilled nursing facilities. The budget is not clear on how the APRA spending plan toward retention and recruitment will be used together to raise workers' wages. Plus, it would seem that the public health emergency adjusted rates are not taken into consideration in the planning of the rate increase. Planning to implement the wage increase over a three-year period does not recognize the immediacy of the staffing crisis. Historically, when living wage legislation was passed, it took several years before there was any enforcement mechanism. We remain concerned that this lack of enforcement continues to be a problem, which will affect the implementation of wage increases. Although we understand that many programs are needed to ensure adequate staffing of long-term care services and supports, our highest priority is increasing the minimum wage rate for direct care workers to $22 an hour so that the industry can compete with other employers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding FY23 budget. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Uh, we appreciate your testimony and the support of your colleagues. Um, has, has all of this, <clears throat> the issues that you raised, has all of that been included in your testimony? Your written yes. Testimony? Yes, it, it has. Mm -hmm. it, more detail, and okay. the detail yeah. of the other uh, members of the panel. We have worked Thank together. Thank you very much, Judith. Thank you so much for your testimony. Okay. You're welcome. Mark Lavoda, are you here, sir? I'm here. Okay. Go right ahead with your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Gray, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mark Lavota. I'm the executive director of the District of Columbia Behavioral Health Association and Award Two homeowner. The District of Columbia Behavioral Health Association works to advance high quality whole person care for all district residents with mental illness or substance use disorders, including the 35,000 district residents that our 32 member organizations serve annually. The Department of Healthcare Finance proposed FY23 budget makes important progress to address district resident needs, and I encourage council members to identify additional funds to accelerate the progress funded in the mayor's proposed budget. As the Department of Healthcare Finance takes additional responsibility for payment rates for DBH certified provider organizations, the proposed budget addresses inflationary costs facing these providers for the first time in years. As background, a temporary 20% rate increase is in effect for substance use disorder level two and three providers that serve about 2,500 of DBH's 35,000 enrolled consumers. This will expire with the end of the public health emergency. Otherwise, those rates and the provider rates for services to 32,500 other DBH enrolled consumers remain based on 2016 costs. The Department of Healthcare Finance has requested a 1.8% adjustment from CMS for DBH certified providers in FY22 and plans an additional 1.6% increase in FY23, cumulatively a 2.88% increase. This does not close the gap of 16.1% from the fourth quarter of 2016 to the first quarter of 2023, shown in the Medicare Economic Index data used by DHCF for rate setting. The 1.8% and 1.6% increases fall 13.22% short of the rise in cost DBH certified provider space. We encourage the council to accelerate payment rate updates with funding to support greater inflationary cost up offsets. If nothing else, the council should provide sufficient funding for immediate implementation in FY23 of adjusted rates from a cost study that's underway, along with anticipated changes to benefit design for behavioral health rehabilitation services. While the council can take some small comfort in DHCF starting to address years of poor rate setting practices for DBH certified providers, the council can take much more comfort in seeing the DHCF FY23 proposed budget resolve one of the most significant issues that both the public and the council have sought to overcome for years, increasing alignment of DC Healthcare Alliance certification requirements with Medicaid eligibility standards. 
the elimination of the face-to-face -face interview requirement and extension of Alliance enrollment from six months to one year are two critical policy changes that the council should celebrate. We join colleagues from the Coalition for Improving the Alliance in thanking the mayor's team and DHCF for funding these changes in the mayor's proposed budget and offering relevant enabling legislation in a Budget Support Act subtitle. We take great satisfaction encouraging the council to adopt these proposed changes. We again acknowledge other positive initiatives underway at DHCF that are strengthened and continued in the proposed FY23 budget. We remain grateful for efforts underway to strengthen the district's digital health infrastructure and to offer provider organizations both technical assistance and direct financial support for adoption of enhanced health technologies, including new or updated electronic health records and deeper clinical integration with the district's designated health information exchange. We acknowledge other technical assistance also available to improve practice management and delivery of integrated care services. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you uh, very much, Margaret. We appreciate your testimony and your continued advocacy. And I want to acknowledge the advocacy of some of the uh, your colleagues who are here with you today, who worked with us so hard on the uh, on the alliance. What a, what 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 a journey that has been. And uh, Damon, I I know you're here, and we'll hear from you. And um, I hope you're excited about where we're going uh, at this stage. It's been a journey and you've been on that journey. So uh, I just wanna make sure everybody's clear that uh, we've worked closely with you to get to where we are with the Alliance uh, at this point. And we'll hear from that, we'll hear from you uh, when you deliver your testimony. So uh, thank you for being here today. Mark, thank you for your testimony and your continued work on behalf of the behavioral health community uh, in the city. And we appreciate it very much, Mark. Thank you so much. Jackie, are you here? I am. Can you hear me? I sure can. How are you today? I am very well, sir, and I'm super well because I get to see you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you something. I uh, I just want to thank you uh, for um, the work that you did with, with the hospital association uh, to help us get to the point where we have a new hospital being built on the east end uh, of the city, and uh, you have been such a champion. Uh, I am delighted to be able to say that and that what uh, what you know, fantastic work we've been able to do with the hospital association, uh, with your leadership. So I'm excited to hear your testimony today and excited for the work that you've done as the uh, leader uh, of the hospital association. And I hope that, uh, hope that your colleagues uh, appreciate your work uh, at the hospital association and will recognize uh, the outstanding accomplishments that we've made to get to where we are today. And we thank them uh, for their work as well. So I'm looking forward to your testimony. So thank you, Jackie, and uh, go right ahead with your testimony. Well, 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 thank you, sir. I would say, I would make a comment about where we were five years ago in the questions that, uh, in the discussion we had. So I uh, send um, salutes and thanks to you as well, because it has been quite a ride, but you've been the leader and thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, Chairman Gray, thank you for this opportunity uh, to um, testify today. I am Jacqueline Bowens and I'm the President and CEO of the DC Hospital Association. And I very much appreciate being here to testify on the Department of Healthcare Finance FY23 uh, budget oversight. DCHA, as you know, represents the interests of our members who provide care to residents from all eight wards, our neighbors in Maryland, Virginia, and patients from around the world. The association, our members, and the Department of Healthcare Finance are central partners in ensuring the healthcare needs of the district residents are met. Under the direction of Deputy Mayor Turnage, Medicaid Director Melissa Bird, Finance Director Angelique Martin, and all the many dedicated department employees, DHCF continues to innovate, modernize policies, and implement programs to ensure the district's Medicaid dollars are well spent. 
As you know, the pandemic caused strains across the healthcare system, and DHCF worked to provide grants to the hospitals and enhance rates to other providers to ensure that we were able to weather the storm and continue to operate. As the potential end to the federal PHE is looming and the loss of enhanced rates thereafter, it is essential that rebasing of providers captures the increased cost of the last two years to ensure its stable rates. This is because labor and materials costs have increased significantly and are not expected to go down. It is our understanding that the is working on this rebasing and we're certainly supportive of that effort. When it comes to the Alliance population, we're excited, as I'm sure you are, Mr. Chairman, that there is a permanent end to face-to-face -face recertification as well as an end to the six-month research. We're hopeful this change will reduce churn and support a stable Alliance enrollment. We're also looking forward to behavioral health services being added to the Alliance benefits soon. Behavioral health services are just as important as medical services and adding them as a covered service is very welcome. There's one issue we have started raising with the department and wanted to draw your attention to it. With an aging Alliance population, we believe that the district must start planning for long-term care services for this population, which are currently not available. Hospitals have seen several cases over the last few years of patients remaining in our facilities much longer than needed because there was no place to discharge the patient to at a lower level of care due to lack of a payment source. The most recent example was a patient that spent over 915 days in one of our hospitals. We believe the need will grow in the coming years and should be part of the discussion around services for the Alliance population. CCH and its members support the work of the department to address the sustainability and living wage issues that you've heard about most of this morning. The investment funds to support a wage at an average of 117.6% of the living minimum wage is an important first step, but it does not solve all our workforce problems, especially in the direct care workforce. But it does show a commitment from the department to continue to support the direct care industry. We do hope that the providers included in this policy are comprehensive to include all direct care workers. Finally, I want to thank the mayor and the department for their continued investment in hospital rates and funding. The continued commitment to pay 98% of costs on the fee-for-service inpatient side and 100% of costs on the outpatient side continues to be a significant investment in our health care system. We're also thankful that the provider tax continues to remain static in this budget. And in closing, but equally important, I want to reiterate that DCHA looks forward to our continued collaboration with the department in advancing system transformation in the district, including planning for the opening of Cedar Hill Regional Medical Center, GW Health, in 2024, and the realization of a fully integrated healthcare system on the east end of the city. Mr. Chairman, I know how passionate and um, committed that you are to this, and we are as well, and we are so looking forward uh, to the real realization of healthcare access for all, regardless of geography. So thank you so much for allowing me to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much for your testimony and your advocacy. Uh, your leadership uh, with the Hospital Association has been absolutely, um, uh, I, I can't say enough positive things uh, about it and, and for the leadership you have provided uh, with the uh, hospital association uh, leaders uh, as well. And uh, you've been there. You and I have talked, I, I can't even count the number of times and conversations that we've had uh, about these issues that you've it's been, been a there. 24 hour, it's been a 24 hour adventure, but you know, I'm so proud of the city of my birth. I'm so proud of you and the mayor and the leader. And I don't think uh, people know um, there are a handful of us who know the heavy lift. There are a handful of us who know the heavy lift. Uh, and I don't think it can be celebrated enough uh, uh, for the community, for everyone to know that we are this much, we're this close. We are this close. Uh, and thank you so much, um, Mr. Chairman. Really, um, uh, you are a sung and an unsung and overall hero on this. And I don't think uh, there are enough words uh, to thank you uh, for for never, 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 never giving up. So thank you on behalf of my members, behalf of my collaborators and partners. Um, we're almost there. We're close to the finish line. Absolutely. Well, Jackie, thank you so much. And please convey to your members um, the appreciation that I have on behalf of the council um, for the work that you've done. Gosh, I remember that trip we took to Los Angeles. That's right. And, uh, That's right. And That's we right. wanted to see what they were doing there, and we saw the hospital that they uh, had developed uh, there, and 
the work that they had done to make that happen. And uh, I think we left there today hopeful that that day that we would be hopeful uh, for what we could do here in the District of Columbia. And um, look at where we are at this point. I mean, yeah, but also it can be understated that what that what that experience did is it was a it was a learning lesson in terms of. Uh, uh, things to consider going in for this project. And so I'm sure the deputy mayor and, and um, Mr. Stutz and Ms. Russo would all agree that that information uh, from that experience really has, has, has helped significantly in terms of how to plan uh, for Cedar Hill. So um, uh, it, it, it definitely, I think, uh, made a difference. I just one last thing before we go to the next witness. Um, one of the things that I certainly am going to do is uh, run the tape from five years ago when I started in this role uh, and that budget session. And uh, I'm looking forward to rolling the tape and see truly see how far we have come. <laughs> what 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 a journey uh, that has been, and um, it, it's it's a great example of. You know, the government working together with an advocacy group in the hospital private partnership at its best. Yep. And what we've been able to do is it, phenomenal, yes. Jack. And I thank you yes. for your leadership. And, and to my fellow panelists, thank you for indulging us. Uh you 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 have to know this the passion that we all have uh for this. So I, I apologize to my fellow panelists, but thank you all for indulging our passion on this. We are repeat performers on this, but it does show to you how much we really this really does matter. So again, to my to my panelists uh, who I am seeing virtually here, I just want to say, but but we're almost there. So thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, panelists, for uh, your patience with us. Well, thank you, Jackie. Thank you for your testimony. And um, what a journey uh, this has been and continues. That's right. Uh, we we're almost there. Years That's right. of uh, work to be done uh, right. to make this happen. And uh, I'm delighted to have worked with you and your colleagues uh, to be able to get uh, to this stage. So thank you, Jackie, so much. Thank you, for sir. Your, uh, thank you, sir. I'm going to hang on, but I'll here in case you have any other questions. So I'm going to go yeah. on mute, but I'll be here. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you very much for your advocacy and your work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, I think, uh, Damon, I think you're next, uh, for, with your testimony and you must be happy today. <laughs> yes. Yes. Chairperson Gray. I, it's, it's, it's very exciting to be able to testify. Uh, to testify on alliance, as you've indicated, it's been it's been a long journey uh, to to get us there, and you know we're really thankful for uh, the work that you and your staff have done at the health committee, uh, also the work that Councilmember Nadeau over at the Human Services Committee and her staff uh, have done to help get us to this point. Um, and and you know I I I I want to I want to acknowledge that before getting into my testimony. Um, but I will go ahead and say, um, first of all, introduce myself. My name is Damon King, um, and I'm the policy director at the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia. Um, I'm testifying today on behalf of Legal Aid to thank the Bowser administration uh, for using the mayor's proposed fiscal year 23 budget uh, to propose the permanent end of the Healthcare Alliance's six month in person recertification requirement. Uh, as you and many of the folks on this on this uh, WebEx call know, uh, the six month in person recertification requirement has been a barrier um, for uh, immigrants with low incomes in the district to access health care uh, for more than a decade. Um, we've talked at legal aid at these hearings. Um, our colleagues at other organizations have talked at these hearings, and members of the community have talked at these hearings. Um, about the difficulties that they have had maintaining their health coverage within the alliance due to this policy. Uh, we've talked about folks lining up outside of DHS buildings uh, in the early hours of the morning and waiting in line just to be able to keep their health care. We've talked about folks who've lost their health care unnecessarily uh, through no fault of their own, despite their best efforts. Um, and, and, and so we are so pleased. Um, that in this year's budget, the mayor is proposing ending the policy, uh, getting rid of in-person interviews, both for initial applications and renewals, um, and also switching to an annual renewal schedule. Uh, we believe that this policy is going to have benefits um, for, for a number of different populations. Uh, first and foremost, the Alliance population itself. 
Um, it's going to be you know much easier for our folks participating in the alliance to maintain their health coverage and therefore their access to continuous health care. Um, but we also think that there's actually a broader benefit as well um, in that DHS has had to process these recertification requests every six months, uh, and they've been the ones who've had to conduct the in-person interviews. Um, and so this policy change actually uh, lowers the administrative burden for DHS uh, because they're going to have to process these submissions half as often, um, and they're not going to have to do the in-person interviews. Um, and that means hopefully that we can you know, take the next step and start addressing some of the capacity issues that have been um, been going on at the service centers for many, many years. Um, and, and, and also, you know, addressing DHS's ability to process um, submissions across a range of public benefits programs more quickly and efficiently. Um, so we think this 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 policy really is going to benefit the broader population of folks in the district who access uh, our safety net programs, specifically those administered by DHS. Um, and so it really is um, it really is a huge reform. So we want to thank the mayor for proposing this. Um, we want to thank you, Council Member Gray, and also, as I've said, Council Member Nadeau, for your work over the years on this. And we hope to see the council approve this change when it approves the budget um, later to this spring. Thank you. Well, thank you, Damon, and thank you for the work uh, that you that you do, uh, that you've done, and will continue to do. Um, it's really been phenomenal, and uh, I want you to know how appreciative I am. Uh, this has been quite a journey uh, for us. I mean, we're celebrating a new hospital being built in the District of Columbia, and uh, replacing you know, well, not replacing, but developing a new healthcare system for people. Uh, who live on the east end of the city. And uh, I want to thank you for your work uh, in helping uh, helping us to make this happen. Um, it'll be a great day when we actually can cut the ribbon uh, on the new facilities that have health care services, the uh, health, the, the, the additional services that are being developed essentially as we speak. Uh, and Damon, I want to thank you for uh, your un, un, unwavering uh, work and your colleagues uh, to be able to make this happen. So thank you so much for your work. I appreciate it very much. And uh, isn't it wonderful that we've now got the alliance uh, moving in the right direction at this point? And uh, absolutely, yeah, we won't have we won't have to go back over that journey again. Hopefully, absolutely. No, thank you, thank you so much, Chairperson Gray, and we are. We are very excited that this that this change is happening. Well, please tell your colleagues uh, as well uh, how appreciative I am uh, for the work that you do at the uh, Legal Aid uh, Society and um, and all those efforts that have now paid off to the benefit of so many people who now won't have to get up at two o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning and go stand in these long lines and. Uh, Terrible weather uh, that they've endured uh, to be able to um, to make this happen. So it is a is a great uh, great experience. We're delighted, and um, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, we can we can celebrate with also um, uh, our colleague uh, at at the deputy mayor uh, who worked with us uh, closely and uh, unwaveringly. Uh, to be able uh, to make this happen. So please express, uh, when you get a chance, express your appreciation to him uh, for the work that uh, the work that he has done to make this happen. We, we, Absolutely. We very much Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Damon. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Gray. Okay. I'm, I'm going to mispronounce his name. I can see it coming. Um, Mandar Bodas, is that close? <laughs> That's almost 95% close, so thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> how, how badly did I uh, mispronounce your name? <laughs> the first name is Mandar, but you got the last right, so that's uh, that's more than I, can, I have uh, experienced before. So uh, I think you got it almost right. 
you're very generous in your comments. I appreciate that. So uh, we we're glad to have you and go right ahead with your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, so a very good morning to you, Chairman Gray and the members of the committee. I am Mandar Bodas. I work as a research scientist at the Fitz Hugh Mullen Institute for Health Workforce Equity in the George Washington University. I conduct research on the health workforce, including the direct care workforce. And over the course of last one year, I, along with my colleagues at the Mullen Institute, have published and reviewed several reports and articles on this topic. One of them was a report on advanced roles for home care workers, and another was an article that reviewed states' plans for additional funds that they are slated to receive under Section 9817 of the American Rescue Plan Act. I'm here today to present my to present findings from my work and support wage increase for direct care workers in the FY23 budget. As a researcher working in academia, I want to start off by saying that I deeply respect the work performed by this workforce, which helps millions of people receive care in their homes instead of receiving it at an institutional setting. I'm aware of and concerned about the tough working conditions under which these workers perform their jobs. I'm also cognizant of the fact that the pay received by these workers is extremely low. I would like to draw the committee's attention to three major points. First, it is no surprise that the academic literature consistently shows that the wage rates for occupations that are part of the direct care workforce are quite low. In a recent report by Bates and colleagues at the UCSF Health Workforce Research Center on Long-Term long Care, which analyzed data from the current population survey from 2009 to 2019, the median hourly wage earned by personal care attendants was as low as $12. While the wage rates in District of Columbia are nominally higher compared to the national average, they do not seem sufficiently high after adjusting for the higher cost of living in this region. Second point is that multiple reports indicate that a large number of direct care workers left their tough, low paying jobs during the COVID-19 public health emergency to seek better opportunities in other sectors of the economy. This is a major concern since the demand for these occupations is project projected to rise substantially in the coming years. Surveys of direct care workers suggest that increased compensation is the single most important factor that could improve their job quality. Going forward, higher wages are necessary to retain and sustain a strong direct care workforce in the District of Columbia. And finally, the third point, concerns the district's American Rescue Plan Act Section 9817 plan, which provides only a one-time recruitment and retention bonus. In our analysis of more than 38 state plans, we found that almost all states were planning to increase compensation for the direct care workforce, mostly via wage increases along with bonuses. The state of New Jersey plans to raise wages as high as $23 per hour, and state of Idaho plans to utilize the entirety of its increased funding just to increase compensation for direct care workforce. Some states are also including additional supports such as transportation grants and childcare benefits. What this shows is how low compensation is universally recognized as, the, as a critical issue for this workforce, and it is being addressed urgently across all states. Higher wages for direct care workforce can help them perform their jobs effectively, despite them facing several hurdles, such as not having access to full-time benefits, transportation challenges, and lack of affordable housing. Research consistently shows that increased pay for direct care workforce is associated with higher job satisfaction, lower turnover rates, and better care received by some of the most vulnerable members of our community. So in conclusion, I would like to thank you, Chairman Gray, for the opportunity to testify at this hearing. And I reinstate my position supporting increased pay for the direct care workers in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bodas. I appreciate your testimony. And by the way, I should mention this, which I like to do when I, whenever I get the opportunity. I'm a graduate of George Washington University. And uh, that's wonderful I'm delighted that you are have pursued your <laughs> your education there. I went to undergraduate and graduate school at George Washington University. And uh, I'm proud uh, to be a graduate of such an outstanding uh, level of uh, institution of higher, uh, higher learning uh, in our city. So 
Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. You're welcome. Is Celine, Laura? Um, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. You ready to testify? Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Gray, members and a staff from the committee. My name is Selene Lara and I work as a community health worker and I am a member of the patient advisory committee from La Clinica del Pueblo. I am honored to work with the immigrant Latino community from the District of Columbia in the health promotion program that works to prevent and treat chronic illnesses such as hypertension and diabetes. I have lived in DC for 10 years with my daughter, who is four years old, and with my husband. And I have been part of the DC Alliance program for nine years. Today, I would like to thank Mayor Bowser's and her team's decision of including the repeal of the six month recertification requirement for the DC Alliance within her proposed 22-23 Budget Support Act to the City Council, as well as eliminating the need for an in-person requirement. This is an important step for immigrants like me and for all DC residents, as it will be a key element to have continuous healthcare coverage. The implications of not having to renew my um, to renew for me are important. First, I will not have to miss work and wait in long lines to be able to process the recertification. Second, I will not have to miss appointments so often due to inactive coverage. This has a great impact on my health since I have a condition called mitral valve prolapse, which requires having regular examinations to monitor my heart condition. Third, I will be able to obtain medications with less interruptions in my treatment. Fourth, I will be able to renew the DC Alliance at the same time as I renew Medicaid for my daughter. Finally, I will be able to spend more time focusing on other priorities, such as taking care of my daughter, spending time with my husband, working and finishing my business administration degree. Eliminating all of these barriers to enrollment has enormous implications in the lives of many immigrants like me. Today, I kindly ask the DC Council to support this funding request from Mayor Bowser and keep protecting the DC Alliance program. This will be an important change so that we are able to make the most of the program benefits that are truly important for our well being. I appreciate the opportunity to testify the, uh, before the, the Committee of, on Health. Respectfully, Celine Lara. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Laura. Um, I want to make sure we don't leave out uh, some other people too, and I appreciate you being uh, your, your expression of appreciation to the mayor and and Dwayne Turnage. Uh, who has been phenomenal uh, in working with these issues. And also my colleague, uh, Brianne Nadeau, uh, who has been wonderful uh, in working with these issues uh, almost from day one. So um, I hope you will express your appreciation to her as that opportunity presents itself and to Wayne Turnage uh, as well, the deputy uh, mayor. So um, we all are delighted that the Alliance is now uh, being free, been unshackled uh, from some of the uh, difficulties that have made it almost impossible uh, to be able to move forward. You probably heard me talk earlier about the uh, number of hours people were getting up in the morning to go and stand in those long lines and to be able to know that that's over, over at this point is absolutely uh, phenomenal. And uh, to be able to make sure that these uh, health benefits are available to people um, that won't and they won't be shackled in the way they have been before. So we're, we're delighted. We're all, all delighted. To Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. I was yeah. one of them. I was one of them as well. Um, waking up early um, yeah. when my daughter was a newborn, I had to take her with me. Um, it's a little emotional. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, we understand. Um, 
there's more than a few of us who've shed tears also uh, about the uh, unconscionable um, early hours people have had to get up and go stand in these long rounds some days to be denied uh, the opportunity to be certified. And those days are over. And thank, thank goodness. So we're, we're, we're happy about that. So I hope you are too. All right. Martin Miller, are you with us? I'm, I'm with you, Chair Gray. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. Thank you. It's, it's, it's Monday, a whole new opportunity to. To do more work. Exactly right. And uh, we appreciate the work that you do too, Mark. So thank you. We've had a lot of appreciation expressed today uh, for this budget, for the work that people have done. Um, we appreciate the work that the mayor has done uh, to help us get to where we are. I appreciate the work of my colleagues uh, on the council uh, to be able to be able to help us surmount uh, some of the obstacles that we had experienced. So. Um, and you've been one of those who have been very diligent in making sure people are um, aware of the obstacles that need to continue to be surrounded. So thank you, Mark. Go right ahead right with your testimony. Thank you. Moving forward. Well, good afternoon, Chair Gray and members of the Committee on Health. My name is Mark Miller. I'm the DC Long Term Care Ombudsman with Legal Counsel for the Elderly. Uh, let me let me start. Um, by expressing my appreciation for the financial support, which uh, our program receives from DHCF, which is made possible by an agreement uh, between them and the Department of Aging and Community Living. Uh, this support this supports critical to our successful work resolving concerns on behalf of EPD waiver beneficiaries and nursing home residents. 90% of the individuals we served in 2021 were Medicaid recipients or dual, dual eligible recipients. Uh, the Ombudsman program supports the efforts of DHCF to provide district residents with a comprehensive package of benefits, particularly through the EPD waiver, allowing many individuals, as you notice, to remain in their own homes and maintain vital connections with families and their communities. This high level of commitment is certainly exemplary by comparison to other states. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we're hearing, though, is a number of complaints uh, that beneficiaries uh, are not getting the number of hours that they're approved for, that the home health agencies cannot uh, put, give them those hours. DHCF has provided guidance on how PCA services can be obtained from more than one agency. However, that option is not often exercised. Uh, so we, we appreciate the ongoing assistance of DHCF staff to address these issues as they arise. Uh, however, the lack of staffing is a systemic problem across the long-term care services continuum and has to be addressed. And I know we've heard a lot about staffing this morning. I have an opportunity to meet with HHS Secretary for Sarah on Wednesday. I know staffing is gonna be an issue uh, that's gonna come up. Uh, you're gonna need to figure out how to get a handle handle on this. And it's more than just wages, it's, it's support for these workers, transportation assistance, uh, childcare, all those sorts of things that need to go into that sort of a package. So uh, adequate funding of home health and community-based services is more critical now than ever before. Without these services, district residents may be unnecessarily forced into nursing homes and other congregate settings, which means right now many of them may have to leave the district because we already know there's an insufficient number of nursing home beds here in the district. Uh, finally, we've been working with DHCF um, to uh, increase the personal needs allowance, which Medicaid recipients receive that are living in nursing facilities. We'd like to see that move from $70 to $100. Um, it has not been increased in about 20 years. Uh, residents urgently request this increase so they can maintain a cell phone to keep up communication with family members and to purchase needed clothing, as well as other items such as regular haircuts uh, and personal hygiene items. We continue to advocate for this important issue and have been in contact with DHCF. It's our understanding that the PNA will be increased this year and a formal transmittal will be issued soon. However, we have not seen anything to date or heard how much the increase 
may be. So we would request that you ask DHCF about uh, this issue later later today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, um, and we commend you, Chair Gray, you know, for all your advocacy on behalf of uh, district Medicaid beneficiaries. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for your uh, thank you for your work uh, with so many people. Uh, in the District of Columbia, who depend heavily uh, on the work that you do, uh, I'm one of those who is very, apt, very um, um, clear about the value of the work that you do. So, thank you, Mark. Thank I you. appreciate it. Appreciate it. And your and your testimony includes all the points that you've made. I assume, yes, it right? does. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. I hope, I, don't, I, hope, I, hope, I hope that I don't mispronounce his name uh, badly, which I may do. Mary Cabriel. That's pretty Cabriel. good, Cabriel. Like the angel with the C. You did a great job. <laughs> day, Mary. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Gray, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Mary Cabriel, and I'm the Director of Workforce Services at Academy of Hope Adult Public Charter School, AOH. For over 35 years, AOH has provided district adults education, high school credentialing through the GED and NEDP, workforce training, and supportive services. As the pandemic continues, addressing the education and career development needs of district residents most impacted by COVID-19 remains more critical than ever. I'm here today to highlight how AOH is serving a critical role in ensuring a truly inclusive recovery and the ways next year's budget can bolster these efforts. We were initially encouraged to see the Mayor Bowser allocated $11 million to support direct support professionals, but were quickly disappointed when we saw that CNAs were not included in that investment. The DC Health Sector Partnership identified CNAs and home health aides as two of DC's five highest demand, highest growth entry level career health occupations and projects DC will need 13,000 workers among these five occupations within the next five years. Without sufficient numbers of high quality direct staff, care staff, DC cannot meet the current needs of residents and their families. Without action now, family caregivers, acute care hospitals, service providers, and long-term care facilities will inevitably be overwhelmed. AOH has been working to create access and opportunities for DC residents to help the city meet this critical need through our highly sought after CNA program. Over the last two and a half years, we've developed a robust certified nursing assistant training program with employer partners and expanded our health healthcare pathway training to our Ward 8 site. Our interest applications for the CNA program alone to date this school year is at 113 and growing. This past school year, 100% of learners who completed our nursing assistant program became licensed certified nursing assistants, the highest success rate in DC, may I add. 90% of our CNA learners reported obtaining employment and 47% were placed in CNA roles. Those in CNA positions are making an average salary of $16.40 and the remaining moved into non-CNA roles making $19 an hour and more. While we continue to see wait lists, we suspect that we could begin to see a decline in interest due to the low wages learners make once certified as nursing assistants. We're growing very concerned about the long-term sustainability of the CNA pathway as a solution to meet the growing needs of the district's vulnerable, older, and disabled residents. The work requires significant training, passing an exam, continuing ed, and oversight by regulators. Yet CNAs are paid less than other allied health workers and non-health sector workers who need less training and have less responsibility. If we are truly expecting CNAs to help the district's healthcare worker shortage, we have to ensure that they are paid a real living wage. Academy of Hope is in support of MIT's and BLS's recommendation that a real living wage for DC in 2022 should be $22 an hour. We are asking that council consider including CNAs in the $11 million allocation to increase provider wages over a three year period. Please also consider increasing provider rates to ensure a payment of real living wage to direct care workers of $22 an hour. We really need the council support in bridging this gap in our system to ensure that CNAs across the district are paid real living wages to help stabilize the sector before it's too late. Academy of Hope is ready to be a critical partner in training DC residents. We look forward to assisting more DC residents and partnering with the council and the Department of Healthcare Finance to best serve DC residents in the critical months and years ahead. 
Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. I was going to suggest, um, uh, I'm, you know, I in Perigo. No, I don't. I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make a connection here because I'm, I ain't has been, uh, a, an advocate, you know, huge, uh, effective advocate for, um, wage issues like you raised, uh, in your testimony. Uh, so I'd like to get you connected with him and maybe talk about, uh, how you all might be able to work together uh, on some of the issues that he's uh, focused on with uh, with the uh, the workforce that he's he's working with. So um, we, we'll be happy to try to make the connection uh, with with uh, you and Ian uh, also. That's great. This work. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. All right, Veronica, are you here? Thank you. Muted. Can you unmute? Hang on a minute. Let's see. If we can't get you unmuted. Okay. Yeah, it looks like she's unmuted, but for some reason her mic is just not picking up her voice. Well, this is ha it's happened before with her, didn't we? Didn't it? Uh, so. Yeah, it did. It had. Uh, Veronica, hang on. Uh, you're unmuted. You're not muted, excuse me. You are muted, excuse me, you are muted. So um, we'll have to come, just, just hang on, and we'll come back to you shortly, okay? Um, how about Mary Hargraves? Are you with us, Mary? No, but Sue Hargraves is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Gray and members of the committee. I have... <laughs> Hi there. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Hargraves, and I'm the administrator of the Lisner Louise Dixon Hurt Home, a five-star long-term care public charity where I've had the honor and privilege of sharing and providing care to underserved elders of the district for 32 of the home's 82 total years of continuous service. As you may know, the Lisner Home recently received the DC Department of Housing and Community Development Award to construct the first affordable senior housing project in Ward 3. This will allow us to continue expanding our services to those we serve in the long-term care continuum. Additionally, I've served on the, and continue to serve on the board of the DCHCA in numerous roles over the past 15 years. Therefore, I speak not only from an independent provider's perspective, but as a member of the association representing both skilled and assisted living facilities, serving 3,000 of the most vulnerable elders of our community. I want to start by thanking the mayor and the council for the 20% increase during the public health emergency and for the care and support we received during this extraordinary difficult time in history. What is most startling and disconcerting to me is the fact that the proposed budget fails to adequately recognize the needs of the district's senior population. Their needs will only become more compelling as this age group continues to increase in size. This will in turn place a tremendous burden on facilities such as the Lisner Home to recruit and retain highly skilled direct care workers workers who have already subject to stringent regulatory oversight and who earn lower salaries. This includes our certified nursing assistants who perform some of the most intimate tasks in caring for our residents and who remain at the lower end of the income spectrum. Add to this the proposal that only home and community-based service workers get the raise of 117.6% over the living wage, and we've exacerbated the problem significantly. It would likely drive numbers of these trained, talented employees to leave their jobs at local nursing homes to take these higher paying positions. Candidly, I was shocked that our great city and our amazing leaders who champion the underserved would consider not giving this well-deserved and necessary increase across the board. Please keep the playing field equal and extend the increase to all long-term care workers who are hard to find, hard to keep, and woefully underpaid for the work that they do. I urge this committee to address this issue thoughtfully and with generous intent. 
you know, Chairman Gray, I've heard people say, gee, during the public health emergency in nursing homes, everyone was considered heroes. And now they're feeling they're turning into zeros. So please help. You've heard this over and over through all of these unbelievable testimonies and caring individuals throughout our city. This has to be addressed. Please do that for the elders that we serve and for those that give such so lovingly and caringly of themselves. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm sorry to have given you a new first name. <laughs> Mary's okay. I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to butcher your, your first name, so uh, I apologize for that. And uh, we appreciate your testimony and the uh, the points that you made. All of which are included in your written testimony. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. I appreciate it. Veronica, are you there? Yeah. Well, we have a problem still with you. So, uh, I'm going to go on to the next person. I'll come back to you. Okay. So please sit tight. Uh, is it Samaria Washington? Yes. Hi. Is, is that, did I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> it's Samaria. Okay. All right. Go right ahead with your testimony. Good morning. You know, it's such a hard act to follow my colleague, Sue Hargraves. Um, I certainly echo her sentiments. Um, good morning, Chairman Gray and council members. My name is Dr. Samaria Washington. I am the chair of the District of Columbia Healthcare Association and Regional Director of Operations for Bridgepoint Healthcare. I am also currently serving as the interim administrator at Bridgepoint Subacute and Rehabilitation Harborside Campus. Today, I am speaking as a healthcare professional. I want to recognize the Department of Healthcare Finance for the incredible job they have done. A particular note of thanks to Deputy Mayor Turnage, Melissa Bird, Angelique Martin, and their staff for their ongoing efforts and impeccable successes. We appreciate the 20% add-on and the smooth rebasing that has occurred recently. However, the increases from the rebasing that recognize some increased expenses does not go far enough to cover our increased costs. We are experiencing unprecedented, unprecedented costs associated with caring for our residents to include hiring and retaining adequate staffing to care for some of the most vulnerable residents of the District of Columbia. While the COVID-19 pandemic appears to be somewhat under control, we must still deal with the aftermath of what the pandemic has done to our workforce and the health of seniors. The nursing facilities in the District of Columbia will suffer severe financial stress if the 20% add-ons are rescinded at this time. We humbly ask that you consider including the district's nursing facilities in the plans for the use of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act ARPA funding. The $88 million in ARPA funds plus the one-time access to the additional $61.6 million for a total of $149.6 million is a realistic option to help provide additional funding to nursing facilities. We are thankful for the efforts and the leadership of the district for their work to try to help our industry prior to and throughout the pandemic. We are eager to continue to the good work that we do in partnership with the district. Thank you so much for your leadership and the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Um, just talking to my staff, we want to come and see. Uh, you, we know you're relatively new where you are at, at Bridgepoint, and we want to come and see you know what you're doing so uh we'll make we'll make arrangements uh to to uh, to accomplish that okay absolutely anytime we'd love to have you okay thank you so much i appreciate it take care uh, excuse me sir um sharp is called in using her phone so i'm gonna mute her whenever you're ready let's go okay veronica how are you by the way, I'm a GW grad. <laughs> okay. Good at good af good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Shaw. Shaw. Oh, Chance, say again. Where, where you graduated from? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Are we ready? Yes. Okay. My name is Veronica Sharp. I am the president of the District of Columbia Healthcare Association, representing all the licensed nursing facilities and assisted living communities in the district. Thank you, Chairman Gray and members of the council for allowing me to testify. As you have heard, DC Medicaid $8 million in federal American Rescue of Act Plan funds that must be spent by 2024. These funds can be used one time to, do, to access an additional 61.6 .6 million federal funds for a total of 149.6. As you've heard, long-term care providers across all provider types are facing an unprecedented workforce crisis. Nationally, nursing homes and residential care facilities employed lost over 234,000 employees during the pandemic. And in some facilities in DC, the employee loss is close to 20%. Before the supply of PPE was available and before there was a vaccine, the intimate work of a CNA put them and their families at risk. It's still really a difficult job, even with the protection. The workers that perform these jobs will have the vulnerable population deserve and should be paid a true minimum wage of. Surely the work they perform is as important as being a best seller for an Amazon driver. I understand the methodology for one time funding and their children and possibly them to become their sisters. The district has been a leader in accessible health care for all of its kids. I urge the district to be a leader in preserving our access to health care for seniors and the disabled by supporting the workforce that cares for them. Limited workforce increases access. The other problem the DCHDA members have with the use of the ARPA funding is that besides not using it to support the direct care of workforce in a meaningful way, the district spending plan creates an unlevel playing field for nursing homes and assisted living providers. The plan will subsidize an increase for home health and EPD waiver providers, direct service employees. It excludes the NAACP and the work that both set it. Nursing home and nursing home are not included in the funding, despite the similarities to which means actually to enjoy work here, congested with provider types and they take more. Attached to my testimony are several years that the conflict can include the nursing home and the facility in the spending plan. I understand the also funding was meant to strengthen home and community based service, but to put it bluntly, most of the residents in our district facility do not have a home to go to. The community really needs to take care of their homes. In 2021, DHCF completed the rebasing of rates for nursing home providers. The process was efficient and transparent. Yes, Angelique Martin, Andrea Clark, and their teams are always extremely professional, and DCHCA members have the greatest respect for them and for Deputy Mayor Turner. In our rebate rate, the department gave some consideration to the increase for staffing and supplies, but with today's innovation, it turns out that staff will be able to be sufficient for the next year. It's 20% and 15% of the nursing home and assisting living providers has been critical in keeping providers able to continue their quality care throughout the pandemic. But before they are removed, the should evaluate our correct In that evaluation, the ability for providers to pay their CMA, the true living wage of $2 per hour, and to be able to establish career ladders for CMA to take advantage of Care, including becoming a certification Medicaid. The long term industry is in a staffing crisis and resolve to remedy the situation must start now, not in 2024. We ask the committee to refer the funds toward that goal. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Veronica. We did have some interference uh, with, the, with the, uh, transmission of your testimony, but I think we got it all uh, settled. We, we, we appreciate it and we appreciate you. We appreciate the work that you do. Uh, you are a great representative of those that you represent. And uh, thank you so much for your testimony today.
Is Rob Downing here? Yes, I am. Uh, sure okay, Rob, are you ready to testify? I am. Okay, go right ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, Chairman Gray and, and uh, committee members, appreciate the opportunity uh, this morning or this afternoon now. Uh, my name is Rob Downing. I'm a member of the ownership entity of uh, Livingston Place at Southern Avenue, an affordable assisted living community in Ward 8 uh, that opened last June. Uh, currently in a, a lease up process, we're, we're about half, uh, half full. Livingston Place is a 100% affordable community that uh, it caters to uh, frail low income seniors who are uh, in need of uh, assisted living services and eligible for the Medicaid, uh, the uh, EPD waiver uh, program for assisted living. Uh, one advantage of uh, being in the last panel of public witnesses is uh, um, a lot of the points I would uh, like to make have already been made. And I was uh, initially gonna list uh, some of the panels before me, um, but there are too many uh, who have made the same points that I'd like to make. I will, however, echo some of the uh, the, the uh, issues they and concerns they brought up. Um, 15 to 20, 15 to 20 percent increases in in operating costs. Um, a, a severe labor shortage for frontline um, uh, direct support professionals. The need to include CNAs in home community uh, based settings. Um, as part of uh, DHCF's uh, calculations. The importance of a $22 per hour sort of baseline when uh, formulating budget and rate setting methodologies, reimbursement rate setting methodologies for, uh, in my case, uh, assisted living. Uh, and the availability of ARPA funds as a, a resource for the district to, uh, to address some of these, some of these needs. There were three points I wanted to make uh, this, uh, today. One was the rate cliff represented by the end uh, of the uh, enhanced reimbursement rates. The second was the uh, the hourly rates uh, that we're experiencing versus the assumptions that are being made within the budget process. And lastly, I just wanted to make a point, uh, sort of a retroact uh, retrospective point about the assisted living rate um, it, it, for the EPD waiver within the EPD waiver, and um, how we might look at it in a post-pandemic way. The uh, the loss of the uh, enhanced rates represents a, a devastating economic impact uh, on ownership, and you know, you may well force some very difficult decisions with regard to how to operate economically going forward. Um, our our uh, labor costs represent about 60% of our total operating expenses and our average uh, hourly rate today today is $20 an hour for caregivers culinary staff um, cnas housekeeping and what have you uh, hourly rates represent the bulk of our our labor costs um, and in terms of the retroactive uh, retrospective look uh, dc epd uh, assisted living is one of the more unique programs in my experience in the country in that it has a built in escalator for annual reimbursement uh, increases. If you go back and look uh, from 2017, when the new rate was established through 2020, the pre, pre pandemic, the average uh, annual increase in the daily reimbursement rate, rate was about uh, just a little bit under 3%, which if carried forward to fiscal 2023 would represent a, a daily reimbursement rate in excess of $180 a day which would go a long way to mitigating the, the, the risk of the rate cliff. Um, not to mention what we're all experiencing today in terms of- Can I ask you to summarize your testimony at this point? Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, I would just I would just like to emphasize the, the points that have been made by uh, fellow panelists and um, will include the uh, rest of my testimony and written uh, submission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you much. Thank you very much for the work that you do, and uh, those in your service uh, who uh, I know uh, are beneficiaries of the commitment that you and your colleagues are making uh, on their behalf. So thank you so much for the work that you do, and we'll look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Okay. 
Uh, Kate Coventry, Kate, are you with us? I'm here. Okay, Kate, I see you. You listed on the on the witness list twice. Uh, so can you, if you if you were going to do two pieces of testimony. Can you truncate that into one set of testimony at this point? I can, but just flagging one is on healthcare finance and one is on DMHHS. Okay, if you if you can if you can uh, consolidate them into sure. one, well, we'd appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, right Chairman. Ahead. Chairman Gray, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kate Coventry. I'm a senior policy analyst at DCFPI which is a nonprofit organization that shapes racially just tax budget and policy decisions by centering black and brown communities in our research and analysis, community partnership and advocacy efforts to advance an anti-racist equitable future. So I won't linger on the Alliance since I'm short on time, but I just wanna thank you, uh, Council Member Gray for your continued support on that and um, encourage the rest of the council to support the change to that policy. Um, Secondly, I'd like to talk about residents with traumatic brain injuries. The um, fiscal year 22 budget included 698,000 to allow some behavioral health outpatient providers to offer enhanced services for traumatic brain injuries as well as autism spectrum disorders. This was a great investment, but the healthcare finance needs to create a path forward for DBH certified provider organizations to be among those allowed to offer these services. We also encourage DHCF to consult with stakeholders about proposed rules and move forward expeditiously with issuing formal, formal rules to allow these services to become available. TBIs are injuries resulting from a blow or jolt to the head or penetrating injury that disrupts the function of the brain. TBI is associated with an increased risk for substance misuse, major depression, anxiety, and unemployment. The TBIs can negatively affect self-regulation and executive functioning, meaning people have difficulty managing behavior associated with stress and anxiety, maybe having difficulty waiting or taking turns. Executive functioning refers to higher order brain function associated with setting goals, organizing, remembering, following directions. Some have a difficulty with problem solving, others have problems with judgment and decision making. People who are homeless are at a high risk of acquiring a TBI. 50 to 80% of them have sustained at least one brain injury prior to homelessness, according to national statistics. DC's rate is elevated as well. In 2019, in 2010, 199 DC homeless individuals were surveyed and nearly two thirds had had a TBI. It may be a risk factor for becoming homeless and homeless individuals are more likely to acquire a TBI because they're more likely to be victimized by assault, experience trauma and have substance abuse disorders that can cause falls. A 2016 survey of 159 adult DC behavioral health clients found that approximately 50% had a history of TBI. Additionally, active duty military personnel are very high risk as well as domestic violence survivors. And TBI is a common uh, disorder among people who are diagnosed with major mental illness. So we're asking healthcare finance to make sure these residents are getting the help that they need. Um, and now on to encampments. As a member of the Way Home Campaign, we believe it's a victory for DC anytime a member, a neighbor moves from homelessness into housing. So we are thrilled that neighbors are living in encampments will move into housing as part of the coordinated assistance and resources for encampments pilot. But we have grave elements about the we have grave concerns about the elements of the pilot resulting in the clearing of encampments and the creation of no camping zones. We just would like to flag the following best practices and research that find that that we should not be clearing encampments and creating no camping zone. So the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness argues the forced dispersal of people from encampment settings is not an appropriate solution or strategy, accomplishes nothing towards the goal of linking people to permanent housing opportunities, and can make it more difficult to provide such lasting solutions to people who have been sleeping and living in the environment. The USICH also maintains that it undermines the goal of ending homelessness because it disrupts relationships with outreach workers and creates distrust, making an individual less likely to accept an offer of housing. Uh, HUD finds that continuous sweeps cause encampment residents to focus on meeting short-term needs, disrupting the stability needed to engage in long-term planning to move into housing. HUD uh, outreach workers reported to HUD that residents lose ID, legal documents, and medications. Health providers know that when people lose medication, insurance companies often won't replace it. 
um, and uh, people lose critical mobility equipment like walkers and make it and, and other um, life saving, <laughs> life giving tools. So, uh, since this is a budget hearing, I'm going to move on to the budget part of this issue, which is that the deputy mayor of health and human services has reported that it's not possible to provide a budget for encampment clearings. The reasons for this are not clear as in 2016 DMHHS was able to provide a detailed budget. Understanding the cost is critical to evaluating the efficacy of the pilot, especially as costs are generally high. One national study found a huge range in cost of clearing encampments from 1,080 to 6,208 per person who was unsheltered, and that didn't include the cost of housing those individuals. In just one quarter in FY 2016, DMHHS spent 172,000 for a much smaller encampment clearing effort than is happening in the CARE pilot. Absent transparency, council input, and a specific budget for this program, DCFPI and other advocates are concerned that funding the pilot could be expensive and in turn cause budget shortfalls and or lead to cuts in other homeless services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Very much, Katie. Thank you so much for your uh, your work and uh, your support. You talked about uh, brain injury and uh, in your initial part of your testimony. We appreciate that. We know how important that is, and uh, you talked again, of course, about the uh, encampment issue, which we know is uh, a continuing one of concern uh, for people uh, in the District of Columbia. We worked very, <clears throat> we worked very closely with. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, with Deputy um, Mayor Turnage, and um, we we know that we'll, we 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 will we will be continuing to work with him around the issues of importance to you and your colleagues. Okay, so thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, I think uh, Jesse Rabinowitz, are you there, sir? I am. Good afternoon. How are you? And uh, we're we're delighted to hear your testimony. So go right ahead. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jess Rabinowitz, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Miriam's Kitchen and the Way Home Campaign. I want to start by thanking Mayor Bowser for fully funding the permanent supportive housing asks recommended by our 110 partner organizations and 7,000 supporters. These investments, when combined with the historic funding from FY22, will change the face of single adult homelessness in DC. However, this progress will be placed at risk if DC reverts to a policy of encampment evictions and no camping zones. To keep our foot on the gas, we must focus now on what works. Housing first, without strings or sticks, without artificial timelines or displacement. My testimony today, despite some claims to the contrary, is informed by my deep knowledge of homeless encampments in DC. This includes a year doing street outreach to encampments, witnessing more encampment evictions than I can count. I have sat with people as their tents and other items were destroyed by city officials. I've conducted multiple listening sessions and feedback sessions with encampment residents and previous deputy mayors, all the while while staying up to date on national best and worst practices for dealing with encampments. I won't dwell for long on the significant disagreements that exist. I think we can all agree that we want everyone living outside to move into their own housing as quickly as possible. Miriam's Kitchen, along with dozens of local and national organizations, believe that we should focus on housing and stop displacing encampment residents through full evictions, engagements, and no camping zones. Police officers and bulldoze, bulldozers have no place in DC's encampment response and must not be used as tools to force our unhoused neighbors out of their chosen community. Since this is a budget hearing, I will focus the remainder of my time on the budget impl impl implications of DC's current encampment approach. Budgets are moral documents that necessitate honesty and transparency. Yet, despite repeated calls for accountability from community members and council members, we still do not know how much money DC spends to clear encampments. Despite claims to the contrary, we do know that a detailed cost breakdown of DMHHS as encampment cost is possible, as illustrated by a 2015 through 2016 breakdown, which I've included in my written testimony. This breakdown indicates that DC spent over $130,000 to close a single encampment, including over $7,000 for police presence. A more current breakdown of spending on encampment engagements would enable a council to evaluate whether the money allocated towards bulldozers, police, and no tent zones is the best use of taxpayer dollars. As such, DMHHS must release a full spending breakdown of all encampment clearings, evictions, and associated costs from FY16 to present. Mayor Bowser's proposed FY23 budget contains $2 million in funding for street outreach. We are happy to see that increased investment and look forward to receiving more details. It is our hope that this funding will be used to make permanent the intensive street outreach that was deployed as part of the CARE pilot program. Still, we have significant questions about the pilot. Is DMHHS expanding the CARE pilot in 2023? If so, will the $2 million proposed for outreach in the mayor's budget be allocated for encampment outreach via DHS or instead be used for other encampment-related programs? 
How does DC's posture of encampment evictions align with Homeward DC's strategic plan for ending homelessness? And if the CARE pilot program continues in FY23, will, will funding be maintained for successful parts of the pilot program, such as dedicated street outreach? And if the CARE pilot continues, will funding also be maintained for harmful parts of the program, such as forced evictions? Just as uh, my colleague Kate Coventry mentioned, these, uh, DMHHS has been able to provide an I'm going to just summarize this now for you, has been able to provide cost breakdowns in the past. This will help us enable to determine how much was spent to station 30 MPD officers at the New Jersey Army encampment, what is the cost of DDOT and DPW staffing, and who pays for the concrete barricades. Uh, my written testimony described the cost of evicting encampments extends beyond money. In brief, encampment evictions take up provider time and client time that could be better spent connecting people to housing and services. The evictions also have a high emotional and physical cost for parties involved. While those costs will not show up in a budget book, they are real and must be addressed. And I will just add by saying, in a similar note, we're concerned that DHS has indicated they that they will be reducing and eliminating the provision of porta potties and hand sanitation stations to encampments. We believe that that is one thing that we have done during the COVID-19 pandemic that must be extended until all of our neighbors have the housing that they need to thrive. Thank you for the opportunity and letting me go over for a little bit. Sure. Thank you, Jesse, for your uh, your testimony and for your work. I mean, Miriam's Kitchen, Miriam Kitchen, Miriam's Kitchen is an organization that I've uh, worked closely with for a very long time. I know the work that's being done. I know the heart is in the right place and the uh, efforts uh, that are being made are hugely important. So I just want to thank you for your work. Uh, okay. So thank you. Some, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I think that includes, I think that includes our uh, public witness list. Uh, are there any other public witnesses who uh, wanted to testify who haven't had a chance to do so? Uh, no, sir, it looks like that's it. Okay. I think council member Nadeau is with us also. Council member Nadeau, are you with us? I am, I am uh, grateful for all these public witnesses and looking forward to hearing from our deputy mayor. Absolutely, okay, well, he'll be up shortly. So um, stay tuned. And uh, we'll be delighted when you come on to hear if you want to make a, <clears throat> an opening statement. We'll be delighted to have that, of course, and the uh, work of the Alliance. Uh, I don't have any reservations in mentioning uh, the work of the Alliance, uh, the work that's, that's happened uh, in this budget, which is phenomenal to, to close that gap. So do you want to make an opening statement at this point, uh, Councilman Minato? No, Chairman, I'm uh, I'm really grateful for all that testimony about the alliance, but I think we'll keep it simple today, and we'll just uh, I'll just do questions when it's time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Nadeau. Uh, are there any other public witnesses who haven't had a chance to testify who would like to do so uh, at this stage? Okay. If not, uh, I'm going to take a brief break here, and then we'll have Deputy Mayor Turnage uh, to come up and present uh, his testimony. Are you with us, Deputy Mayor Turnage? Uh, looks like he hasn't logged on yet, sir. A few moments. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll be back shortly with him, okay? You there, Malcolm? Yep, whenever you're ready. What'd you say? I'm saying once he logs on, uh, we can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, a few minutes.
Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Melissa. 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 Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. So we have everybody except for our second mayor who will be logging on shortly. Uh, Malcolm, could you make Melanie Williamson uh, the presenter because she's going to be running Wayne's slide deck, right? All right, passing it to her now.
person experience. Melanie, uh, you're unmuted. Okay. All right, but that's a good sign. Afternoon, Deputy Mayor. Hey, Wayne, how are you? I'm fine, Council Member. How are you doing? How are you doing, Michelle? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We're all doing pretty good. So Glad to hear. I'm going to go walk it off. <laughs> if, if you can walk it off, if you can walk a knee off, fantastic. That is uh, not typically possible. Okay, and you've been joined by Council Member Henderson uh, and Council Member Nadeau. Mm -hmm. Well, she's got her camera off, and I guess she'll turn it back on, but she's ready. All right. She's waiting for you to finish. I'm waiting for them. I don't want to keep them waiting. Okay. This will do. This will do. Where's your wheel? Oh, there it is. Thanks. Sorry. I'm just going to go sit down now. You ready, Deputy Mayor? I am ready, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, we, got, uh, we got some of our members that uh, I'm going to ask them to make their opening statement uh, and see if they have one, any. Uh, Councilman Nadeau, how are you? Hi there. No opening statement for me today. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was that was great news about the uh, alliance, wasn't it? It's wonderful news. I'm excited that we're all in partnership again on this. It's wonderful. Absolutely. And uh, we worked hard together uh, to make this happen. We worked with the deputy mayor uh, to make this happen. And uh, Wayne, thank you for the work that you've done on this. Okay. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we tried. We tried to give you some uh, credit uh, as you have earned uh, when when the witnesses came forward, like Damon. Uh, you know Damon. Yeah, right? I know he, Damon Wells. He's a, he's, yeah. a, he's a brilliant analyst. Yes, he is. And uh, he's done a good job. And um, they've been wonderful advocates uh, as we move forward uh, with this. So, in any event, uh, I want to give. Uh, I I'll just say, Mr. Chairman, this is something we've supported for years, but uh, we couldn't get it done while Eric Goulet was still working for you. So now that he's left, we were able to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make sure that he knows that, okay? <laughs> and, and remember, he may come back to haunt you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we, we, Councilmember Nadeau has indicated she doesn't have an opening statement she wants to make. Councilmember Henderson, would you like to make an opening statement? Oh, I'm going to let that ride. And <laughs> yep. Well, um, good I'm morning, that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, good, good morning. Uh, I guess it's afternoon now, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Council Member Nadeau, Council Member Henderson. Um, I am Wayne Turnage, the Deputy Mayor for, uh, uh, for Health and Human Services and the Director of the Department of Health Care Finance. Um, I, it is indeed a uh, pleasure, as always, to report on the mayor's uh, fiscal year 23 budget <laughs> calls it her, her fair shot budget and financial plan and it i'm going to cover the uh the a uh, very high level overview of uh her budget for uh, uh dmhhs and dhcf i am uh joined uh virtually by and in person by staff from both agencies and they have played key roles in developing the agencies uh budget proposals that are before you. Um, I always like to thank uh, my expert team uh, for their work on the budget and their work in general. Uh, my uh, DMHS HHS team is led by Kiana Craven. Craven? I can't pronounce your name, uh, uh, Kiana. Um, and, she we, we got is, <laughs> she got, and she is my uh, chief of staff in the deputy mayor's office, and she is supported by a wonderful team of uh, Brian Harrison, my policy director, 
and Natalie uh, Demajeron Reve. Now I probably butchered that, but uh, oh, that, that, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they they are they are outstanding policy analysts, and I have uh, the benefit of uh, a significant experience of a, a senior uh, policy advisor who has agreed to do double duty for me. She's working in. Um, in, in aging, and all, but also um, uh, she helps me out as my senior advisor uh, on uh, uh, DMHHS, DMHHS issues, and that's Jessica Smith. Uh, my uh, DHCF team is one that I've been with for years, and they are just simply outstanding. Uh, my director, uh, deputy director for uh, Medicaid, senior deputy director, um, Melissa Bird, and our deputy director of finance, uh, Angelique uh, Martin, uh, both are uh, supported by a cadre of uh, senior managers who bring years of Medicaid experience to this process. I especially want to acknowledge the comprehensive uh, data analytical work uh, underpinning this incredible budget uh, that was spearheaded by our senior staff member and director of data analytics, uh, April Grady. She's a real star and has a great team. And, and as always, the work of April and her exceptional team of analysts uh, was complemented by uh, Darren Schaefer, our agency fiscal officer, along with members of his uh, very talented staff. Though we frequently fight over the details of the of our proposals, the AFO and his team's sharp understanding of Medicaid and their exceptional quantitative rigor uh, has have been instrumental in producing this budget. I want to turn your attention to slide two. But Wayne, before you turn to your slides, uh, let me just ask you a question uh, as you go along. I'm sure you you listened to the testimony, the public testimony. Yes, I did. Okay. Did you have a chance to um, record uh, somewhere uh, the the questions that were raised uh, by the public as they went through? Yeah, we have. Uh, uh, I have a several team members who were sitting in listening, and they um, gave me some indication. I had it on as well, but um, uh, I, I have a general sense of some of the questions that were raised, and certainly we will try to address those as we go through the presentation. Okay. Fantastic. Go right ahead, Wayne. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. I have, um, Mr. Chairman, I've submitted uh, detailed testimony for the record, uh, but I'll speak from the uh, power pres PowerPoint presentation that you have before you today. Uh, as the mayor noted in her um, March 16th presentation to the council, her budget proposal is indeed a recovery budget, and I think it offers a sweeping plan to fund initiatives that will allow the district to recover from a two-year pandemic uh, that frankly drained um, uh, resources from jurisdictions all over the country. And these resources, as you well know, are very necessary for sustained growth and prosperity uh, in our in our government. Uh, now, uh, I think the uh, you can see the city come slowly back, back to life. Uh, it is uh, clearly perched on a precipice of a strong recovery. And the, mayor bu the mayor's budget reflects uh, the surge in local economy as well as the need to address the health and human services challenges that remain as we come out of uh, 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 a vicious pandemic. Uh, slide two of the presentation sort of gives you an overview, and you all have seen this before uh, based on our council meeting, but I wanted to just to reiterate, um, you know, what these numbers mean and uh, uh, for, for the city and for, for health and human services in particular. We were down in the early stages of the uh, 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 pandemic by almost a billion dollars in terms of revenue. Uh, we had double digit unemployment rates. Uh, we had uh, uh, double digit residential uh, 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 vacancies um, and we still struggle with some of the commercial vacancies. Uh, but because of the uh, mayor's stewardship around the uh, pandemic, the push uh, to first establish uh, several layers of mitigation that were designed to frankly permit or, or, or prevent uh, too much person-to-person -person contact, uh, which necessitated the, uh, 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 you know, slamming the brakes on the economy and essentially throwing commerce into the window, um, all to to slow down the rate at which this this disease was uh, uh, spreading. And if you look at the bottom of the uh, the last row in that uh, graphic on page uh, two, it shows you that as we went from no restrictions to many, and then relaxed them to some, and now we have few. You see the positive changes that are occurring that will help that helps fund uh, this this mayor's budget. Uh, we still have a lot of work to go in terms of restaurants spending. That is a leading indicator of how well the city is doing. Uh, 
uh, and while they are still losing, uh, they have not reached the level of uh, spending that they had pre-COVID. Uh, there has been a substantial growth, about 145 uh, percent. Still, they're down uh, roughly 20 percent. Um, you talking about the restaurant spending? Uh, yes. Rest if you look okay. at uh, uh, the positive on the consumer side, the consumer spending has gone from negative 41 percent in the early days of COVID to now plus 7.3 uh, percent, which is a is a is a, a major turnaround. Restaurant yeah, spending, sure. restaurant spending was as low as a uh, uh, almost negative 50 percent in the early days of COVID. Now it's uh, down to negative 20 percent. So they had a substantial growth, but they're still in the red. And we hope that as we get through the spring and early summer, that those numbers will uh, uh, approve for the better. Um, because well, of the, while we talk about it, I, I know that you and, and your colleagues are in touch with um, folks around the projections, the prognosis, uh, if you will, for let's say restaurant spending, which is a hugely important part of um, you know our engagement with people in the District of Columbia. So. What is the prognosis from your perspective around restaurant spending? Is it is it likely to go up? Uh, is that what? Yeah, what, I, what are, yeah. What I don't have the, I don't have the official projections in front of me, but I, as I recall, looking at the data, uh, they have predicted sort of like a K shaped recovery, uh, and I would assume the uh, uh, the restaurant spending is, is on that uh, um, plane, and I mean, so I, I am guessing, and I will certainly check the numbers. That uh, before we get close to the winter, we would hope to see the, 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 that uh, negative spin turn positive. Uh, but I don't have the precise projections in front of me, but I will get them for you. Okay, I, I would appreciate if you would share with us uh, when you get those numbers, uh, Wayne. That that's the prognosis, of course, for the for the future, and we'd like to have a copy of that ourselves. Sure, we'll do. Um, if you turn to slide three, uh, when you look at uh, the, the the revenue that uh, uh, the mayor had available for the budget based on the uh, projections for future revenue in twenty uh, in fiscal year twenty three, um, and the federal dollars that that come to the city uh, through any number of means, uh, the, this gave the mayor nineteen point five billion dollars um, to present a fair shot budget. And that will help us emerge from this pandemic, I believe, uh, much stronger and more ready to thrive than ever before. If you look at slide four, um, the operating budget, $12 billion. Uh, as you know, that's property, property sales and income tax, plus uh, special purpose revenue and, and dedicated taxes. And then when you take those special purpose revenues and dedicated taxes out uh, and look at just what's left in the local funds budget, that's still $10.7 billion. Local funds budget increased by 14%. Uh, but when you take out the one term uh, investments, uh, you're looking at a growth rate of about uh, 6% uh, when those investments are excluded. And as you, as the mayor presented on the 16th, uh, there are significant investments in schools, in vet, uh, affordable housing, uh, health and human services, and on the capital side, both in facilities maintenance and a debt service that we have to uh, uh, basically accommodate to support our uh, numerous capital investments. Go to slide five. You know this speaks uh, to the commitment that the mayor has made to uh, health and human services. It is the largest portion of her fiscal year 23 budget at 5.72 billion dollars. Um, I think it's roughly about 30 percent of the 19.55 billion dollars that are being spent on the operating side. It is a uh, a significant significant planned outlay. To support health and human services, I want to um, now shift gears and, and and talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the uh, the funding and functions in the office of the deputy mayor for health and human services. If you turn to slide seven, uh, we have a uh, a, a, a an office uh, that is uh, lean and mean, uh, and we cover a number of functions. Um, we we certainly coordinate with the uh, interagency teams that exist. Uh, across government on short term family housing programs. We have the uh, opioid crisis work that my team works with several agencies on. We have uh, a commission on health care systems transformation that we spent a lot of time with uh, in the early part or late part of 2021, I believe. Um, and of course, there's the coordinating council on school behavior health. I've highlighted in red the things that we are most heavily invested in at the time 
uh, and they are really a function of, of, of what we face, and that is the uh, challenges created by uh, um, the, the uh, homelessness, uh, it's in a special, uh, with a special attention to the, uh, the tented encampments that dot the landscape of the city. We are, uh, at the mayor's direction, we are implementing a uh, care pallet that uh, I'll talk about a little bit later, but it is, uh, uh, has proven to uh, be very successful. Uh, and and uh, but if, if we continue to have success when we uh, finish the pilot, hopefully later this spring and brief and, and present a, uh, a set of recommendations to the mayor. My full expectation is that if there, unless there is some uh, dramatic shift in what we're seeing, I don't anticipate that. I, I think this is a program that the mayor will uh, uh, look favorably, favorably upon and, and, and likely direct us to take it citywide. Uh, we do also have several internal, internally directed programs, the Inter Interagency Council on Homelessness. And again, we have the encampment protocols engagement that extends beyond uh, the, the care pallet. And we have Age Friendly DC, which uh, is, a, is a robust list of services that we oversee in, along with aging to, to make sure that we are putting a, a structure in place that allow people to age friendly uh, uh, and enjoy uh, the city uh, as they age. And of course, my, my team works starting roughly in uh, um, probably the summer, late summer, all the way through um, almost the end of the uh, uh, spring um, on budget issues uh, and also uh, year round policy legislative uh, work that uh, we provide some guidance um, in working with agencies as they uh, try to put the mayor's agendas in place. If you if you turn to uh, slide eight, um, this slide addresses um, sort of what we do with the encampment process um, in terms of a, a broader response and the uh, care pallet. Uh, as you can see, uh, the the encampment team, which is led by Jamal uh, Weldon and his very capable uh, team of uh, 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 staff, they conduct. Uh, welfare checks and provide services to over 280 encampment sites across the district. Um, the the uh, care pallet is a subcomponent of their work, um, and it is, uh, as you know, it is a housing first model for persons who are who are who are living in encampments. And our goal is pretty simple, and that is to establish permanent housing as a platform from which all the other needs of those experiencing homelessness can be addressed. Uh, this requires tremendous um, cross-agency coordination, as does the the uh, uh, general uh, uh, city administrator's protocol does. And working with uh, DBH, uh, DPW, DHS, we also have outstanding outreach uh, um, uh, uh, providers in Pathways to Housing and Miriam's Kitchen. Um, and we also have a, a, a working relationship with the National Park Service. Um, we have been in constant communication with them. Uh, uh, Jessica Smith has uh, been a uh, been the person that works most closely with the National Park Service, along along with Jamal, and um, they are they have indicated, and I, as I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, their plans to take some action with respect to some of the encampments that are on federal land, and we have to be prepared to uh, to uh, uh, to mitigate. Uh, you know some of the impact of, of what NPS has to do, and they are working very closely with us, and, and we are certainly uh, are, are um, you know pleased that we have uh, a, a a working arrangement with them to allow us to work in coordination. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about how much we spend. Can you uh, can you speak to what success you have achieved in getting people into from encampments into permanent housing? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's going to be on the next slide. But before I get there, uh, okay. I, want, I want to highlight, you know, there are, you get a lot of, um, I don't really understand it, to be honest, questions about the budget, uh, as if we are spending, you know, massive amounts of dollars and taking away from the larger housing effort. The encampment is a part of the larger housing effort. I mean, pe when people need housing, it doesn't matter if they're in the shelter or they're on the street, they need housing. So, the money right. we spend is, you know, is fungible. It's part of the same same bucket of money that, uh, for the most part, DHS receives 
uh, to run their housing program. Fiscal 22, we're looking at a $3.9 million spend uh, for uh, uh, the, the encampment program. And um, when you add the additional dollars that DHS spends in servicing uh, our program through outreach, uh, subsidies, staffing costs, client costs, you know, the, uh, um, the we, we have a budgeted amount of $4.2 million. There's this continuous um, churn about how much we're spending on, um, you know, Jersey barriers and how much we spend at DPW and how much we're spending at MPD. Um, you know, we don't, you know, we don't spend a dime on, on, on Jersey barriers. If there were no encampment program tomorrow, the city's expenditures on Jersey barriers would not change. Uh, we, we're not, we are not adding to the cost of, of Jersey barriers in the city. Uh, we do, um, when DPW provides services, you know, we do have contracts uh, that, that, that they, uh, uh, with, with vendors to help us clean up sites, uh, but they are not just encampment specific. I mean, they're not just uh, care palace specific. They're across the entire city. Um, so, so, so where, so where are the Jersey barrier issue? Cause it, it, it has arisen in testimony today and previously also. Where is that budget, uh, Wayne? I would, you know, I don't know much about Jersey barrier. I assume it's at, uh, it's at DDOT. Yeah. Um, okay. We don't, I don't, I've never seen a budget with Jersey barriers in it because I work in HHS. Uh, and if we, if we take some action, uh, as we did on the NOMA and, and the decision is made to put Jersey barriers down, we, we call DDOT and they put them down, but there's no, but there's no budget in DHSS or, 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 uh, I mean, D, uh, there's no budget in the deputy mayor's office or DHS to fund Jersey barriers. That's a uh, frank, frank, that's nonsense. Um, the, there, there's also, uh, there, uh, there's a similar um, misunderstanding about MPD. You know, we don't uh, require additional officers to uh, help with the encampment that wouldn't otherwise be hired by MPD. There is no uh, marginal increase in cost for uh, MPD officers based on their uh, service to encampments. It's just part of their regular work when they are called upon. So, I, you know, those, those, uh, when those issues are raised, they're really red herrings. Um, uh, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to question the motives of people who are raising them, but they don't reflect uh, a reality about the uh, uh, budget for the encampment uh, program and certainly not for uh, care. Um, as I mentioned, we, we are coordinating with uh, the National Park Service. I received a letter from them, I think it was last week. They are, uh, they are not announced that they're going to be closing a couple of sites. So we are working with DHS and my encampment team um, to make sure that we can get as many housing resources targeted on those folks who will be who will be affected by those closures as quickly as we can. I have a meeting scheduled this week with uh, 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 that uh, Kiana has organized with all of the agencies involved, and we're going to lay out what we need from a resource standpoint. Uh, and how we're going to approach strategically trying to help those residents who are on property owned by the National Park Service uh, that will be reclaiming those properties and rehabilitating them for their intended use. So there's more to come on that. And uh, we will, I can assure you that we will work as hard as we can uh, to help as many of the uh, uh, persons who are currently living on those sites as we can help. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, what, what, what will happen? Uh, there are people who are have been in encampments, who've been on park service property, as you've mentioned. Um, are they going to be going into permanent uh, uh, housing? That uh, is the, the, the that is the goal, but there is a challenge. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, one of the things that that has that has made the care pallet work is that while uh, you know a lot of times residents who have been living on the street for years uh, sometimes don't have the paperwork requirements. That are necessary to get through the process to to get a voucher to get an apartment. Uh, so what we have done in care is to say, look, we don't really. Uh, it's not that we don't care about your your, your lack of paperwork. We don't, we're not going to let that be an impediment to you getting housing. So we want to get you off the street, and so we're going to put you in bridge housing, which is a hotel, uh, until we can get your paperwork squared away and then get you into a permanent housing situation. Um, we have to meet as a group to figure out because we fully expect to have those same challenges when uh, MPS goes to these other sites, or one in New York Avenue and the other one is at Columbus Circle. Uh, if you've been to Columbus Circle or New York Avenue, uh, those are clearly problem sites. Uh, 
Uh, I don't think anybody who has any compassion can walk by the New York Avenue sites and feel comfortable with what they see, nor can they right. feel comfortable with what they see at Columbus Circle. And so uh, the mayor wants us to be a part of the uh, solution. And so we're going to try to uh, uh, bring as many resources to bear on those two sites to help folks uh, who face uh, displacement at a closure. And so they don't have to end up moving from one encampment, outdoor encampment to another. But I will make no, uh, um, I will make no mistake. This, this will be a challenge. Uh, it will be, uh, um, again, because some of the residents may not have near the paperwork that's necessary to move immediately into uh, uh, housing. Some of them may not have even completed and completed the assessment that we use to determine, uh, um, you know, whether or not someone is chronically homeless, which is a key cr key criteria uh, to be eligible for uh, a voucher. So we have a lot of work to do, but we we are we we believe in the um, um, program, and my team is certainly compassionate about the folks who are, are forced to live on the street, and uh, you know we like many were devastated by. Uh, the the, uh, the vicious assaults that took the lives of two or five uh, persons across two states that were sh that that, uh, yeah. that were sh shot, uh, uh, you know, by someone who was obviously uh, uh, having some serious serious mental issues. Um, so you know, we we want to work to make um, to make those problems go away, and and so we're we're going to work as hard as we can to see if we can uh, see can we can we can accomplish that. I I turn your attention to the next slide. Which gets to, yeah, get, Wayne, gets to Wayne, who who on your team is working with uh, these folks who are um, you you mentioned somebody who's coordinating all that stuff, but who who are the people on your team that are working with getting these people into permanent housing? We have we have um, two outreach groups. We lost you, Wayne. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank. Are you back with us, Wayne? Looks like we lost him, sir. I'm just waiting for him to log back in. Okay. Does he know that he has a need? He needs to log back in. So because we lose, we lost him. Yeah, it looks like he dropped out the lobby. I'm not sure why, um, but I'm assuming he knows just to try to log back in. So he should be on in yeah. a few moments. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure he'll. I'm sure he'll get back with us. Let's put it that way. Let's let's give him a a moment to uh, to reconnect with us. Okay. Sure. Are you tracking that, Malcolm? Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. Go ahead, Wayne. Testing. So, Council Member, are you there? I am. Go ahead. Can you go ahead, Wayne? We lost you. Hello. Yeah, we can hit. Uh, can we we can hear you now, Wayne? We need to log out and log back in. Yeah, I think we're okay now. Oh, they can hear you. Yeah. So I should continue to go. Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can't. Is it ours or theirs? Says generally the network. Can somebody type in the thing that we can't hear them? I just plugged it for now. I, I can hear you. I can hear them through the ear. She had Jamal said he could hear us. She said, yeah, they said he can hear us. They can hear us, so I should go ahead. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I, I will. Um, Sheila has indicated that we should move forward. Uh, so, council member, you, you asked uh, the question about who specifically works 
on the ground yes. with the uh, residents. Yes. We have, as I stated, we have two outreach teams, uh, Miriam's Kitchen and Pathways to Housing. Uh, they work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in, in trying to uh, help the uh, residents negotiate the housing placement process and also connect them to services as needed. I also have, Jamal also has his team. They are out there every day doing, uh, supplementing the work of the outreach teams and providing uh, the necessary leadership to make sure that the encampment protocols in general are maintained and properly executed and that uh, the care pallet is also properly done. If you look on slide nine, this provides the statistics you asked for with respect to uh, what we have seen to date in terms of our efforts to move people from the streets and into housing. Uh, when you look at the residents who are on our official by name list, there are about 139 such residents. Mm -hmm. At last count by uh, outreach workers and encampment team, there were about 240 or 280 members who were living on the street. So we were we are capturing a, a large segment of uh, persons who are living in uh, uh, encampments in our care pallet. Of the 139 people that we have uh, uh, identified as being on the by name list, we have successfully engaged with 78% of that group or 109. Uh, of those with whom we have successfully engaged, we have placed, uh, uh, we've had a success rate of either an apartment or uh, bridge housing for 83% of those with whom we have successfully engaged. Uh, if you look at the, um, oh, so if you look, and if you look at the um, success rate for the total number of people who are in the pilot, not just those who successfully engage, it's still above 50%, it's at 65%. So, um, we are um, we are very pleased with these outcomes thus far, and hopefully we can finish the last two pilot sites at 21st in E and 25th in Virginia. Uh, hopefully we can finish those before the spring ends and get a, uh, a, a PowerPoint report uh, to the mayor with recommend with, that outlines the final uh, statistics for this site, the lessons that we've learned, and the recommendations for moving forward. And if you ask me now, if, if I had to submit that report today, I would strongly recommend to the city administrator and the mayor that we expand this pilot uh, citywide. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next slide. And the, num the numbers I was, can you go back to that slide, uh, Wayne? Yes, sir. Okay. I see 139. Uh, those, those are people by name that you're working with? Yeah, what happens we, when we when we set up the each of the, um, care pallet sites, uh, the encampment team, Jamal and his folks, and the uh, 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 members of outreach at Miriam's and uh, uh, Pathways to Housing, they went out and in three or four weeks before we actually started the encampment, they basically built a list of everybody who was living at the site. Uh, and so that by name list means there were 139 people that were officially identified as targets for the um, uh, encampment. Now, there were some people who were not on the list who showed up at the site after the canvassing. And to date, uh, 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 we have uh, those who came into normal who were not on the list, we, we incorporated them into the program. Uh, there are now about 14 people at 21st and E and, and 25th in Virginia who, are, who were not there when we did the canvassing, but we are still trying to provide them with the same services that we provide those who are in the care pilot. We're just keeping a separate track of, of the uh, outcome. Is Miriam's Kitchen a, a contractor for the pro the encampment program at this point, Wayne? Yes, uh, Miriam's, Miriam's Kitchen is a, um, a, a very uh, effective contractor for us, uh, but there is a, another part of Miriam's, I think is more of a, a, a lobbyist uh, operation. They don't, we don't contract with them, obviously. We don't need to hire, we, we're not allowed to hire lobbyists. And sometimes they take a very different view one that we sharply disagree with it most times of our efforts and what we're doing and how and whether or not we're being successful. So the uh who are they again? Who are they again? Uh that's the outreach side. Okay. You have you have you have outreach and then you have advocacy. 
Uh, right. and, we freak, and, and to be frank, we frequently bump heads with the advocacy um, uh, on on some matters that I think we just have to agree to disagree on. And then who and who who are they? Uh, are they Miriam's kitchen kitchen? Uh, yeah, yes. Yes, yes, they are. They are. They are. They are part of Miriam's kitchen. Okay, and we heard testimony from someone from Miriam's kitchen uh, earlier today. So yeah, and I, and I think that I think that person represented the advocacy side. That's Jesse. Thank Jesse Rabinovitz. Yes. Okay, he's part of the advocacy group. Yes, I, I my understanding that he is. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Wayne. I'm sorry. So, no, that's, that's, those are great questions. Um, next slide, please. So, um, Mr. Chairman, those are, if there are any issues around the campus before I move on, and I want to give you a chance or give other members a chance to ask if they want to, to do so. But um, I would just close on the encampment side, but I would say I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, it, is a, it is a vexing problem. Uh, it is a problem that you that if you visit every city, particularly every major city in the country, you will see it um, uh, in 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 significant uh, numbers, and we just have to continue to work hard to do what we can, because as the mayor said, no one should be forced to live on the street. Um, right. On the in terms of our investments for our our our, our seniors. Um, the mayor's budget includes uh, some pretty significant investments, 500k for free dental services. That's a huge, um, that, that's a that, that, that's a huge uh, uh, allotment for uh, free dental care for our residents. Uh, if you have any specific questions, I, I can get in deep water pretty quickly. And Jessica, uh, in addition to helping out on the um, deputy mayor side, she's uh, now uh, the chief oper chief operating officer over at Agent and is knee deep in all these programs. Um, that's two point six million dollars is going towards uh, community connection and wellness. Wayne, who's um, providing the dental services uh, as a general proposition? Who um, can can you can you give us an idea of who's providing those dental services to people? Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not through DHCF. Uh, so my, my my guess is they're going they 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 will contract with uh, separate providers. Uh, who may not be Medicaid providers, some of them may be Medicaid providers, but they will be paid not under the Medicaid program. This would be uh, a dental provider that may or may not be in Medicaid that develops a contract with uh, aging and that uh, provides the free dental services. Okay. Yeah, it goes through uh, it goes through DC Health. Okay. And okay. Uh, in, in addition, we, there's there's funding out of the 2.66 million, there, there are gonna be uh, 1,000 wireless enabled iPads. Um, I think they've already distributed like 500, um, and there's a million dollars for uh, the connector card to increase mobility. And in, this, in, in a time when it's very difficult uh, to uh, for many who are living on the margin to to find enough to eat, enough quality food, um, they get a seven there's 750 thousand dollars going towards a grocery gift card in the pilot program. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Mr. Chairman, I want to get to the uh, very weighty uh, issues that surround uh, DHCF's uh, budget. Uh, this budget covers both the Medicaid and the Alliance programs. Next slide, no. Um, you know, you might recognize this, this graph on slide 12. We started building this uh, the year that I came to work for you when you were mayor. And at that time, I think we, only, we had... Uh, our data systems were pretty antiquated, and we had to struggle yep. to find data going back past 2010, thanks to the AFO who was uh, working under some uh, really difficult environments with respect to data. This place was not well equipped to uh, uh, to, to to conduct analytics on a um, you know a, a three billion dollar budget, but the a AFO was uh, amazing in helping us uh, uh, pull this together. We've since we what we do each year is we add uh, the enrollment projections for Medicaid. We have a separate trend for a, a separate uh, um, gra uh, uh, chart for analysis for alliance that is not shown here. But as you can see on this graph, that um, in the years from in the year beginning in 2020 uh, through 2021, the growth rate for that one year 
is higher than any other growth rate that was observed before we before 2010 when they did Medicaid expansion. Um, at 6.3 percent, it is higher than we, we, what we've seen in any, in any year or in any annual growth since uh, uh, 2010. Uh, and it's a function of two things. One, people were pushed uh, into poverty uh, by the pandemic, uh, couldn't go to work, didn't have didn't have access to jobs. Uh, and two, uh, we were not uh, removing anybody from the uh, um, uh, from me either either Medicaid or Alliance, uh, and the reasons were we wanted to make sure uh, that we were we adhered to CDC's guidance to make sure I mean, and, and HHS's guidance to make sure that we weren't throwing people off of uh, off of their health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. And so the only people who got removed were those who who died, unfortunately, and we were able to identify the records, or those who self-attested they were no longer eligible. You didn't do either of those things, and you, uh, you you typically stayed on the program. So the growth rate for the program uh, is now uh, the highest that it's been in over twenty and over uh, uh, in, in more than ten years. And we, as a result, have more people on Medicaid and Alliance combined than at any time in the history of those two programs in D.C. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a uh, very useful slide to understand. Um, you know how the Medicaid program or the challenges that the Medicaid program deals with when we're putting together a budget. Uh, it shows you that the, um, you know, um, it, it shows you the enrollment levels by group for those who are aged and disabled, those who are non-disabled adults and non-disabled children. And then it compares the proportion of their uh, Medicaid enrollment to the proportion of their Medicaid spending. And as you can see, only 21% of our enrollment uh, at the time we we drew this data for fiscal year 21, could be uh, categorized as aged and disabled, but they accounted for almost 60% of the dollars that we spend. Uh, likewise, um, if you look at non-disabled adults, the, the numbers go in the opposite direction. There are more there are more non-disabled adults in the program, 47%, but they only account for 30% of spending. As with the, as is the case with children, non-disabled children, 33% of mm -hmm. uh, enrollment, but only 12% of spending. Um, mm -hmm. So next slide, please. This also has implications for how we set up our program. Um, and as you, we, we basically have a, um, a bifurcated Medicaid program where we have 81%, as this graph shows, of our beneficiaries are in managed care, 81%. Um, yet they account for only 56% of the, of the 3.25 uh, um, billion dollars that are spent on this program. That's a slow turn, actually. Um, now, when you look at fee-for-service beneficiaries, they're 19% of, of the uh, uh, Medicaid enrollment, but they account for 44% of the amount that we spend on their health care. On a per beneficiary basis, uh, a fee-for-service beneficiary costs us on average about $27,000 per beneficiary compared to only $8,000 for those in managed care. Uh, overall, we spend about $11,642 uh, per person in the Medicaid program. It is one of, uh, I believe, it, it, it has remained one of the highest per person spends of Medicaid programs in the country. Uh, next slide, please. So why why uh, is why is fee for service so much more expensive uh, in terms of a beneficiary group than managed care? This slide uh, tells it all. Uh, when you look at the top half of the slide on the left compared to the top half of the slide on the right, you will see that for almost every uh, type of morbidity, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, uh, arthritis, chronic disease, and we don't show obesity on here. Um, but you could put that in the categories where almost for every every one of those conditions, the the uh, the, the rate of morbidity for the fee for service population is more than twice, at least twice, and sometimes more than twice what you see in the managed care population. Some of it's a function of age. Uh, the fee for service population is older, and as we get older, we we tend to struggle with uh, those conditions. I'm counting the number that I've struggled with in 
you know, I can check two or three of those um, uh, diagnoses, unfortunately. Uh, so it is a function of age, uh, but it's also a function of, uh, um, you know, the, the, the challenges that some of the uh, persons who are in the fee-for-service program face uh, with their health. Uh, with children, the differences are not um, as extensive in some cases. Managed care, uh, in some cases, uh, um, children in managed care have higher levels of uh, asthma, for example, than those in, in, who are in fee for service. Uh, next slide, please. So, so, so is the conversion, so the, the conversion to managed care, uh, if you can speak of, speak about it a little bit, I'd appreciate it. But is the conversion to managed care, what impact is that going to have in terms of costs uh, for service uh, for much of our population? That's a very, and that's a, now we manage care. That's a that's a very good question. And what I want to do, I have a slide that specifically speaks to that, uh, that I want to address. Uh, that'll make it clear what that means. It's also going to be something that I've told the hospital association. Um, but in general, what is happening is there are two things. Uh, we're going to put more people in managed care who are in the fee for service population. That's going to increase right. the cost of managed care services because they're going to they're going to have to take on a larger number of sicker people. But at the same time, we are going to be imposing on our managed care uh, uh, health plans the requirement that they try to work with the hospitals and work with the community providers uh, to see if they can through through care coordination uh, become more successful in treating uh, the, some of the illnesses that that the members in the fee for service program bring. And maybe produce better outcomes that were lower costs in the long run. That is the hope. But I'll show you the difference. I'll show you what it means the differences in healthcare costs uh, uh, for the hospitals uh, and what they will see as a result of this uh, uh, conversion. But I wanted, uh, before I get there, I want to point you to slide 16. As you no doubt remember, we were in a huge uh, tussle with the council on managed care. I believe it was last year. Um, it was. <laughs> and, and, you know, we were. Um, wasn't all it, the council members either. Yeah, it wasn't all of them. You know, um, the, the, we were accused of all kinds of things that were not accurate. Um, and the, the point that we were trying to make for much of that argument was that we cannot have a vendor in the program that does not contract with every other, with every hospital, every right. large physician practice plan, and every federally qualified health center. Because if you do, you will create an imbalance in, in the availability of uh, health care for a given uh, um, uh, health plan. And those members who need the health care that is not available in that plan will simply go to the plans that have it. And that will skew your costs because those members tend to be sicker. The, mm -hmm. We put universal contracting in place to make sure that didn't happen in 21. This graph shows you what happened as a result of that very successful effort by, by uh, uh, the mayor to make sure that only health plans that, are, that had universal contracts were in the program. And as you see, uh, when you look at this chart, the blue part of the chart represents the um, required, I mean, on, on, the, on the far right, the, uh, it shows you the actuarial model that we use to set races based on guidance from CMS. Uh, <clears throat> there is an 85% requirement at the federal level that health plans must meet in terms of medical, in terms of spending on medical services. When you add in case management, as as we do, uh, our, th that requirement goes to 89.5%. So then if you look to the left of that graphic, it shows you what MedStar Care First and AmeriHealth spent on medical services and case management in, fiscal, in, in, in calendar year 21. They were all over 90%. Uh, what that means is uh, in order to uh, um, make sure that they don't you know, lose money, they have to control their admin costs. You can spend as much as 15% on admin if you want. Uh, they were spending three, three, seven, and seven percent respectively, and their profits were not unreasonable. You know, I, we don't, we we're not, uh, we're not communists. We have no desire 
to impose a, 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 a situation of you can never earn a profit if you work uh, uh, in the managed care program. But we're, at the same time, we cannot allow uh, profits to reach such exorbitant levels that people wonder what we're doing. Mm -hmm. When you come in at 3%, less than 1% and 3% respectively, those are reasonable profits. You can even go a little bit higher than that. But you can't get to a profit rate of 39 or, or, or over 30%. That is unconscionable. By the same token, we can't allow a plan to spend only 60, 65, 69% of their uh, revenue on medical expenses. So we have, uh, uh, we will, uh, whenever this procurement ends, Hopefully it will still be in June. That, that is the target. This universal contract uh, requirement will still be in place. Um, and if, if the health plans can't meet it, then they won't be in the program. Um, and, and, but we expect all the health plans to be that, that are selected to meet it, regardless of who they are. Now, I don't know who they will be at this point. We will know in June. But this just underscores um, the appropriateness of what the mayor was trying to do uh, with the managed care contracts last year, and it introduced significant stability in, in the program. And I am very grateful for all of the council members who um, looked beyond the rhetoric and saw the wisdom of what was being proposed and supported us to get to the point that we are in now. So I, I'm very thankful. And I wanted to put that slide in there because I know your committee was especially uh, uh, supportive for the most part uh, of what the mayor was trying to do. And I, I want to thank them collectively uh, for really saving the managed care program. Uh, I, and I, I don't say that lightly. Your efforts saved managed care in the District of Columbia. Had you not prevailed, there would not be a managed care program today. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm glad that we did, Wayne. I'm glad that we took the position that we did. I was glad to do that. And uh, we are glad that managed care uh, is going to be an important part of how we provide health care services uh two people uh in 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 the district of columbia so thank you for your work we appreciate that very much and uh we'll look forward to continuing to work with you um, absolutely how, how are you communicating uh the the responsibilities the uh mandates for these care, uh, care plans uh how are you communicating that to people at this point in terms of the requirement to contract yes well, the, uh, the procurement has uh, two requirements in it. One of them is an OCP requirement, and one of them is a, a DHF requirement. The OCP requirement is uh, you have to present uh, letters of intent to contract in order to get through the front door to even be in the procurement. Um, I think all, you know, they, they, so they're in the process now of evaluating how that plays out. Once that is finished, they then give the, eligible contracts to OC to my technical evaluation team and they evaluate those contracts uh, and select the uh, winners now once the winners are selected they have a certain number of days i think that issue is under protest uh by uh, uh by amerigroup i believe they have a certain number of days to bring to deliver uh signed contracts with all the provider groups if they don't do that by a certain number of days they won't get a contract now, our job will be to determine whether to determine whether or not the process of negotiation was a fair one. We cannot be involved in <clears throat> the federal government doesn't allow us to, to to arbitrate disputes between health plans and providers on contracts, but we can make a, an assessment, and I, or I can as director make an assessment of uh, which group, uh, if not both groups, were, uh, uh, were were fair in the negotiating process. Uh, and if we determined that one group was fair and another group was not, then any decision about who is no longer in the program uh, will be based on that uh, determination. So we are that, hoping that that that, that uh, determination of, of the uh, fairness on the part of people that's all left at DHCF. Yes, we we basically um, if if a health plan comes to us and a hospital comes to us and says, look, we can't come together on this contract then we'll just ask some basic questions. <clears throat> and uh, based on the answers we get to those questions, we will make a judgment as to, uh, you know, whether or not uh, one or both of the parties were negotiating in good faith. And 
if they were not negotiating in good faith, then they would be subject to a huge sanction. Now, I will say, and I'll be very honest with you, I, and I've told the, uh, Chairman Mendelson this as well, I am very um, provider, uh, healthcare, I am very healthcare provider oriented. Doesn't mean yeah. I don't like the health plans, but the, the reality of it is the hospitals, the clinics, and the physicians, they provide the care. So it's going to take a whole lot uh, for us to say a healthcare provider is going to be thrown out. We have to see pretty significant evidence that they were operating in bad faith. Um, by the same token, it will be pretty easy to determine whether or not a health plan was operating in bad faith. You know, if they try to lowball on the rates that they uh, are willing to pay, uh, and it's obvious they're lowballing, we will be able to see that. And we will be able to say that's not fair. And, you know, you, you can't be in the program if you can't come off that position. So, by the same token, we can't let it. Wayne, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, what criteria are you using to be able to make those determinations just so? You know, our members know, uh, the, the health committee members yeah. know, and other members in the, in the uh, council. Uh, know, you know, we, we don't have a threshold level that we expect to see for each uh, contract. It's based on, you know, because, you know, each, each, uh, each provider has a different ability to uh, uh, draw a certain rate. But if, say, say if provider A, has uh, rates with the other MCOs that are paying them 115% of costs. And then there's a one health plan that says, you know what, I'm only going to give you 98% of costs. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to blame the hospital. I'm not going to blame the health care provider. They don't agree to that. Because clearly, um, you know, they've been able to negotiate rates with other health plans that are, that are significantly higher than that. There's no reason that uh, it doesn't mean they have to get 115% from every health plan, but they should be in the ballpark if that were the threshold. Now, for some other provider, they may not have been able to get over 103%. So if a, if a MCO says, look, I'm willing to give them 101%, that, that probably is reasonable. So it, it, it'll, it'll be a subjective determination uh, based on a uh, rigorous and uh, unbiased view of the data. Okay. Hope, and hopefully, hopefully, it won't come to that. Right. Yep. Well, as, as you know, as you know, we are moving towards uh, really expanding tremendously the healthcare system on the east end of the city uh, with with a new hospital, with uh, uh, other services that will be available to people. How are you? How are you determining the rates that? can be charged, let's say, for the new hospital or the, um, you know, for the uh, health care systems that will be put in place sure. uh, in, in wards eight and seven? That's a very good question. It is, um, and that is the, um, the fulcrum on which the possibility of even having a hospital run by a health care system in ward uh, uh, eight for ward eight and seven was even made possible. Um, mm -hmm. now the, the health plans are probably going to be mad at DHCF when they realize what we've done. Uh, but what we've done was absolutely necessary to make sure that the hospital and healthcare system could survive. Mm -hmm. uh, in ward eight, almost 80% of the residents who live there are on Medicaid. Medicaid historically across the country and in, mm -hmm. in DC before I came. Between it's seven and eighty percent of the of the population in seven and eight, is that right? In in seven, it's about sixty nine percent. Right. And so eight. you got eight. You got eighty percent in in eight and seven and sixty nine percent in seven. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you have if 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 the predominant uh, patient that comes to your door at a hospital or a clinic is on Medicaid and Medicaid is paying less than your cost, you will not survive. Uh, that hospital will face, will get, will, that, that hospital or provider will soon be in a death spiral that they can't get out of. Uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of what's, that's kind of what has happened to UMC. And so mm -hmm. what we have said is, if once, uh, as long as the population in Ward 8 
is at least 50% Medicaid. If you contract with the hospital, uh, you have to pay that hospital 148% of cost. Now, how do we mm -hmm. get to that number? We basically asked the provider, the operator, to give us the average commercial rate that they were paid for commercial business. And we took the position that if that's the average commercial rate, we're going to make that the average Medicaid rate. That will give that hospital the revenue it needs to survive. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it, and the federal government will pay 70% of the cost. Uh, my team has done the... Uh, uh, we, we've done the analysis. Uh, UHS has done the um, pro forma based on those rates. And we believe that hospital will be successful and making money no later than the second or third year, which would be phenomenal for a hospital that's serving people who are predominantly on Medicaid. Sure will. It would be absolutely yeah. phenomenal. And yeah, so yeah. I, we, we, we're, very, we're very hopeful. Now, my team, has, my team still has some work to do. I think they keep talking about a preprint. I still haven't figured out what that means, uh, but CMS has to sign off on this, uh, and we are sure they will. We've been in, com in communications with them, uh, and we will we will execute the necessary uh, steps to make sure that that's in place uh, when the hospital opens up in December of 2024. Okay, we we, we obviously will be paying close attention to that. This will be a, a continuing discussion for us, Wayne, um, as we look through the health committee. Uh, as yes. we continue to, to look at, uh, you know, as UMS, as as UHS, excuse me, as, as the the uh, hospital phases out, which was, we we I I'd love to get your take on the um, on the phase out plan uh, for uh, the United Medical Service. Uh, just just what what your take is and how then those costs will transition to a new system all together a new hospital and other services that are going to be provided uh on the east end of the city so uh, yeah, I, would love to sit down. I would love to sit down with you and maybe uh bring kim russo along and ben stutch and maybe we can sit down and sort of walk through how we think this is all going to work out okay and, uh, we can bring I, we can bring we can bring, the, we, can bring the, we can bring the chair of the uh board uh angel jacobs who's doing an amazing job yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that, I think that would be a good conversation to have. I wonder. Uh, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I, I think that's very important, especially as we're making this transition from the existing United Medical Center to a, a brand new hospital. And I hope everybody understands that it's not just we're we're there's a new hospital and we're just simply taking the same uh, efforts and and transitioning it to. The new it's, it's a new hospital all together, as well as the other services that we're going to be provided uh, as a part of this healthcare system. So uh, I'd like to do that sooner than later, Wayne. Absolutely. I will make sure that I'll, um, I think my, uh, uh, I have two chief of staffs between, between two of them, they can figure it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll get on your calendar as soon as possible. Absolutely. I, I would appreciate that because uh, those, those, issues are a little bit arcane for lots of people but in the main we need to understand we need to know that information as we make this transition to a new health care system uh, on the east end of the city absolutely i wanted to turn your attention uh which addresses an earlier question you had about what this conversion will mean in terms of cost and spend uh from fee for service to managed care on slide yeah. 17, this is a um, this is a pretty in interesting graphic. I I uh, I think uh, Elian put this graphic together. Did she? Uh, what's Elian's last name? Yeah. Elian Bell put this graphic together, which uh, it is very very. Uh, once you figure out what it's saying, it's very intuitive. Um, in 2020, if you look at this graphic, the gray portion of this graphic represents the spend for. Uh, fee the fee for service population that on on inpatient and out, outpatient hospital care. As you can see in 2020, uh, we were spending over 300 million dollars, close to 400 million dollars in the fee for service population for inpatient and outpatient hospital spending. The blue part of the graph is the additional spend for that same, I mean for uh, for that for the managed care on hospital 
and inpatient services, not for fee for service, but off, but for managed care and, uh, beneficiaries. Now, uh, as you can see, there's only a, was a there's only a narrow difference between the 300 and look like 80 some million that was being spent on fee for service, hospital, inpatient and outpatient calls, compared to a little over roughly 400 million for uh, the managed care costs for hospital and inpatient services. Now, as we make the transition, as we move more fee for service members um, into managed care, mm -hmm. notice how the spin on the hospital and inpatient uh, costs on the fee for service side plummets. Uh, the gray area gets increasingly smaller going from over 380 million to it looks like under almost un, just over 200 million. Meanwhile, the MCO spin increases to over $600 million because they now have their population. Mm -hmm. here, is the, here is both the benefit and the risk. Uh, the benefit is uh, we are moving a significant number of persons whose care has never been managed into uh, a managed environment where we hope that they can work with the health plans and begin this process of, 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 of treating uh, persons, and especially when we bring in mental health, treating the whole person in a coordinated way that maybe even drives down costs. So you get the benefit of, a, uh, of care coordination in, in any of the three health plans uh, that did not exist for that population before they were moved into the health plan. That's one benefit. The other benefit is to the provider. When, when hospitals are paid on the fee-for-service side, they are capped by CMS uh, at no more than 100% of cost. Mm -hmm. And I think on the outpatient side, I think on the inpatient side, we pay, what, 98 99%. On the outpatient side, and we pay, what do we pay on the outpatient side? About 100%. That's as high as you can go for a population that can have some pretty significant medical needs. But now that they're moved on to managed care side, the rate you get is what you can negotiate. It doesn't, you, you're not bound, you're not capped at 100%. Uh, the rates, <coughs> I've seen rates uh, from, you know, 105 to over 120% on the managed care side. So they will get it, they will now be able to serve, the hospitals will now be able to benefit uh, financially from a population for which they used to provide care for it at a cap rate of no more than 100% to a, an environment where they, they can be paid whatever they can negotiate. Now, uh, we don't expect managed care companies to give away the um, uh, keys to the kingdom, but you know we do expect them to, to be fair and recognize that the providers on the front line providing care and they need to be paid a fair uh, a fair rate. So that that is, that is kind of the, that in a nutshell with respect to the, the impact of the conversion. But mm -hmm. by all accounts, the benefits of this conversion far outweigh the potential cost. Next slide, please. How, how will we be able to, uh, let's say from the council perspective, Wayne, how will we be able to measure the effectiveness as a, uh, as a with a managed care approach versus uh, a, uh, the, the, Fee for service approach yeah. that people were subjected to before this. We are we, we are putting in place a um, uh, we we've had it in place off and on over the last five or six years. What we call a pay for performance. Uh, and yeah. pay for performance, we will uh, set threshold levels that we expect the uh, health the health plans to meet. We want them to lower the number of people who go to the emergency room for non emergency basis. Right. We want we want them to eliminate or reduce the hospital readmissions that occur within 30 days after a person is discharged, and we want to we want them to reduce the number of avoidable hospital admissions. Classic example: kid has asthma. If the asthma is well controlled, the kid doesn't end up in the hospital. If nobody's paying attention to the kid's care, or they're doing it haphazardly, or then you could have a situation where a child ends up in an emergency room 
uh, for days because their asthma is out of control when they should never have been there in the first place. So mm -hmm. those are the three index. We, we know we estimate we spend about a hundred million dollars with managed care companies more than we have to spend uh, because uh, those costs are not better contained through uh, um, more effective uh, care coordination. So we hope, and we're going to measure that, and we're going to uh, produce reports that show you how well they're doing on an annual basis. And, and each each one of the each one of the plans will be responsible for reporting to you on their care coordination uh, efforts, uh, so yeah. you'll know. How, how they're making this work or not work? We do it even better. We basically uh, work with our analysts and our actuary. We look at the data ourselves and we calculate how well they did. That our actuary has these really complex algorithms that they can sort of estimate um, uh, what, first of all, what an avoidable uh, 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 hospitalization is, what a non-acuity, uh, low acuity uh, uh, emergency room admission is, and what a 30 day readmission to the hospital is. Then based on those algorithms, we can determine with our, with our actuary and with our uh, data analytics team, how well the MCO was performed in those in that regard. You know, they'll complain that it's kind of hard because, you know, um, Medicaid beneficiaries and sometimes Alliance beneficiaries uh, are some, oftentimes not connected to care in the way that they should. And we tell them, you know, if it was easy, we'd do it ourselves. We, you know, that's why we hired them because it's hard, we can't do it. So. Um, they understand and they will work hard to make sure that, that they uh, approve on those outcomes as much as possible. Next slide. Will, will, all, will, all, will all the people who are part of the alliance be subjected to these same uh, care determinations? Wayne? Uh, we I have, you know, just a good question. I, we had in previous years, we did not include alliance and pay for performance. Uh, and I don't know if we have actually enrolled at it. We, I don't know if we actually put that into the uh, the performance incentive, but I know what I was planning to ask our actuary and our data analytics team to do is to apply uh, the algorithms to the alliance as well, even if we have not begun to uh, uh, capture that in the pay, pay for performance model with with Medicaid. It's, it's, it gets a little complicated because Medicaid is, you know, federally uh, funded, uh, right. and uh, there are different rules about what you do and what you can't do and alliance is all local so we we're going to uh i'm going to ask my team to track it but i don't know uh I don't, I mean, we've not yet figured out whether and how we can uh, sort of uh, uh impose some performance indicators that have some financial teeth to them on health plans that's something we'll look at when when, when will you have those determinations decided uh wayne so that we can um, Myself, that's a good question. Uh, Lisa Truitt, who is uh, who runs our healthcare delivery team and is also the lead um, evaluator on our managed care proposals, uh, is working with our actuary now uh, to develop those models for Alliance. Uh, Lisa has, geez, I don't know how many years experience in managed care. She's our most knowledgeable managed care uh, person in the agency. She's absolutely brilliant at what she does. Um, so um, she will most likely, uh, she just sent me a text. She says she'll have it in a couple of months. <clears throat> so I'll hold her to that. Well, we, we, we will, we will I, I will look forward to you, um, you know, not only coming to us to talk about some of the uh, other issues that we, we, we raised earlier, but also um, with this kind of data as well, with kind of, this kind of information how we are going to be able to gather the kind of data that we know will be meaningful uh, to the taxpayers of the District of Columbia. And uh, not, not, not to be, uh, not, not, not to cite information that people readily know, of course, but um, this is probably, it's close to the most expensive program uh, in the District of Columbia, uh, our Medicaid program. Yeah. And, what you've done with it, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible, and I appreciate it. So, um, when, when you came to work, when you came to work with me as the, the mayor of the District of Columbia, Wayne, I, I know we had discussions about what we needed to do with the Medicaid program, but you have been phenomenal in terms of um, tracking, staying on top of how we've evolved 
uh, the managed care program, the Medicaid program uh, in the District of Columbia. So I just wanted to say that, this, you know, as, as a part of the work that we're doing now, um, that people understand that Medicaid is, is, is very difficult. It's very, uh, very uh, intensive in terms of the work that's done, but that the work that you've done to be able to um, achieve this is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you so much for that, Wayne. Well, you know, I've had a lot of help, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, we, uh, one of the things that I try to uh, convince my executive team at DHCF is that this is, by my estimation, the most complex and important agency uh, in the district. And it is. Uh, they, they have, uh, they are very, very talented as a group. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sum uh, is greater than the uh, whole of the parts. Uh, and, you know, if they stick together, um, you know, there's no limit to how far this agency can go in terms of what it can, what it can accomplish. Uh, they, they are wonderful. They, the senior managers are, are excellent. We've had some turnover there lately, but we still have some very good senior uh, senior managers are still on board. Uh, middle level managers are very good, and we have staff that are very dedicated to try to make this the best program and uh, the best agency in the city. They've done a great job. Uh, speaking and of and fantastic leader, I wanted to make that clear. Okay, that what you've you. done as the leader of Medicaid uh, in the city is nothing short nothing short of phenomenal. Uh, we we we've got to be. I, I don't know if we are compared to other states, if you will, but we've got to be one of the top states in terms of a managed care program. In terms of the Medicaid program, excuse me, which is managed care for us and places and other. But um, uh, the Medicaid program has you know evolved so tremendously in the district. But your leadership has provided the opportunity for us to be able to say, make those statements, Wayne. So I thank you for that, okay? No, I appreciate the kind words, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm always very grateful that you called me in 2010 to come work for you in 2011, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, when, you, when you talk about the complexity of the uh, challenge associated with trying to figure this out from a budgeting standpoint, the next slide gives you some indication of how that was made more complex uh, by the uh, uh, pandemic and the uh, federal uh, public health emergency. Uh, if you look at this slide, it shows the uh, enrollment levels, uh, actual levels and projections for the uh, Medicaid MCO, the People Service Population Alliance and the Immigrant Children's Program. And as you can see from the first quarter of fiscal year 21, uh, through the first quarter, I mean, th projected through the uh, third quarter of fiscal year 22, we are seeing and expected to see um, continued increases in the managed care enrollees, slight increases on the fee-for-service side, not much, uh, uh, increases on alliance that are somewhat obfuscated by the um, um, uh, small numbers relative to the Medicaid program, but that is a, a, a significant increase that third line and almost really no growth on the uh, immigrant children's side but once we get beyond uh fiscal year 22 quarter three we are anticipating uh a significant drop in enrollment on uh for the mcos um not so much for so for fee for service a small drop for the alliance um and it is this this assumption um, this supposition, if you will, is the foundation on which our budget for fiscal year 23 has been constructed. Uh, and that is a key issue. And if you go to the next slide, um, next slide, man. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, this next slide gives you some, some sense for what the, comp the, 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 complicated nature of this challenge is that both uh, Melissa, Angelique, Darren and his team, they all faced as we tried to come to grips with what this uh, uh, um, the public health emergency period meant for uh, and the changes to that and the changes to coverage and the changes to our enhanced rate meant for our budget. 
uh, the public health emergency period was initially uh, set to end in December of 21. It was extended to April of 22. Uh, that's the top gray line. And the second uh, little uh, arrow shows you the extension. The coverage period was initially in effect uh, through February of uh, 22. It has now been ex extended to June of 22. And our enhanced FMAP, that means we get, we normally get 70% federal match. Uh, we now get 76.2% federal match. Uh, that was scheduled to end in December of 21. Uh, it has now been extended to June of 22. Um, so our budget is soundly based on these data and the enrollment projections that I showed you earlier. However, if the PHE is further uh, extended, our brilliant AFO tells me that additional analysis will have to be done to determine whether or not our projections will still hold. Uh, I don't. I would. I don't want to say. I, I hope the PHE is not extended because it does mean you know, um, you know, uh, uh, continue more continuous coverage uh, for persons who might otherwise have some bumps. But at the same time, it also could, could mean we have bad news on the pandemic, which I, I certainly me, I don't want to ever see again. Uh, but that? that is the challenge we. That is the challenge we have, uh, and we have to watch what happens at the federal level, uh, and then. If they extend it, then we have to get to get busy with our data analytics team and with, with the AFO to figure out what this means from a budget standpoint. Um, and then we'll go from there. Next slide, please. Is there data that you will have in June, uh, June of this, this year that will be meaningful to the councils, especially the health committee, uh, in terms of looking at what the, um, you know, what the commitments are? What we what we are, you know, required to do. What we, especially, as we are adding members who live, you know, the Medicaid members who 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 live uh, in uh, various areas of the city, especially uh, wards uh, seven and eight. Yeah, I think if if the uh, public health uh, emergency is not extended. Uh, you know, we will be able to say that we think our projections on, um, you know, what the uh, uh, enrollment levels will be in Medicaid. And I think we can do that by, I don't know if we can do that by ward. Um, mm -hmm. We've never done it by ward, but we can certainly tell you what the the aggregate um, uh, enrollment projections will be, because uh, they will be what, what we have in the budget. Now, if, the, if we get an announcement from the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services that um, they're going to extend the uh, uh, federal uh, public the, the federal emergency, public health emergency. Then uh, we have to see what that extent how when that extension will uh, begin and end, and uh, then we have to go back to the data and figure out what that might do to the enrollment levels. But we can, you know, we have the uh, the horses at DHCF who can who can do that. Um, we have the uh, uh, models that can easily be tweaked. Uh, and we certainly have the data in a, in a very complex um, um, data analytics data analytics uh, uh, in our in our system that we can draw upon to get you those answers. Okay, what 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 will be what will get us to the answers that I guess the questions that I was asking uh, previously, uh, Wayne, and that is um, what will give us what 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 will we need to do to get the kind of data that we can analyze and know exactly where we are with our Medicaid program, especially if we are adding the uh, the uh, the the other program uh, to that. The, the um, we, we have program. we have uh, copious data on who's in Medicaid, what services they receive, how much those services cost, what their demographics are. Um, we have tons of data. And we have mm -hmm. uh, um, um, a very sophisticated uh, data system that we can draw upon to produce almost any uh, uh, information that you would like to see. Um, okay. Maybe what um, you know my team can do is sit down with members of your team 
uh, and sort of put together a, uh, a list of data uh, uh, requests from your office that we then can work on late spring and into the summer and build a picture for you of where Medicaid is going and what it might look like. Okay, that, that would be very, really helpful, Wayne, uh, so that we can look at what the implications for Medicaid are, especially across the city. And um, I, I assume that we can do some, some analyses also of uh, the Alliance uh, group that, you know, they, they are not Medicaid eligible, obviously, but uh, we've served them in ways that have uh, helped to make them more eligible for uh, our, our services like Medicaid. So, yeah, yeah, we, we have a number of analysis plan uh, for the Alliance uh, uh, program. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, we certainly will um, put a framework on, um, I think it's outstanding that Alliance has the same um, recertification and enrollment issues uh, or enrollment plan that Medicaid does. Uh, now we also have to get as close as we can as equalizing the review process to make sure that we are not including people in the program who are not eligible. Um, okay. But we're going to develop a plan for that um, sometimes later this summer and then, you know, present it to you and the committee after it, it gets through uh, 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 the executive office of the mayor that shows you the kind of things we'll be doing on the Alliance side. Okay. We appreciate that, Wayne. Go okay. ahead. And I, I've cut you off. During no, that's okay. And I apologize for that. Uh, no, I figured the questions were coming sooner or later, so might as well come sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, next slide 21 shows you how, how we reached our, our budget, which is $927 million in local funds. We started with a recurring budget of $814.6 billion. Um, there were market adjustments totaling $52.8 million. Um, we, uh, we, we had a 2% reduction of $16.4 million. It took us to a new baseline of $850.9 million. Uh, the mayor was kind enough to restore uh, $37.7 million of, of reduction we proposed to meet the mark. Um, and then they turned around and took some of our vacancy savings, a small amount, 930000 Really upset Angelique, but she would rather have the $37 million than the 930000 <laughs> so, yeah. um, And, and uh, so they restored... Uh, the total restored of our, our, our of our, uh, our savings initiative for thirty six point eight million dollars. Uh, the mayor uh, graciously added almost forty million dollars in enhancements that took us to nine hundred and twenty seven point one million dollars that you see on slide twenty one. Next slide, please. Those those are those are local dollars that we were just looking at, Wayne. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that's that that is huge, and I, I just hope people appreciate. As they look at this presentation and this this uh, hearing, they appreciate the number of local dollars that are being invested in the Medicaid program uh, at this stage. Absolutely. Now there are some details of our budget on slide 22. I won't go over each each number. There are two or three that I will speak to in later slides. But I just put this in here for your uh, later reading that shows you, uh, you know, how we got to 927 million dollars in more detail. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll be very helpful for a uh, later reading. I wanted to turn your attention to slide 23. Um, you know, this was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, testimony uh, by your witnesses uh, during the uh, morning and early afternoon about this particular issue of the uh, wage increase that uh, we put in, uh, that the mayor put in her budget uh, for DSP work. Um, we, um, in response to the uh, workforce shortage that I think council member Nadeau started this issue working with ICFs, um, a couple of years ago, uh, and it's been not as long a fight as the Alliance, but it's certainly been a struggle. Um, and, um, so we were, um, and the mayor was determined that she wanted to do something about this wage issue that had been repeatedly um, that, have, that repeatedly surfaced over the last three or four years. Um, and so the, 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 the idea was to 
uh, put a uh, increase in that would help the industry address, address the workforce shortage for direct service professionals. Um, we had the ability to use some federal funding uh, for the home and community based service, APRA funding for 23. Um, and uh, um, the, the um, in March of 24, but following it, the district will support this uh, increase at 100%. It appeared from uh, from some of your comments that people didn't didn't know that some people didn't even know that we had made this policy change because uh, there were some mm -hmm. witnesses who testified that they were disappointed that we did nothing for DCPs. This is a that is a, a patently inaccurate. <clears throat> and so, uh, what did we do for them? Uh, basically, Angelique got together with her team, and they came up with this approach that would allow us to pay 117.6% of the living wage um, and expand it to cover all DSP workers. Um, the concept that she put in place is demonstrated on the slide 23 at the bottom of the slide. In effect, <coughs> we are creating a career ladder <coughs> for a DSP. We're talking about DSPs, the, the direct service providers, is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. We are in effect putting in a career ladder that will can take their wages from um, living wage to a mid-level wage and then to a higher level wage. For those, and, and, and this is the key point that needs to be made that none of your witnesses took the uh, time to explain or they were sufficiently confused themselves. When they complain that their wage increase is not adequate, not a one can tell you of any Medicaid program, or certainly not more than one or two, if, if that, that pays a pure wage increase that gets as high as $24 per $24 an hour. That's all wage, that's not fringe, that's not the administrative rate for the home care agency. They still get that in a separate payment. This is a pure wage increase that can take you to $24 an hour. I don't know of any program that is paying that kind of wage. <clears throat> the uh, This is higher than um, you see in, in if, if you look at the living wage in New York City, for example, uh, they pay a living wage of 13 to 15 dollars per hour, and they have a provider specific rate that averages out about twenty six dollars per hour. Now I think that includes the administrative fee. So we are in terms of a pure rate increase, we're paying more than you would get in New York City. We're paying more than you would get in New York State. Most yeah. states max most states max out at fifteen dollars an hour. By 24 or fiscal year 25, we do not. By 25, if you are if you are a, a DSP worker with some experience and your home care agency wants to pay you the max level, and they can even pay you more. Uh, but they can, but what we funded is $24 an hour. <clears throat> not a one person who testified to you this morning explained that that was a pure wage increase, not a fringe and not a portion that goes to the health care agency. And so, so how do you have this conversation with Ian Perigo? Yeah, we've uh, we've we've had several conversations with Ian Perigo. And okay. you know, I like her. He's Ian is a great guy, he's a great advocate. He 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 does move the goalposts on us from time to time. But um I'm I hope he's listening and I, I hope he understands that he won't find anybody paying more than twenty four dollars an hour as a pure wage to any worker. He just won't find it. So I think that is an, a remarkable accomplishment uh, by the mayor to put this in her budget. And it speaks to the excellent work that Angelique, as our finance director, has done with uh, her team. We're gonna reorganize DHCF very soon. And I'm gonna make sure that uh, Angelique and give all the work that she does uh, and all the importance of finance. I'm gonna make sure that she, she, she gets senior status and that she retools her shop uh, in the way that she would like to continue to support Melissa and this agency with this kind of outstanding work because it is simply marvelous. And I and I will tell you, um, the way that we the way that she came up with how we would 
monitor this because you know I love our home care agency. We've thrown out all the bad ones. We had a lot of bad home care agencies that were taking about fourteen million dollars from us a month in illegal payments. They're gone, and we have some really, we have some good home care agencies. Uh, but we want to make sure that these dollars go directly to DSP workers. And the way we do that, we're going to put we're going to front load their budget so they can't say, you know, we don't have the money to pay these. We're going to put it up front. Then we're going to collect the cost reports, and we will determine whether or not not only whether or not they are paying the wages they are support that they said they paid, but also whether or not they paid more that should be reflected in their future costs going forward. See, people misunderstand. DHCF is not we we're, we're not a labor agency. We don't set wage rates. Right. You know, we don't we don't set wage rates for the market. Even though we put this wage scale in, they can pay more if they need to pay more to keep their workers. We just have to catch their costs and make sure it's reflective in the future rates that we pay. But putting this money in front loaded, it was a genius idea. And uh, it, I, I, just th I just think it's um, uh, an example of the kind of work that we get, our, we get out of our finance shop. The issue of CNAs, I will tell you, council member, I was stunned when, that's, when, this, when the CNAs were mentioned as, a, uh, as a, a group that should have been a part of this proposal. That was never discussed at least in any discussions that I had been in on for the last three years. CNAs, uh, we focused on the DSP position uh, because they were making an amount that were so close to the living wage. Uh, CNAs make above the living wage. Uh, we did use the CNAs during the uh, uh, PHE, but they generally do not work in home care settings. Uh, they work in uh, skilled nursing facilities and skilled nursing facilities have the capacity to pay them what they need to be paid, to, to make sure they stay on board, and then to bill us and make sure we we, have, we reflect that in their rates. Um, right now, they make an average of $18, of $16.80 before any fringe amounts are, are calculated. In ICF, they make almost $20 an hour. Uh, so the average CNA in DC makes uh, almost $18 an hour before we get fringes. It's almost, you know, uh, $38,000 a year. If that is not sufficient, we're not a labor agency. It's not our job to determine that. It is the job of the nursing facility to determine that. And it is their job to determine how much they need to be paid to keep them and to make sure that they are uh, appropriately rewarded. Once they do that, you know, we have cost reports that we look at and we set rates. But we're, we're, not, we're not the uh, uh, labor agency that tells we don't tell hospitals what to pay their people. We don't tell clinics what to pay their people. We don't tell physicians what to pay their people. We tell them, tell us what you pay. We look at your cost, and then we will reimburse you. Have you have you had this discussion? I'm, I'm using I for 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 for, for as, as an example because he's constantly citing, you know, what hasn't been done uh, for. Uh, the provider community, especially many of those who are in the residential uh, services. Have you had this conversation with him at this level of detail? Uh, he, yes. he, he, he certainly understands this stuff quite well. And yep. I want to make sure that we have a conversation with him to get the information from you uh, that would help help communicate this with uh, the let me say, Ian is a, an incredibly smart guy. Uh, he is a uh, tenacious advocate yes. for his uh, for his industry. Yes. There have been workforce meetings, and when we get to the question and answer session with the rest of the council, I want to let Angelique speak to the process that they have executed to get us to where we are, and the conversations that she's had with Ian uh, that will uh, be very clear as to what uh, what we've told them and what we've been working on. Um, so. Uh, you know, we, I want to make sure that he is not um, confused, but I don't think he's confused because I know he's very smart. And, yeah, he's and, and uh, I just think in, in, in the uh, tenacity of his advocacy, uh, some of the issues may have become muddled for him. But, you know, we will, we will, we will deal with that. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, is this the finish of your uh, finish of your slide presentation here? Yeah, you know what I'm going to do, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, uh, the next slides are are really uh, for information. Uh, I wanted to close by pointing you to the hospital on slide 28, simply to say that 
we do have a budget request for about $15 million. Ben that's tells our new me hospital, that, right? That's the new hospital. We 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 haven't moved. Uh, uh, we have we 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 haven't even dug a hole yet, and Ben came back with a bill for fifteen million dollars. <laughs> we have a hole now. Uh, next, if you go to the next slide, next slide, you will see that uh, you will see that the groundwork has started uh, on constructing this new hospital. So the fifteen million dollars is basically because of uh, uh, inflationary pressures in the market. Uh, supply chain issues, uh, and we are monitoring those, in, and and, and we increase the size of the diagnostic and testing area. Um, but UHS, because they requested that, agreed to pay about uh, five point five million dollars towards that, um, as a part of their uh, uh, seventy five million dollar investment into the hospital. <coughs> so, um, we are. I, I want to close by saying, you know, I've never seen. Uh, hole of dirt uh, represents such a pretty picture as we have on uh, slide 30. And I can't wait until uh, this hospital, as, as, as shown in the uh, uh, other graphs, other pictures, emerges from the grounds of St. Elizabeth. Mr. Chairman, those are all of my uh, uh, slides. And uh, my team and I are here and also are virtual to answer any questions that you and other members of the uh, Council may have. Thank you, Wayne. We <clears throat> appreciate it, and I appreciate you showing the uh, the, uh, the visuals, if you will, uh, the the of the, of the hospital, uh, what it's going to look like two years from now or or, or, or before. So, um, I'm going to turn to Council Member Nadeau uh, at this stage to give her a chance for what questions she may have, and uh, we'll go from there. Councilmember Nadeau, who of course is a member of our committee and has been a diligent member of our committee. So thank you so much. Um, thank you for that uh, very thorough testimony. Um, I'm really glad to see that the Mayor's Budget Support Act includes the Direct Care Professional Payment Rate Act, which is substantially similar to legislation the council passed in 2019. Glad we're on the same page. I discussed this with the DDS director at our hearing last week, but I wanted to talk to you, um, Deputy Mayor, in more detail about the funding behind this subtitle. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I know your team is. The subtitle sets a goal of wages for direct care services at 117.6% of minimum wage or living wage, but is currently funded. We won't get there until FY25. Can you start by walking me through the various funding mechanisms for this wage increase through the financial plan starting in FY23? Yes, we are, we put uh, you know, I think $11 million in local funds in 23 that will draw down about 36 million total. Um, and that money will be front loaded for the uh, providers to pay along this wage scale. Now, some may decide that they have to pay more. They have to pay more people on the higher end and the low end. They do that uh, when we do the cost reports, uh, we will see that and their rates will be recalibrated as a part of the rate setting methodology. Now, going forward from that, we won't have to front load it. We can use the rates that are set based on their actual cost uh, <clears throat> that will reflect what they're actually paying by 25. I see. Okay. So how much will the expected wage rate be in 23 and 24? Will those be effectively bonuses for an individual worker or are they truly wage increases those are wage increases um their wage scale is not a bonus scale it's whatever they pay along the wage scale that will be the uh, rate that that uh, D, uh, dsp worker earned and it is a pure rate it is not as i stated does not include an administrative fee for the home care agency they still get that it does not include friends they still get that this is a separate and pure rate that nobody appears to be talking about okay um now, but that isn't going to get us, it's still not going to get us to 116, 17.6% until FY25. Is that right? No, no, I don't. It, 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 I, th I thought the, um, uh, well, if it, if assume, if they follow this scale, we, 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 we had to estimate the sort of the proportion of people we thought based on their vacancy rates, it would be entry level versus senior. To be honest, we don't know how they're going to uh, uh, allocate those rates. You know, we have to wait and see. 
we're going to give them the money up front and then we'll see what happens on the back end. And that's because you have a lump sum and you won't know the providers are the ones who are going to have to tell you how many people it's getting divided among. Yeah. And Angela, I, I, and I want to bring Angelique into this discussion because she devised this uh, very, very uh, brilliant scheme. So, Angelique, if you can uh, jump in and answer uh, as the uh, council member has questions, feel free. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, council members. What we decided um, to do to ensure that we could meet the goals and support DSP, prof DSP professionals and in providing a rate over the um, living and minimum wage. Um, if you look at the total bill, it costs 36 million local, which um, when you look at the total computable, it's about $130 million annually. Um, we're talking about three different provider industries, home health agencies. We've looked at some behavioral health providers as well as the DD waiver community. And so the reason we picked the three, the three year time frame is very similar to what we did on the ICF um, when we increased their wage rates as well. So we're utilizing the lump sum payment in 23 and 24 for three main reasons. Um, one, we have the ability to use the HCBS ARPA dollars. And um, similar to New Hampshire, they've done the same types of wage increases, not the same amount, but in concept by providing that additional funding through a supplemental payment or a lump sum payment. What this allows us to do is at the beginning of fiscal year 23, so between October and November, we're requesting that each of the providers give us a list of their DSPs as well as giving us what their current salaries are and what their start dates are. This gives us the base or the premise on what increases we need to make within each of the providers. Um, and I think earlier in Ian's testimony, you heard him say that some providers are already paying above living wage and minimum wage. Our current reimbursement because um, it's based on historical cost reports, it doesn't support that, that increase in living wage that they're currently paying. And so if you were to create um, a wage increase in the first year, what would happen is that you would look at cost across that industry. And so with cost across that industry, if you have some providers that are currently paying $17 an hour, but most of them are only paying minimum wage. What happens is when you take the average of those costs, because we have industry wide rates, not provider specific rates, when you take that cost base and determine rate increases, you end up penalizing unintentionally, you end up penalizing those that are paying above minimum wage. And so generally in our um, rate analysis and when we're determining what we will pay providers, you want to level set the wages that are being paid across that particular provider category. So doing that in 23 and in 24 allows us to one, be mindful of the money that we're spending because we're working with a data set that we don't know. We don't, we haven't been able to get sufficient data across the industries to tell us how many DSPs and what you're paying. So it allows us to get that provider specific information, analyze it, make sure that we're paying providers that are already paying increased wages, and then also allows us to level set that what DSPs are being paid so that when we determine what the rate will be in FY25, and it's part of the actual rate versus a lump sum amount that you're getting to pay, um, it'll be a more equitable rate and aligned with what the actual costs are. So that's the intent. And I honestly think that that's getting missed in a lot of the conversations and the importance. It's $130 million that the district um, is going to have to come up with. And that's with, that's with Medicaid participation but we have to make sure that that rate is getting us to the goal with that we're trying to get to. And that's making sure we have career ladders in this 
field while they're getting more training and additional certification to move up to the next levels. And it's ensuring um, that we're paying above the living and minimum wage. Let me ask you this, because I know that you've worked really diligently I on this and understand the issue. Um, so thank you. Do you think this is all going to be soon enough for the hiring crisis, the vacancies that we've got in the industry right now? Right. And so I can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and so to be honest, we don't have all of the DSP data. Once I have that DSP data, along with the vacancy rate that um, the providers are carrying, I can better answer that question. Um, we've asked for the data right now, the last years, the last year that we have audited cost reports are from FY16. Um, and so right now we've asked for additional cost data during the pandemic. We're also auditing, um, we just finished the audits for DD waiver providers. We're beginning um, the audit process for home health agencies during the summer. And once I get all of that information and um, my staff is able to look at it and determine what the actual costs are that are being incurred, we'll be able to answer that question. But right now we don't know. And so okay. we don't wanna commit the to- The subtitle helps with that. The subtitle helps sort of codify Absolutely. the collection. So what about the assisted living and adult day health providers? They're not included, right? Um, both of those are home and community based waiver. And so in our analysis, we included EPD waiver providers um, and because they're um, providing care within a home and community based settings, the DSPs or the PCAs that work in both of those settings are included. I see. Okay. And then final question, um, slightly different, the enhanced payment rates for providers that went into effect during the public health emergency are scheduled to end six months after the end of the federal health emergency, um, uh, after the end of the federal public health emergency. Um, the healthcare finance budget assumes that the public health emergency would end in April and therefore enhanced rates to providers would roll back effective September 30th. Biden, President Biden promised states at least 60 days notice and hasn't given that notice. So the federal, we, it seems like we know the federal public health emergency is going to extend at least until July. That means that the enhanced rates should continue until the end of the, the year. Um, but I don't see that the agency's budgeted for that. Is that something that we're going to be adjusting? And I, I see the deputy mayor's back, um, so I don't want to steal this thunder by asking all my questions <laughs> um, to you, uh, Ms. Angelique, but um, it, either of you, if you have the answer to that. Essentially, providers are, are very concerned that the healthcare finance agency is rolling back rates to pre-pandemic le levels before before we have to. Can you can you hear me, Council Member? I can now. Yes. Yes. Um, the the uh, we have to operate on the information that we have before us, and until we get um, some indication from the administration that the, um, the public health emergency will in fact be extended and until they tell us how long that extension will be, all we can do is based it on based on what 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 the existing uh, uh, policy is. Um, so I you know I, I'm kind of if they if if the, once that if, if there is a, an extension of the public health emergency and it goes beyond what we've assumed in our budget, then we will do the analysis to see what what resources are available, if any, uh, to potentially, you know, move forward with uh, uh, a continuation of uh, enhanced rates? Um, but we we can't we can't uh, uh, budget based on speculation. We have to have um, clear indication that we can give to our AFO that you know this is what we're faced with and this is what we want to do. And we don't have that information. So what are you hearing? What are you hearing from the feds? I you know I've. To me, I, I've not heard anything definitive. Um, I, I've heard like you that they're going to give notice. They haven't given that notice, but I, I can't say for certain that they're going to come back and say, okay, it's going to be extended 
but at this time, uh, till this particular date, we I haven't heard anything like that. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm over time. As, thank you very as, much. As soon as, as soon as we hear, we will, uh, you know, we'll put the uh, wheels in motion to assess the impact and get with EOM and figure out uh, what the consequences are, if any, and also figure out what the benefits to the providers are. Any, I will say this: even if they extend and we extend the payments. I'm hoping that the pandemic does not come back with a, um, you know, vengeance. Vengeance, and yeah. if it doesn't, then the enhanced payments. Um, some of these providers don't have the cost to cover the enhanced payments if they were uh, a part of their, uh, uh, a part of their regular budget. So, absent a, a, a surge in the uh, in Omicron or some variant, uh, those enhanced payments will probably end. Um, you know, maybe even before the year is out, if, 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 if not in June, we say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilmember Nadeau. Uh, Councilmember Henderson, you're Thank up. You, Mr. Chairman, uh, good afternoon, uh, Deputy Mayor. I'm gonna start with Deputy Mayor questions and then I'll switch to healthcare finance questions. Okay. Um, first, I, I wanted to thank you for quickly following up uh, with my office after the performance oversight hearing regarding um, the various costs for the care pilot. Um, do you all expect that the pilot will continue until FY23? My, you know, I, I don't want to get out in front of the mayor because it's her decision. The mayor took a tour of all of the large encampments uh, last week. Uh, was it this week? It was last week. And, um, you know, she was, um, um, one, she was very impressed with the work that Jamal and his team have done, very impressed with the work that DHS has been done, but she made it very clear that um, people should not be living on the street. And so if we come back to her with a report that shows, you know, we've been able to place a lot of people in a short period of time with this care pallet, my my guess is that, you know, she would, she would like to tell us to move forward with a citywide application. Okay, but in terms of the funding for FY23, is it essentially to maintain the costs as it relates to the individuals who are currently in housing? Yes, it is essentially to, to, to maintain those costs. Okay. All but, right. But you also, we've got to remember, we have a, the, the, the resources for vouchers is extensive. So oh, yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was just asking specifically about. Yeah, yeah no, um, no, you're right. That in particular. Um, I have one specific question about the budget for your office. I noticed a decrease of 50,000 from contracts and an increase in 50,000 to the equipment rental line. Can you talk about this for a moment in terms of the shifts? Uh, what equipment is your office? Uh, Kiana, Kiana is the sole proprietor of our budget. I don't even look at it. She is, she, that is her bailiwick. <laughs> I miss Greekton. Good afternoon, council member. Thank you. Regarding the reduction for the 50,000, there was a one time 50,000 enhancement last year for contracting for the new hospitals. So it's a one time occurrence. The increase that you're seeing is likely due to a couple of different matters, both for just general office printing and increase in cost of supplies and encampment efforts as well. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Creighton. You might know this and I don't know, maybe the deputy mayor does know this as well, but um, general question, does your office have grant making authority within the deputy mayor's office? No, we do not. Okay. Okay. On to healthcare finance. All right. So um, looking at the narrative in the budget book, deputy mayor, um, it states that about 555,000 in ARPA funding was removed from the recurring budget for your, uh, for healthcare finance. 480,000 of that was for the maternal health resources and access act and 75,000 for doula services. Um, obviously this gives me a little heartburn. So I'm just curious where's where, uh, where are you replacing these dollars? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little clumsy here. I'm going to turn that question over to our AFO who is, uh, will, will directly address it for you. Okay. 
So council member, you were asking about the 555,000 that shows in the budget book as coming out for ARPA dollars and then what, what happens? Yes. Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Hang on one second. I said yes. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so the 480 was put in our 22 budget as one time. So it comes out as one time, but then it gets added back again in 23. So it's a, it's sort of a plus minus plus thing. So the 480,000 is still in there. The $75,000 for the doula uh, preparation in 22 was put in as one time and taken out, but doula services are funded in the base budget for 23. Okay. Oh, as part of the Medicaid contract. Just as part of the general Medicaid services in 23. Wonderful. Okay. Um, speaking of where we're going with the dual services, et cetera, um, Deputy Mayor, can you give us an update on where we are with the spa? You're on mute. Still on mute. Melissa will, uh, Melissa will explain where we are with the spa. Okay. Good afternoon, council member, <laughs> member of the committee as I roll into place here. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, we continue work on the state plan amendment. Um, we are still in the stakeholder engagement process and have held, um, I think it was last week, the third uh, meeting of the maternal health advisory group, which is informing the state plan development. Um, we had the key questions um, regarding remember what last week was next month's um, discussion will focus on rates and how we um, set rates for the doula services so at that point in time um, we will nearly conclude kind of the bulk of the stakeholder input and okay. we'll put it into paper so over the next few weeks we will have something more concrete on paper again with our goal to submit by june 30th so we have the full 90 days to have it approved by october 1st awesome awesome this is really great news to hear um, and Deputy Mayor, you know, I've had a conversation with Dr. Nesbitt on the Department of Health side and, you know, uh, Chairman Gray knows this. We, we've got that bill to do what they need to do to help along in terms of the certification piece. So we're hoping to move everything smoothly so we get this sailing come sure. um, the summer. But, um, you know, while we're on Medicaid. It, it would be irresponsible of me not to ask you about what's going on with the contract. Um, <laughs> so I think last time we talked, you said OCP had to do a second solicitation. Um, so what's going on? Where are we on in terms of the timeline here? It, it would be irresponsible of me to answer. No, I'm just <laughs> 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 um, as far as I can tell, um, Based on my conversations with OCP, they are, they believe that we will be uh, on track to um, make announcements in June of the winners. Uh, I have no idea um, whether and if every uh, health plan got through all the screens, and I have no idea who the winners might be. They will tell us that in due course. Okay, but you you believe we are on track. Or they have led you to believe that we are on track. They have led me to believe that we are on track. Um, my personal view is that it's it's getting tight. Yes. Um, and so and 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 I I I push them as often as I can about, you know, when are you going to tell us it's all clear and that everything is being you know um, and so, um, but they say you know sit back and don't worry you you will be done in June. Okay. That changes, I, you will be one of the first to know. Okay. Um, <laughs> on that front, it appears that healthcare finances budget includes an enhancement of 26.7 million for MCO utilization projects. Can you go into that a bit? What does that, what do projections show? Uh, that's, Darren can explain that in more detail. Okay. I'll let him, I'll let him handle it. I would, I would stumble through it if I tried to. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, council member. The 26.7 million dollar enhancement was really due to the shifting of the the extension of the pu public health emergency. Okay. Um, when we initially did some formulation work back in the fall, we were based on the January 
end date for the public health emergency, and then Secretary Becerra extended it to April, and that has an impact on the agency's uh, enrollment projections and other things, and, and most of that enrollment hits managed care organizations. Uh, the, the phrasing in the budget book, unfortunately, uh, the version that got printed uh, was not meant to be the printed version. There was an error. Um, just for our chapter, not the whole thing. Okay. Um, I was like, wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just, just the DHCF chapter and not the whole chapter, just a few paragraphs. Um, so in the June book, uh, those paragraphs will be corrected. And so the, you know, that the part where it says this is related to specifically to MCO utilization projects will come out. Okay. And we'll talk about the extension of the public health emergency. Okay, so is the additional 110 million in federal Medicaid payments similar reasoned here? Yeah, I, the dollar amounts are all correct. It's just the descriptions in those few paragraphs that that will get edited in June. Okay, well, I, I mean, the Medicaid payment, 110 million in Medicaid payments, that is because of the extension of the public health emergency. Largely, yes. Okay, great. Um, okay. And I'm out of time on this round. Look at that. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Henderson. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, uh, one of your staff mentioned uh, earlier. Me, Councilmember, we've actually been joined by Councilmember Pinto. Just wanted to let you know. Uh, thank you. Yeah. What, what, what you, uh, one of your staff mentioned about money being invested in the hospital, $50,000 or something like that, which seemed like a very small sum. But what is that about? Ben can, ben can take that. Good afternoon, Mr. Ben. Chairman. Uh, okay. The funds, 50, good, thank you. The $50,000 that was in the DMHHS budget one time this year was for our mm -hmm. legal support services that we utilized to draft and edit the agreements uh, for the hospitals. So we do not anticipate needing that um, after next year. Okay. So it'd be a one time expenditure, Ben, is that right? Yeah, we had this expenditure in the office of the city administrator prior to FY22, but when I transitioned to, um, to DMHHS, we brought those funds over with us. So we will use our legal services this year. However, we don't anticipate needing them in FY23. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, Councilman Pinto, are you with us? I am. Thank you so much, Chairman. Okay, glad to have you and go right ahead with your questions. All right, sounds good. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I want to start with a discussion of some of our outreach work for the homeless, the encampments that we continue to see. And it's my understanding that there are $2 million for outreach services for this year's for FY 2023 budget. Can you describe how these funds will be used and if they're planning on to, to be used specifically to expand the care pilot? or for other outreach efforts? Uh, those dollars will be spent uh, through DHS for their outreach contracts. Uh, to the extent that we we push with uh, um, expansions, I mean, a, uh, an increase in efforts to to house people who are who are in the care projects, that will certainly be a part of the outreach they're conducting, but it won't be exclusive to the care project. Okay. And you had mentioned during oversight performance oversight and reiterated today that you think that the care pilot um, and the model of expedited housing first should be offered to all of our residents of encampments and low barrier shelters um, but that your recommendation and the the mayor's determination uh, for expansion will come until later this spring um, yes if that decision is made is there sufficient funding in the budget for this year and next year to support that expansion? Oh, absolutely. Now, the biggest cost of any expansion will be the uh, housing, uh, the increased in use of housing vouchers. And there are, we, are, we are, as you well know, we're only using a small percentage of the housing vouchers that have already been resourced. So that's already taken care of through this budget and, and the next budget. Uh, the the marginal cost increase in uh, any uh, outreach services will have to be contended with um, 
if we if the mayor expands beyond our capacity to handle that in 22. Um, but there are there are pathways and vehicles that will allow us to uh, uh, extend the uh, uh, and expand the outreach contracts if necessary. They're already pretty well funded, so I think any marginal cost increase will, would not be that great. And there are plenty areas that we can uh, move within the HHS cluster uh, to look for additional resources to maybe ramp up a uh, outreach contract in 22 leading into 23. Okay, and so those two funding sources around outreach and then the housing vouchers themselves are really the only notable expenses from the care pilot. Well, to the extent that we have to use um, local funds to put people in bridge housing because they're not ready from a documentation standpoint, or they have some uh, human uh, uh, capital deficits that need to be addressed before they can be expected to live independently. Then, um, yes, we would have to go to um, uh, uh, bridge housing and we'd have to evaluate with EOM whether or not we have sufficient funds to add um, additional people. And if so, what those funds are, as you know, from your participation in the um, uh, tour of the encampment last week, the uh, bridge housing component is a very expensive part of the program. Um, and in the meantime, we're also looking at uh, you know, possible options for, um, I guess it would be called site based. Um, uh, uh, site based uh, uh, locations. For um, temporary uh, housing for people who are living uh, without uh, who are living unhoused. And there is money federal dollars available today uh, that can be used to purchase uh, buildings that uh, could be converted to that. To that use. Okay, well, thank you very much for um, for that, and that you know we're very supportive of of acquiring a new site for this purpose. I think that's an important part of the progress because not not one solution is going to work for everybody. So thank you for working on that. Um, can I ask about a few spe site specific updates? Um, particularly with the residents at 25th and Virginia Avenue, which is, of course, one of the care pilot uh, locations, Thomas Circle, um, and the folks living at New York and 12th and I Street. If you can provide us an update on what the general status is of these encampments and what challenges your team is facing in helping folks move into housing there. Yeah, I think. Uh, um... Jamal, who's uh, now on camera, would be the best person to walk you through those issues and certainly take any additional questions that you might have. Jamal, can you? Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon, Council Member Pinto. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, so, in regards to those two sites, and as you know, uh, the 11th and New York site um, and Columbus Circle sites uh, have a very high level of priority due to their impending closure. Uh, we also have a very high concern in regards to the foggy bottom area sites, being that of 21st and uh, E Street Northwest, as well as 25th and Virginia. Those sites that are a part of our care pilot are moving along in a very positive fashion, uh, having a very high level of engagement. Uh, all in all, we are having a 92% um, level of placement success of the 109 residents in our care pilot program that are engaged in services. So we do hope to be able to complete that uh, very soon in 100% fashion with the remaining residents who are currently not leased up, uh, but are residing uh, either on site or within pet V or hotel stay housing. Uh, in regards to some of our other critical sites, we're still continuing to work with DHS and our outreach partners to provide uh, weekly uh, outreach and engagement, along with our DPW partners to work on the health and safety issues that arise in regards to uh, those encampments. Uh, we're working with more scheduled bulk trash cleanups, which we've been very successful in bringing the residents into uh, continuous engagement and agreement to keeping those areas uh, as clean as possible. Now, no, this is not at all an easy task, and there are some residents that 
uh, have uh, proven to be difficult in this area. However, uh, we normally average about two uh, bulk trash cleanups in regards to most of our critical sites throughout the district uh, each week. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks for the update there. Um, in terms of regular trash collection and also uh, needle disposal boxes, we've heard from some of our outreach providers that DPW has not been consistent with weekly or biweekly trash collection at all of the sites. Um, I just wanted to raise that to your attention, particularly as we seek to educate uh, folks who are living there that everybody's on the same page about trash pickup, but also wanted to ask you about um, needle disposals. We've had an increase in our office recently of reports of needles found on sidewalks, uh, particularly in areas around encampments. Some of the encampment sites appear to have collection boxes, but would like to work with you all for either more of these boxes um, or a clear referral that we can give to residents on which agency they should be calling uh, to have those needles safely removed. Yes, great question. So in regards to that, the weekly uh, trash engagements by DPW, again, they have various sites that are already on their weekly routes. However, whenever we receive these inquiries for any sites that may not be on their weekly routes, we'll engage with them uh, immediately and normally between Wednesdays through Fridays of each week, we will schedule bulk trash engagements with those particular sites. Uh, another part of our daily outreach is engaging these locations and providing them with large contractor trash bags and other different items to be able to uh, collect these items that they've established as trash or items that they no longer need to keep. Uh, we'll continue to do that and I always uh, will say that we'll continue to engage with the uh, different providers as well as our constituents and partners that if there are any sites that they are noticing an increase in these, please communicate them in real time uh, to us via our encampment.reports email uh, website. Uh, that will allow us in real time to be able to engage those inquiries, send out a team to uh, assess and schedule engagement accordingly. In relation to any form of uh, sharps or working on the biohazard collection, we do have a biohazard contract within our agency that works with us on all encampment related matters uh, whenever we have scheduled cleanups and or bulk trash engagements this particular team also will come out upon our request to be able to engage and remove those items uh, should there be any sites that have had a recent increase in that uh, i definitely will welcome that information so that we can coordinate those services accordingly okay thank you very much um i don't no know if this is maybe a question for the deputy mayor uh, but you may know jamal but how much funding um, and, and how many FTEs are, is, is this budget propose for the ICH? And how does that compare to last year? For that particular question, I would turn that back over to the deputy mayor. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamal. Oh, then, um, as far as I can recall, a uh, council member, there are no increases in the uh, funding or staffing at ICH in this budget. They are pretty. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty still, still, yeah, they're, they're, they're still trying to. Uh, uh, Jess and uh, Kiana informed me they're still trying to hire the three folks that uh, you all gave them positions for last year. Okay, well, I'm out of time this round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilman. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor, I want to ask you uh, a couple of questions, other questions among the many we've already asked you. Uh, so, and, and I appreciate your engagement. Um, can you tell me more about the uh, Drive by Five um, program, which uh, was it's being moved, as I understand it. Uh, so. Is is it being moved, and if so, uh, where is it being moved to, and to do what? Yeah. Uh, I'll let Kiana take that. She's uh, she runs the uh, the the uh, seat, the uh, the office on personnel and budget, and she can give you the details. Okay, thank you, Kiana. Good afternoon, Chairman. 
Thank you. Regarding Thrive by Five. Regarding Thrive by Five, they moved over to the mayor's office on women's policy and initiatives. They already transferred over in the associated FTA and budget line. And regarding any future programming, I know in the past you've been interested in the summit. I'm not sure what their plans are regarding that, but there's no longer involvement with DMHSS. And that was per the mayor's request to transfer them over. Okay, now, now the funding is being transferred. I'm, I'm trying to understand what is it going to do now in the future. Are you able to be able to? Are you are you in a position to be able to speak to that, Karen? I'm not. Director Porter runs the office, so I'm not sure if they've had their hearing yet. She'd be the best person suited to answer any updates on that front. But regarding our programming in DMHSS, we're no longer involved now that it's been transferred. Okay. All right. We we'll we'll try to find out more. Maybe at, at another hearing uh, that uh, will be involved with direct order. So, um, uh, is that the best way to get information at this stage? It is what we could do in our follow ups. I could reach out to her office and see what their plans are for the upcoming months and then include that when we send it to the committee. Okay. Have they already had their budget hearing? And I, I don't know. I'm not sure if they have, and we're not in frequent communication being that she operates separately, but I can reach out to try to gather information proactively. Okay, right by five is an important issue for me because it you know, involves so many of our very young, young, the youngest of our children. And I just want to understand exactly what is going to be done uh, to be able to, you know, to in, continue to engage those folks, those families. Uh, I'm not, if you don't know the answer, I understand. I appreciate that. Uh, and we'll, if, you, if you all can follow up with us, we'd appreciate that as all well, as well. Absolutely, Chairman. And what I will say, though, is that in DC House budget, and they have their hearing on April 4th, there are several investments that are directed both at young people and mothers. So there's a slew of investments regarding food insecurity, maternal health, and others in DC House budget that Dr. Nesbitt could speak to as well. Okay, well, uh, if, it, if it's DC Health, obviously that's something we're going to be involved in, and uh, we can ask the question there. If if you think that's the mo more appropriate uh, place to to raise these questions, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to understand at this stage where is the best place to pursue this. I think it's a combined effort because Thrive by Five is very limited regarding the actual implementation of programs, whereas DC Health has full teams. So what we could do is give you a full scope of the picture, both including Thrive by Five and DC Health, but I would still need to reach out to Dr. Porter. Okay. All right. Well, we 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 would appreciate that uh, very much as we try to uh, see how Thrive by Five is going to continue to be, and how the engagement will continue, and what it will. Is there anything you want to add to that, uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, no, uh, Councilmember. I um. Leave that completely to Diana on the transfer. And since it's been transferred, I have not been engaged with the, uh, the mission and work of Thrive by Five at all. Okay. All right. We'll follow up uh, with it uh, in the appropriate place. Um, let me let me ask uh, you, you. Let me ask some questions uh, that you already have maybe started to answer or answered fully. Uh, so if it's being redundant, I apologize for that. Um, Will will you expand um, the pilot program uh, that you talked about again already um, beyond the uh, previous four encampments um, with the uh, what, what which has been added which is in the budget? Uh, yeah, my my anticipation, Councilmember, is that uh, based on the current results, the interim result that we're seeing, my anticipation is that we would. Probably be submitting a report to the mayor uh, recommending an expansion of the pilot across the city. When, when you when do you anticipate submitting that report, uh, Wayne? So it, that is tied, it, is, it is tied to the completion date for the last two sites at 21st and E and 25th in Virginia, and then a period for um, uh, data analysis and a, a briefing report with recommend with um, lessons learned and recommendations submitted to the mayor. Uh, so I'm thinking, uh, given all those things, we should have something uh, uh, sometime this summer report uh, going to the mayor with a recommendation, certainly before we get to fiscal year 
23 because we want to know exactly what we're going to be doing going forward when we move into fiscal year 23. But it will be submitted, do you think, before the uh, the fiscal year 23 budget is oh, submitted I, to Congress? I, I would, when is, is that in June? When the budget goes to Congress? It'll be probably the end of June. And that would be my guess anyway. We may be finishing the report around that time. Um, but I can't say for certain until we, um, it, it, a lot of it depends on the pace of us being able to house as many people as we can at 21st and E and 25th in Virginia. That right. moves quicker, that, and that pace has slowed, I will admit, um, because of a number of issues. But if we can pick that pace back up, you know, maybe we can get started on the report sooner than I anticipate. What, 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 what can you, can you really, uh, can you tell us, uh, if you would, what has slowed the pace of movement of people? I mean, uh, a related Jamal, question I have is getting people leased up. Can you speak to that also, which is a, that's a critical yeah. issue for us as well. Well, you know, uh, uh, I'll let Jamal talk about why things have slowed. Uh, uh, Jessica often said there are a couple of pain points in the system regarding, um, I don't know if Jess is on. Uh, I don't know if Jess is on online, but documentation is one pain point, and Jess, the other is, uh, and actually finding the house or housing that the um, uh, resident would agree to live in. Now there have been some changes to policy along those lines that will um, basically give a certain number of options for for housing, and have that be the limit as opposed to a continuous. You know, recycle over here. Here's a place I don't like it. Here's another place I don't like it. They're going to place limits if they're not already done so on the number of homes that they're going to allow a person to turn down and still be in the program. Uh, but Jamal, Jamal can speak to some of the challenges that have slowed. They were, they were off to a really fast start at 21st and need things have slowed a little bit. And uh, he can also talk about any challenges on Virginia Avenue. Yes, uh, Council Member Chairman, excuse me, excuse me, Chairman Gray, if you can hear me. So in regards to 21st and E, uh, the engagement at that site actually has a very uh, high and positive rate of success out of the residents that were identified at that particular site, uh, which was 22. 21 of those residents have successfully been leased up. Uh, where we're working on, and again, the 25th and Virginia's location was the last location added to the care pilot in January. Uh, we're currently at about a 40% rate of uh, engagement and lease up success with those particular residents, but we are looking to uh, increase and improve that. Again, assisting residents with being document ready, which is a large portion of what is needed for residents to be leased up successfully, along with increasing the engagement rate. There were a substantial number of residents who transitioned back and forth to that location Therefore, we had to work a little bit harder to engage those residents and get them engaged into the services needed. Uh, but we do see a level of success of improvement, and we'll look to have that uh, again towards the time frames that the deputy mayor spoke about. Okay. Um, are you all bracing? I guess maybe a question for you, Wayne. Are you all are you all bracing yourselves for uh, more people who become uh, homeless? especially as evictions may uh, increase uh, as a result of the pandemic and the results of that, the, the, the effects of that? Well, Councilman, we are hoping to avoid that um, uh, a, a, a swell in the number of people who are on the street because of evictions uh, through any number of means that uh, DHS could follow us direct, more directly speak to. But uh, to directly answer your question, we are not, we don't have an our track right now and a, a sharp increase anticipated in the number of people who are living on the street anytime soon. We're so we are um we remain laser focused on trying to address the uh those in the encampment uh power I mean in the care pilot and then beyond that the other other eighty or so who are not in the pilot who we uh believe are still living uh on the streets. Okay. All right thank you. Thank you very much uh Deputy Mayor. Councilmember Henderson, did you want another round uh, before we quit? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Catching up here. Okay, um, Deputy Mayor, I want to uh, ask you a couple of questions about the FY22 supplemental that we also received. 
Um, the proposed FY2 supplemental budget contains a net change of about $45 million. Uh, uh, first, it shows an increase of $49.3 million for home and community-based services fund. Um, but the supplemental narrative doesn't distinguish the type of fund type. So um, that $49.3 million in this fund, is that local, federal, what kind of money? That's, that's, that's federal ARPA money. Federal. That, but I'll, I'll, uh, Darren can give you a more thorough uh, discussion. Oh, well, hold on one second, because I think I have some more. Um, I, well, if Darren is coming up, if does Darren's this fund up. currently exist? Because I didn't see it in the list of funds that healthcare finance currently has. Or are we establishing this later in the BSA? Uh, council member, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can Sorry, one second. Yeah, no, I needed to hear you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's my problem. Um, the $49.3 million is local savings that's created as a result of Section 9817 of ARPA. Um, Section 9817 allows states to get 10% of enhanced uh, federal match for certain home and community based services. That enhanced match, though, is not just savings to the city's bottom line. It's money that must be used to strengthen, extend, or enhance home and community-based services. So, and the period when that uh, enhanced FMAP is available was, it's actually, it looks back into the past. It began April 1st, 2021, and extends through March 31st, 2022. Um, and so that 49.3 million actually represents the amount that was uh, saved, if you will, saved local funds because we got enhanced federal match for the quarters three and four of FY21. And that was actually part of the revenue that was reserved, the local revenue that was reserved from 21 to 22. Um, okay. and the idea is to move it into this fund, which is being newly created. So that's... Uh, Okay, so I think we have a what comes first, chicken or the egg? Because okay. um, I think we can move money into a fund that doesn't exist. Like we have to create it at the same time. But the mayor wanted us to act on the supplemental early before we acted on the budget. I don't know scheduling wise, but I'm just saying that's something for us to look at. And I can follow up with folks on this side on that particular question. I, I don't have an answer to that. Okay, okay. Um, so in addition to the 49, or excuse me, in addition to the 49.3 million, is there additional money that we anticipate putting into this fund? Um, yes, there would be because the, the district continues to earn um, that savings because the, the enhanced death map is available through March 31st, 2022. Okay. And the 49.3 just represents FY21, Q3, and Q4. Okay. Um, I noticed in the BSA that it requires two deposits, one deposit on number four, October 1, and then another after the first deposit. Um, why, why is that? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not certain why two deposits are required, but we can certainly follow up on that question. Okay. Um, so, as you said, from the ARPA, the money in this fund has to be spent to strengthen the home and community based services program. Uh, yes, and there are a few, there are a number of requirements. Uh, there are maintenance of effort requirements related to the existing home and community based programs, and it has to be spent in accordance with the plan that the district submitted to CMS and CMS approved. Okay, so how, how how are we planning to spend it? Um, do you want me to take it or do you want? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa for, for that okay. question. <laughs> Thank you. If we need, if you would like actual budget numbers, we'll have to pull those. But generally speaking, um, the ARPA opportunity is really um, 
unique and I would um, go so far as to say transformational for home and community based services under Medicaid. Um, we are using the fund in 3 different ways 1 to support providers through various. Um, uh, like recruitment and retention bonus opportunities um, for home health agencies for uh, DSP workers, as we've talked about earlier for vaccine incentives for those same workers, um, as well as um, exploring the potential for a transportation benefit and um, other things such as that. The other um, area where we are focused is some infrastructural uh, investments, if you will. In the past, we've had a couple great uh, federal opportunities to support providers to connect uh, with the health information exchange so that sharing information across um, providers as well as implement electronic health records and receive incentive payments for doing so. When those funds were made available through the high tech funding, um, there were certain providers that were excluded from that um, being home and community based services providers. So we really want to level up across the district's um, provider community and ensure some um, the equity across the board for beneficiaries um, that primarily see home and community based services. So we are providing support yep. to um, support um, have providers bring into the EHR and HIE. And then we have several other initiatives. I'm happy to share the ARPA plan with you as well um, and any updates that we have to. And just so you know, we did, um, uh, this was issued, the guidance was issued by CMS, I think it was last June or May, and then plans were due by June or July. We did some public comment through our MCAC um, body and then everything's available on our website. So I'm happy to take more questions or if it's helpful also to have a separate briefing, I'm happy to do that as well. Well, I guess the most immediate question I have is how much of this fund do you all anticipate spending in either FY22 or FY23? Looking to see folks, I think Angelique's going to come on the line to give you the specifics on that. Okay. You know, not lapsing funds. We just hate for it to sit. So I just want to know. How are you guys going to spend the other it? thing as Angela comes on that I will also say is that any initiative that we fund through the ARPA opportunity, um, if it's not a 1 time funding initiative, it has to be sustainable at the conclusion of the ARPA funding. So, uh, we have the additional federal funding now that gives us. The local dollars um, freed up to support yep. these once that ends, that ends. The district the will district still be responsible for sustaining those initiatives. Um, so we are really looking at our plan with that in mind in the out years as well. Okay, um, can I uh, switch over to asking about um, another fund that you all have in terms of dedicated taxes, um, but for the DC provider fees, um, we noticed that it's projected to be reduced by nearly 3.2 million from 8.7 million in FY22 to 5.5 million in FY23. Can you briefly talk about the anticipated decrease in revenue there? Uh, Darren's trying to track. So you said you're asking about the decrease on what on which which fee by how much? Uh the DC provider fee fund. Okay. Yeah. Um uh, Darren can address that. Uh, okay. Hello, Councilmember. Hello. Um the reduction there is really um Let me state it a different way. The budget authority in 22 exceeds the revenue projection for 22. So we won't actually spend that amount in FY22. Um, and then when we did the FY23 budget, we trued up the spending projection to the revenue projection. I see. Okay. Okay. So what we're seeing in terms of the authorized budget is not technically what's there. For 22. For 22. Okay. That answered that question. Um, and last brief question, <laughs> or actually, I think you might've answered this. It was about St. Elizabeth's and the capital budget for them. Um, notice that we're gonna see an increase Yes. For five million. Fifteen million. And what was driving that increase? Uh supply chain, inflationary pressures, um design, some design changes because of COVID, and also the increase in diagnostic and testing space by UHS, which they're gonna pay for uh, at, at five point five million. So all those things have com uh, combined to drive up the cost by about fifteen million. Um 
And, um, you know, we don't know if it's over, to be honest. You know, we'll have to see what. Yeah. Hey, look, it's a, this is, we are foreign territory here. I, don't, I mean, you know, this is, people are experiencing this all over the country. That's true. And I, I, I'm not blaming you guys for that. I guess this is more or less a question for the folks at DGS who deal more in this capital space. Although you have a capital person who's sitting kind of next to you with dealing with this on the hospital side. Like, how <laughs> long are we going to let supply chain issues essentially double the cost of some of our projects? Um, I don't know if we have a lot of control over it. I don't think they're going to double the cost of the hospital. I don't believe that. I hope not. If they do, we're in big trouble. Um, but, I, you know, there could be some future increases that we didn't anticipate it. But I don't, you know, my hope is that between UHS's uh, skill in building large uh, uh, inpatient hospitals and DGS's technical expertise, we can keep this to a minimum. But again, you know, and God forbid we end up in a world war. Um, oh, don't put that out there, that bad juju. Don't do that. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, I know this is the last round. Is it possible I could ask uh, just one last question? Go, go ahead, Council Member. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Deputy Mayor, one of the things that we've been asking all of the agencies, not just uh, you guys, but it, if you have some type of list or crosswalk where you can explain to us where exactly the district recovery plan dollars that you all have been allocated is going. Because um, in the budget book, it doesn't give us uh, that description. So from a public facing standpoint, it looks like a cut, even though you guys are replacing that. So we just want to know yeah. what's the- uh, As we'll give that to you. Okay, great. We'll get we'll get us we'll get it to you today. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilmember Henderson. Um, Wayne, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> um, you you started to answer the question uh, previously um, when it was asked. Um, I'm trying to get my arms around what what do you anticipate the cost. Best you know at this point, the cost of the new hospital. What what are they going to be? Because uh, I'm I'm uh, concerned about, you know, what the uh, it, what the um, impact of COVID is going to be, what the impact of inflation is going to be, what the impact of supply chain uh, expenses, and what that's going to add to the uh, the cost of the hospital. So, as best you can, Wayne, at this point, can you tell me what? What those costs look like at this stage? Well, I mean, we know, we know how much money we had uh, set aside at, at budgeted for this, the hospital. Uh, well, I don't want to get a feel for that. Um, you know, Ben has been um, tracking that on a day to day basis. Uh, I'll let him talk about it. Right now, we the the uh, construction costs. I think it was a twelve percent increase. But Ben can give you some details on beyond that and where he think we might be going. I'll turn it over to Ben. <laughs> Okay, Ben, how are you again? <laughs> Good, sir. Thank you. So, um, council member, the costs of the hospital um, at this point are following the national trajectory of new healthcare uh, construction. So, from 2020 to 2021, um, the uh, healthcare industry saw a 12% increase in the cost to construct. Uh, new healthcare assets. Um, that number and that percentage reflects uh, both increases in labor, um, increases in um, complex medical equipment, um, as well as just uh, general inflation. Um, what we've seen to date um, on this project um, is is frankly less than that 12%. Um, this $15 million represents a 4% increase overall for the construction part of the budget. Um, what I would say is we are trying um, currently with UHS right now to um, lock in um, approximately $150 million worth of um, construction. Um, and what that will do is it will um, set the prices um, for the next year to um, alleviate the additional inflation that may occur between now and when that uh, part of the project gets built. So I'll give you an example. We are 
in the process of purchasing uh, steel um, this month, um, which we certainly won't use um, until later this year. But what it'll allow us to do is to lock in the price as it currently is. Um, it's cheaper for us to buy the supplies and store them than it is to wait and risk additional market escalation at this point. Um, the last thing I would say is that um, if you recall, the $375 million budget for the hospital was put together in um, late 2019. Um, yeah. So even if we did nothing, and uh, if there had not been a pandemic in which we learned a lot about how hospitals um, can and should function in, the, in an emergency, um, we would have expected some general inflation. Um, uh, two examples of what we have learned from COVID that has driven up some of our prices, um, similar to schools, um, we are now um, uh, implementing a, a 100% outdoor air ventilation systems. Um, we are also adding additional um, ability for the hospital to be a, a quarantined off or cordoned off um, by floor and by wing. Um, and both of those changes are things that you know, hospitals um, have been doing during the response to COVID that we felt was a best practice that we needed to add to this uh, facility. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just to add to this, then we're doing urgent care centers uh, also. We got one, you know, presumably coming online in Ward 8. We got another one coming online in Ward 7. Uh, so, could, could you all update me on where we are with the cost of the urgent care centers at this stage um, as you continue to develop them? And either you, Ben, or, or you, uh, Wayne, one, one of the two of you. Uh, sure, thank you for the question. So the uh, Ward 8 urgent care facility um, will be open uh, in early summer. Um, that is a facility that is operated by Universal Health Services in conjunction with GW Health um, right. and is paid for by them 100%. Um, the facility in Ward 7 um, is very close to wrapping up a letter of intent um, for a location. Um, that facility is slated to open in late 2023. The combined cost that uh, UHS um, budgeted for these two facilities was $21 million. Um, at this time, um, I don't have a, a, a detailed breakdown of where they are in their spending, um, but that is what they had budgeted for these two uh, facilities. Just recall, these facilities were um, completely to be at their, um, they were to pay for them. Right, and that includes Ward 8 as well as Ward 7, right, uh, Ben? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the um, the urgent care centers in Ward Seven. Um, do you know whether there's any coordination taking place now? Because we've got another ward. We've got an urgent care center that's been uh, opened by MBI. Uh, they open now. They've been open for about a uh, month, month and a half. Uh, at Dan Nanny Helen Burroughs and Division uh, Avenue. Uh, so is there coordination between the one that's being developed in Ward, you know, in, in, in Ward 7? Uh, I mean, I have an idea where the location is, but if it hasn't been finalized, I won't put that out there at this point. But it's, 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 um, what I'm interested in knowing is whether there's been coordination uh, taking place between the two locations, between the one in Ward 7 uh, that's being developed by the uh, folks who develop in the hospital and um, and also what's being done in Ward, uh, Ward 8 uh, also. Is there coordination taking place between those two facilities, those two operations? So, um... Universal Health Services has been meeting with the uh, uh, range of community providers. Um, they've met with Unity, they've met with Whitman Walker. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if they have met with MBI. Um, certainly can make that introduction to them. Uh, their goal is to ensure that there's um, 
alignment um, between their new operations and the existing operations, both for the urgent cares, but then also um, for the new hospital once it opens. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to be a part of the uh, coordinated effort, coordinating efforts that are taking place uh, between MBI and then UHS and then UHS and Ward 7, because uh, and Ward 8, and Ward 8, excuse me. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to be a part of those conversations. Uh, if you could work to arrange that, I'd appreciate that. Uh, uh, ben. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much uh, wraps it up for uh, this this moment. We we've got some additional um, items that we'll send along to you in writing, uh, Wayne, uh, which we'll appreciate uh, getting answers back from you uh, on those questions. Um, and we appreciate uh, your engagement with us this afternoon uh, on behalf of all the council members who were here, uh, Council Member Henderson. Councilmember Nadeau and Councilmember Pinto, um, we appreciate that and, and the follow ups that will be necessary also in terms of the additional information that will be required. We'll appreciate getting that from you uh, as soon as possible. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember. We appreciate the opportunity to share with you the work of uh, the Deputy Mayor's Office of Health and Human Services and the uh, work of DHCF. We uh, look forward to uh, continuing to. Uh, communicate and uh, uh, update you on the uh, work of the cluster and the agency and this agency in particular as we move forward and getting ready for fiscal year 23. Well, thank you very much, Wayne. And you have myriad responsibilities at stage. They are uh, more vast than anybody ever thought would be uh, required, requested of you uh, for the work that you do. So I, for one, appreciate it. Um, and uh, I appreciate all the work that uh, we were able to to speak to, um, you know, to the, the public witnesses who were involved uh, earlier. Uh, and I'd like to to see if we can arrange make a, make arrangements with you and your team uh, to be able to speak to some of those issues around the um, around the uh, the staffing issues that were raised uh, during the, the public hearing then during the public hearing. Sure, absolutely. We look forward to it. Okay. Well, we thank you all for the uh, hearing. We thank you very much. Thank you for the information that you provided. Uh, obviously, this will be all taken into consideration as we try to develop um, a budget that will then uh, go on to the mayor uh, soon thereafter. So thank you, uh, Wayne, and you and your team so much for the work that you did today. We appreciate it, and we're adjourned. All right. Thank you, Councilmember. Have a good day. Thank you. You too, Wayne.